Dead bodies litter the streets, their skin burned and lesioned, their lips crusted with dry vomit, their eyes milky and white. This isn't the aftermath of a fight, it's the aftermath of a massacre. Nobody here stood a chance against the monster they died fighting. And the monster isn't done. An unnatural shadow moves between the houses, skittering on pointed legs like death itself in the night. Perhaps what the Elder said was true. Only an even more dangerous monster could stop a monster such as this. The survivors all converge in one building, shaking with fear and following the single instruction the Elder gave them. Keep your eyes closed at all costs. And to think, the village was so peaceful until the demon arrived. It is a small, picturesque place nestled in the lush mountains of Chile, hundreds of years before the world became the connected whole it is today. It is a world where that which exists beyond your borders ought not to exist at all. The people there live quiet and simple lives, herding goats and alpacas, growing crops in the hills, tanning, dyeing, and weaving. They are hardy people, acclimated to the often rough and unforgiving life on the slopes. Like most in their time, the people here are ruled by superstition, a firm belief in the existence of gods and monsters beyond the veil. Some would scoff at their faith, call them primitive, but the reality is an open mind will often catch more truth than a closed one, because we all know the truth. There are indeed monsters out there, haunting the dark, always have been, always will be. The main difference is that now we have an organization on our side, a group prepared to die in that dark so we can live in the light. The people of back then weren't so lucky. They were forced to confront the gaping jaws and burning eyes of the unknown with no aid. The same eyes that would soon be turning to the innocent people of this rural, isolated Chilean village. It all began with a missing teenager. The boy was out hunting for game in the forest when his parents realized it had been hours since they'd seen him. As the shadows grow longer and the sky begins to darken, a rescue party forms and ventures out into the wilderness to search for him. Armed with clubs, bows, and arrows, the mountains can be a treacherous place between the harsh terrain and the many dangerous predators who hunt out there too. Little do they know, the boy they are searching for has fallen prey to a new type of predator, one that none of the villagers has ever encountered before. It's another few hours before they find him. One of the men in the search party remarks that the boy seemed to have gone far further than he should when hunting. Another replies that perhaps he didn't venture out here at all. Maybe he was dragged. No one honors that with an answer. They keep their heads down and keep searching. The possibility is too frightening to truly consider. If a dangerous creature has made its home in the forest surrounding the village, then all of them are in trouble. Not long after that, they find the missing teenager, injured and unconscious. He looks pale and sickly, with three ragged claw marks cut into his chest. The silent thought passes between them. What animal has three claws? No animal that they know of. But now is not the time to think of that. They need to wrap the injured boy in blankets before he freezes to death out here or succumbs to his injuries. First, they need to ensure that he survives this. Then, they need to find out what did this to him. Soon, the boy is lying in the home of the town's medicine man, a rudimentary scientific figure with a wide knowledge of herbs and plant-based medicine. But he cannot diagnose the sickness that the boy seems to be experiencing. He has nausea, dizziness, a rattling cough that sometimes produces blood, and his skin is taking an odd, unnatural hue. This can't be the result of his injury, the medicine man concludes. The wounds are actually relatively shallow. This malady must have another source. The villagers pray for the boy and leave offerings and sacrifices at their altars for his recovery. But it does no good. Later that same night, he splutters blood and passes away. His dying words, heard only by the medicine man, is that there is a monster in the forest, and the most frightening thing of all is that he's right. Over the next few days, it gets worse. Far, far worse. The same mysterious affliction that killed the teenage boy starts to spread across the village, infecting the vulnerable and infirm with deathly sickness. Livestock begins to go missing or are found dead when the sun rises, cleaved with the same three deadly razor-sharp claw marks. And if this wasn't all horrific enough, soon the crops begin to die off, as though the same sickness that's hurting the people and the animals is doing the same for them. It's impossible to ignore the reality of the situation now. There is a demon in their midst, and if they don't kill it, 
it will kill all of them. The town holds a meeting in their square, where it quickly becomes apparent how drastically the town's numbers have dwindled. They are a shadow of their former glory. Some men suggest forming a hunting party to rampage through the forest, find this monster, and kill it. Others wisely bring up that this might leave the village's women and children undefended. What if the creature were to attack while they were all in the forest? It would mean certain doom. Frightened discourse soon gives way to a heated argument. People can become violent when they're afraid, and when the thing causing their fear is nowhere to be seen, that violence is inevitably channeled toward one another. However, before things can get out of hand, the brewing calamity is quickly ended by the sound of three firm taps against the ground. They all turn and see the village elder, an old blind man who uses a gnarled walking cane. The crowd falls silent. This man commands ultimate respect among the villagers, and for many, his presence has an immediate calming effect. Perhaps he would finally have a solution to this problem. There is a way, he says with a slow, rattling voice. What is the way, Elder? asks a younger villager. An ancient guardian spirit that lives in the mountains. I can bring it here, and it may be able to help us. But there is one condition, one rule, which must be followed at the cost of all others. None of you may gaze upon this spirit. You must keep your eyes closed. If you see it, a horror far worse than the ones we've experienced here will fall upon this village. With the approval of the rest of the village, the elder makes a rough pilgrimage up into the mountains, made even rougher by his age and infirmity. But the safety of his village is at stake, and there is nothing he won't sacrifice to see that its existence will be maintained. The only thing he carries, other than his walking stick, is a length of rope. Soon he reaches the mouth of a cave, an ancient cavern cut deep into the flesh of the mountain. He enters. As a blind man, the darkness means nothing to him. The cave is silent at first, but soon he hears something, a quiet, pitiful weeping. That is how he knows he's close to the legendary guardian spirit. The old man has never seen this supposed spirit, but if he did, he would know that it is a long, pale humanoid with grasping hands and a terrible face. He knows the beast is capable of great violence, but he also knows that the beast is not evil, for it takes no pleasure in that violence. The elder's knowledge of the guardian spirit in the cave had been passed down for generations in his family. He had been told throughout his childhood about how the guardian spirit defended their village in dangerous and desperate times. When bands of raiders had invaded almost a century ago, the guardian spirit destroyed them. When beasts emerged from the woods, the fear of the guardian spirit warded them off. And here and now, the elder is certain that the guardian spirit would be able to defeat the demon terrorizing them. He takes the rope and ties it around the weeping monster's neck, forming a makeshift leash. He spoke a soothing incantation and exhaled. It's time for you to serve us once again, great spirit, he said. And so begins the treacherous journey back down the side of the mountain. But in his absence, back at the village, the situation is deteriorating. Hours have passed and night is about to fall. The demon only attacks at night when they're most vulnerable. Fear has already poisoned the hearts of many of the village's men. They sequester most of the remaining population away in the village's largest home and arm themselves. They have no faith in the elder's mystic solution. They will find this abomination and kill it themselves. There is no other way. But as they gather in the village square and prepare to lead an assault on the forest, they never would have expected the monster they're hunting to come to them. And in an almighty flash, it appears in front of them. It's even more horrible than they'd ever imagined. A large, spindly beast with black spikes for legs, an emaciated body, the same three black claws that had left those terrible marks on all of its victims. But worst of all is the face, the featureless, tooth-lined maw with a huge, glowing eye inside. It is a monster worse than even what their nightmares could conjure. Before they can even attack it, it unleashes a blast of energy that blows back the ones closest to it leaving them dead or dying, their skin horrifically burnt. Those further back run in to attack the monster, screaming with a fury that they hope will hide their terror. But the monster is far faster than them. It whips out its claws and slashes at them, hitting each one with a deadly kill strike. They aren't able to land a single hit on the beast. As the bodies hit the floor, some try to run, but it's already too late. 
One person attempting to run suddenly feels a pain in his chest. He freezes in place, and then is simply sucked into himself, screaming, crumpling away, and disappearing entirely. While the language to understand how this man died would not be developed for centuries, we today would be able to say that the monster, today known as SCP-001, the prototype, created a singularity within the man's body, absorbing him into himself. The people cowering inside can hear the screams and the terrible sounds of their fellow villagers, their friends, sometimes even their families, being massacred outside. They believe in the Elder and follow his teachings despite their fear. They keep their eyes forced closed. Some of their strongest men have gone out there to face the monster and had been slain. There is truly nothing they can do except wait and hope. Outside, the creature, the demon that had been the ruin of their village, is the only thing still alive. The many bodies of those slaughtered lay twisted on the ground around it. Then, it begins to hunt. It wants to find the others. It gurgles and chitters, its legs making a tack-tack-tack sound on the ground beneath its sharpened points. The surviving villagers do all they can to remain silent as they hear it getting closer. Death itself draws near. Then, someone and something else enter the village. The demon hears them arrive and skitters over to investigate. The elder has arrived. He knows what happened. He can hear the demon. He can smell the burning flesh of the dead. And he has brought another monster on the end of a rope. A guardian spirit. A thing that, centuries later, would become to be known as SCP-096, the Shy Guy. And the demon had made the terrible mistake of looking at its face. The monster began to cry and wail. You have defiled and profaned my village, demon the elder said, speaking over the guardian spirits wailing. This is your divine punishment. You will be removed from the face of the earth for your crimes. The demon releases a blast of radioactive energy, striking the elder directly and killing him instantly. But despite the residual burns from the attack, the guardian spirit is unaffected. It continues to bawl loudly. Then, with the fury and speed of a bullet train, it roars and gallops towards the demon its clawed hands extended. With one strike of the back of the guardian spirit's hand, the demon's body is thrown through a nearby empty house, tearing through the brickwork and sending it skidding across the ground on the other side. The demon rises shakily to its feet, dazed and hurt. It doesn't understand. How had that creature resisted the radiation poisoning? It only showed minor burns. It didn't make sense. It makes even less sense to the demon when the guardian spirit comes bounding through the wreckage of the house, its burns already somehow completely healed. There is no hesitation from the guardian spirit. It leaps towards the demon, and the demon only narrowly dodges the spirit's grasp. It rakes its claws along the spirit's back as it glides past, leaving another three distinctive scars. But by the time the creature lands on all four spindly limbs, the wounds are already seamlessly healing. This is nothing like fighting a mere human being. Perhaps the Elder was right. This creature is a divine punishment, and it really is here to wipe out the demon once and for all. But if that is the case, then this demon won't be going down without a fight. It creates a singularity within the guardian spirit's chest. The spirit doubles over in pain, howling and clawing at the dirt beneath it. But to the demon's surprise, the guardian spirit doesn't crumble like the humans did. The massive amount of radiation being caused as a side effect of the singularity barely seems to phase the beast. The demon strains to increase the power of the singularity within the guardian spirit, but other than causing it to wail and bellow louder, it seems to have no meaningful effect. The demon, on some level, thinks it's as if the creature is held together by an invincible skeleton. No matter what it does, it only seems to be able to leave superficial damage. The monster is unbreakable. The guardian spirit flails and lunges, breaking the demon's concentration and causing the singularity to collapse. Taking advantage of the sudden respite, the guardian strikes the demon on its disgusting, bulbous head, causing it to stumble backwards, dizzied. The demon steadies itself and gives a defensive screech, but the guardian spirit ignores it. Instead, it leaps onto the demon and grabs it. Shocked by the sudden ferocity of its attacker, the demon clawed at the guardian spirit's face, wounding it but not deterring it. The guardian spirit has a grip that would put iron to shame, and despite trying to wriggle free, the demon couldn't seem to escape. As the guardian spirit roars and stretches open its jaws, the demon activates its emergency escape feature. It creates another miniature singularity around itself, a wormhole. 
and vanishes. The demon reappears in the woods, feeling, for the first time in its wretched existence, a pang of mortal fear. At least it was able to escape back into the woods, where it could steal away into the night and fight again another day. It understands its enemy now. It could figure out weaknesses. It could plan, strategize. But its thoughts are interrupted by a familiar, horrific wailing. Shocked, the demon looks up. It sees the guardian spirit bounding towards it across the forest, barging through trees and splintering them into wood chips. How? How had this creature gotten here already? It's as if it has an innate sense of the demon's location. The demon steals itself and summons all of its power. It would need to annihilate the guardian spirit now, or it would be done for. It opens its freakish head, and the eye in its mouth glows, releasing a wave of radioactive heat that bakes earth and disintegrates trees in its path. It catches the guardian spirit in the blinding blast and wipes it out. When the smoke clears, there's nothing left of the guardian spirit but a charred skeleton. The demon approaches, perhaps to investigate the kill, perhaps to take in the victory. But suddenly, the skeleton rears up, already beginning to regrow its flesh, and closes its clawed hand around the demon's throat. The demon screams, but not for long. It's a quiet morning in Lego City, until the robbery begins. Clients of Lego City's first national Lego bank barely notice at first as men in dark suits with plastic black masks covering their faces slink into the room from every conceivable entrance and exit. When these same 10 sinister Lego strangers all pull out guns, everyone pays close attention. This is a robbery, their leader says while firing his gun into the air. We don't want any heroes. If you try to disrupt our operation, we'll blow you into bricks. The patrons hit the ground, cowering for dear life, as five of the masked robbers approach the tellers with open bags and the other five work crowd control, pointing their weapons at the cowering civilians. These men are hardened Lego criminals. If something goes south, they won't hesitate to start blasting. Empty your vaults, lady, the leader says to one of the tellers. We ain't messing around. We'll ice everyone in here. But the teller doesn't follow his orders. Instead, she reaches under her desk and presses a tiny red button hidden from sight. Suddenly, the room erupts in red flashes and alarms as the bank's security system activates. Robbers and hostages alike feel themselves beginning to panic, but the leader, he stays cool and still. Less than 10 seconds pass before the alarm stops. You could hear a pin drop in the room. Locks deactivate and shutters roll back up. The teller is confused and horrified. What happened? Little does she know, in a van parked outside, an 11th member of the LEGO robbery team is working on a sophisticated computer setup. He's hacked into the bank's security system, and he's been able to both shut down the alarm system and intercept the message that goes out to the local police precinct. The plan is unfolding perfectly. Nice try, the leader says, and shoots the LEGO teller dead. Everyone in the room, including the other LEGO robbers, gasp. Nobody is prepared for things to get this ugly this quickly. Anyone feel like helping me out here? The leader says. Or am I going to need to start wasting more tellers? The surviving tellers read the message loud and clear. They open up the vaults and begin wheeling out stacks of Lego cash, which the robbers begin stuffing into containers and duffel bags. In total, they steal over two million Lego dollars. Each member of the team is going to get a hefty payout. With the mission completed, there's no sense in hanging around. They need to hop into their Lego getaway cars and be out of there before the Lego cops show up. But by the time they're leaving the bank, it's already too late. Lego cop cars are tearing down the street towards their parked getaway vehicles. It doesn't make sense. Their operation was perfectly planned, military in its precision. The whole thing had been over in less than three minutes. How are the cops on them already? But none of them have time to think. The cop cars screech to a halt, and armed officers start climbing out, training their guns on the gobsmacked team of Lego robbers standing in front of the bank. Put down the weapons in the bags, or we'll be forced to take action. A Lego cop screams over a Lego megaphone. The only reply they get is gunfire. The leader levels his Lego gun and starts blasting, taking out two cops and forcing the rest to scramble for cover behind their vehicles. Taking advantage of the moment of opportunity, the robbers scatter like cockroaches under a newly lifted rock. Most make it to their cars, but in the confusion, the Lego police are able to return fire. One of the robbers, the tallest but slowest of the hardened criminal team, goes down in a hail of bullets. Another one of the robbers, who'd been his friend, screams in rage and turns his gun on the police, firing like a madman, not even caring if he hits his target. 
A conveniently placed police sniper in the building across from them wings him with an expert shoulder shot that drops him to the ground, alive but too injured to escape. He's nothing but dead weight now. The remaining eight robbers pile into three LEGO getaway vehicles, two classic cars manned by getaway drivers, and the van where the team's elite LEGO hacker had been doing his high-tech work. Now their job is a lot more simple – get out of here without getting caught or killed. Immediately the chase spills out onto the streets. They'd planned for this possibility. After completing the job, they'd each head to three different pre-designated safe zones, so if one was followed, they wouldn't implicate the others. The plan is complicated by seemingly having every single one of the city's cops on their tail now. Contact between the three vehicles immediately breaks down. The leader of the robbers is in the fastest of the getaway cars, with three others – the driver, the rookie, and the old-timer. Behind them, scores of LEGO police cars surge through the streets. Armed officers hang out of the passenger doors, opening fire on their escape vehicle, hoping to hit them or at least pop the tires. We want to play rough, huh? The leader says to his panicking fellow criminals. We'll show them how to play rough. The leader and the old-timer grab a pair of LEGO submachine guns that are lying across the floor of the car. They lock and load before leaning out of the car windows to return fire. If they're going to go down today, it's going to be in a blaze of glory, not bruised and humiliated in a holding cell. You'll never take us alive, coppers! The old-timer barks as he and the leader open fire on their pursuers. It's a parabolic hellstorm, skittering bullets across the hoods of the police cars behind them. The windshields of even LEGO police cars are reinforced to take this kind of punishment, but not for long. Soon enough, the surge of cars is buckling under the weight of fire from the leader and the old-timer. Cars are crashing into each other and piling up as the criminals take off. What should have been a simple robbery is quickly spiraling into a nightmare for all involved. The death toll is already in the double digits, and the chase goes on, with frequent gunfire exchanged between the LEGO robbers and their LEGO Boys in Blue pursuers. Above all this, above the chase, above the gunfire, above the robbery, two almost godlike giants stare down on the whole chaotic display. These godlike giants are, in fact, a pair of young boys aged 8 and 9. Less than an hour ago, these boys were just bored kids who'd run out of games to play on their Xbox. They had decided to go a little retro and switch up the Minecraft for a classic box of LEGO. One of the two young boys remarked, I think my dad has a big red box of LEGO in his office. He probably won't mind if we use it. Of course, what the boy didn't know was that his father wasn't, contrary to his own belief, an accountant who worked in the city. He was actually a mid-level researcher working with the SCP Foundation, and quite the workaholic at that. He had a tendency to bring his work home with him, metaphorically, and in the case of some safe-class SCPs, when given the proper clearances, literally. One such SCP was SCP-387, the living Lego, a toy that genuinely has a mind of its own. While completely inert and seemingly normal inside their red box, when removed and even partially constructed, the Lego comes to life and begins playing out its roles, from planes to tanks to hospitals to war zones. And these Lego creations are extremely committed to their parts. After finding the box, the young boys did what all children do when they happen upon a box full of Lego. They started building. And thanks to their vast juvenile imaginations, it didn't take long for them to construct an impressive Lego city in the living room. But a standard city full of Lego running smoothly is no fun. The boys needed to introduce a little extra excitement to the proceedings, like, say, a team of bank robbers. The one thing the two young boys don't expect is for the bank robbers, when introduced to the city, to start independently planning and executing a heist on the city's biggest bank. Still, there are worse ways to kill a rainy Sunday. Back on the ground of the LEGO city, the other getaway vehicles are running into trouble. The other car had initially managed to pull ahead from the police, but while trying to cross a bridge, it runs into an unexpected roadblock. Literally, the LEGO police have built a roadblock on the other side of the bridge, and now it's too late to reverse. Open fire! An enraged LEGO police captain yells to his assembled squadron behind the barricades, and they raise the guns and do so. LEGO bullets pepper the getaway car. They can't drive through the barricade. All they can do is make a sharp left turn and hope to avoid the onslaught. Instead, they smash through the LEGO barricade and tumble off the bridge. The car sails into the freezing LEGO river, where the sudden cold paralyzes the robbers and the getaway driver inside. They go into shock and drown moments later. Across the LEGO city, the van containing the hacker, the getaway driver, and another robber had somehow blended in with the traffic and has managed to escape the relentless police chase. 
Everyone inside the van breathes a sigh of relief, knowing they've already done better than most of their fellow criminals tonight. If they manage to make it through, there will be much to celebrate. For them, the next stage of the mission is clear. They need to make their way to a warehouse in the industrial district, their designated drop-off area, where they could hide their stolen money and disappear like leaves in the wind. They've already been through the hard parts, the planning, the robbery itself, the shootout, and car chase with the police. They're out of the woods now. Or so they thought. When they arrive at the warehouse and drive inside, parking their van, they immediately realize that something is off. But by now, it's too late to do anything about it. They suddenly hear footsteps and the screech of tires as heavy police tactical vehicles squeal into the warehouse all around them, boxing them in. LEGO SWAT team operatives climb out of each vehicle and train their weapons on the trapped van. One of them yells, We have you surrounded! There's no way out! Drop your weapons and surrender if you want to walk out of here alive! And so, with no other options, this is exactly what they do. When they exit the vehicle with their hands behind their heads, the LEGO SWAT team tackles them and claps cuffs around their wrists. They'll likely be spending the rest of their lives in jail for this fiasco, but at least they get to live. Across the city, only four members of the robbery team remain alive and free. The leader, the old-timer, the rookie, and the remaining getaway driver, all of whom narrowly managed to escape the extensive police detail following them. It had been a mix of skill and blind luck. The leader knows that one thing about this whole situation has nothing to do with luck. With all the planning they'd been doing and the disabling of the bank's security system, how had the police been on them so fast? There's only one logical answer. They'd been set up. One member of the team was secretly working with the LEGO City Police, and they'd sold the rest of them down the river. The leader doesn't know who specifically ruined this entire operation like that, but he intends to find out, and when he does, he's going to make them pay dearly for their betrayal. But for now, he stays quiet. He doesn't want to show all his cards before they made their way to the safe house, if it was even safe anymore. Still, they'll deal with that problem when they get to it. After a tense 10 minutes of silent driving, they reach the planned rendezvous point, another warehouse in the city docks, built against the section of blue carpet that the young boys who made this world intended to represent the ocean. Here, they'd wait for a speedboat chartered by their employers to pick them up and their ill-gotten gains, if they survive that long. The getaway driver parks the car out of view in the abandoned Oceanside warehouse, and the criminals inside pile out, breathing carefully and stretching their little Lego legs. There's tension in the air, and of course, it's the leader who breaks the silence. Someone here hasn't been entirely honest with us, he says, taking out his Lego handgun. There's no way the cops could get on us that quickly if they hadn't been given some kind of tip. Another grim silence falls over the room. The old-timer, the rookie, and the getaway driver share a suspicious glance. Who among them could be the imposter? The daring escape they'd managed to perform no longer gives them comfort. The millions of dollars in the trunk of their little Lego car may still be forfeit if one of the people in this warehouse is a police informant. The silence is once again broken by the leader, who raises his weapon and shoots the getaway driver dead. The rookie and the old-timer are horrified by the seemingly callous and random display of violence. What's wrong with you? The old-timer barks. The rookie chimes in with, What made you think he was the mole? The leader just laughs, his weapon is still raised, its barrel drifting back and forth between the old-timer and the rookie. His indifference to violence frightens them. He seems unpredictable and dangerous. No reason, the leader says. He'd already done his job. We don't need a getaway driver anymore. And getting rid of him narrows down my options. Which one of you squealed on us? The rookie pulls out his own gun and aims it at the leader. The old-timer follows suit, not wanting to be left out. They now have a full-on Mexican standoff on their hands. Only the leader seems unfazed. The rookie says, If what you say about there being a squealer is true, how would you know it'd be one of us, not someone from the other teams? The leader shrugs. I can't know for sure but I'm not going to take any chances." He levels the gun at the rookie and prepares to fire, when suddenly, a nearby window shatters. It's the police. Their little internal dispute would have to wait if they wanted to keep a single Lego cent of the money they'd stolen. Heavily armed Lego police officers bust open the door with a battering ram, while others climb through the windows. It's another classic ambush. The leader and the old-timer turn their guns towards the invading Lego cops and start firing wildly shooting some and scaring away others as they run towards the car. They can't escape here without the money. If they don't bring the money, then all this chaos was for nothing. The leader runs across the warehouse, narrowly dodging the hail of Lego bullets firing all around him, and skids to a stop behind the getaway car. 
Even with gunshots ringing out from every direction, the leader keeps his cool and reaches into the car. He manages to find the largest duffel bag and slings it over his shoulder. Even if he doesn't get all of the money, he can run away with most of it when that chartered speedboat arrives. Nobody involved in this even notices when the roof lifts entirely off of the warehouse. The two huge young boys stare in from above, curious about where the story is heading down below. They're here just in time to see the tense shootout continue as the desperate leader pops out from his cover and returns fire against the advancing line of police. The old-timer tries his best to hold his own, holding a gun in each hand and firing wildly, but his recklessness soon catches up with him. Outnumbered, the cops with Lego shotguns and assault rifles unload on him, leaving him every bit as dead as the getaway driver. Ducking away to avoid the same fate, the leader notices something. The rookie is nowhere to be seen. Not dead, just gone. He knew it. Of course the rookie had been the mole all along. He should never have trusted the little creep. It had been a perfect plan, and he'd ruined everything. Over the din of gunfire, the leader hears something else. A boat motor. It's the chartered speedboat, his ticket out of this nightmare of bullets and broken promises. He might win after all. He turns and sees the speedboat entering the submerged part of the warehouse, just out of view of the police strike force. It would be a risky move, but he knows he can make it. He doesn't have any choice. Throwing caution to the wind, the leader turns and runs towards the boat, dodging every bullet that the police fire at him. He's doing it. He's doing it. He jumps into the boat, and the boat takes off, speeding away from the warehouse. He laughs in crazed relief, still lugging the duffel bag full of money off his aching shoulder. He's out. He's home free. Until a giant hand from above descends and grabs his Lego boat. He's lifted up and thrown back into the red box he was originally taken from, while the two young boys start taking apart the rest of the Lego city and tidying it back into the box too. My dad'll be home soon, one of the young boys says. You better clean up before he's back. The store manager had heard of crazy customers, but this was something else. A mob comes barreling towards the store, visible through the display windows as they charge down the street. They all look crazed, much closer in appearance to rabid animals than human beings, frenzying, foaming at the mouth. A few of them stumble in their haste while rushing for the automatic sliding doors. Some fall to the ground, only for others to clamber over them, leaping like athletes going over hurdles, with all the same speed but with none of the grace. To the staff inside the store, they look like a pack of zombies, all apparently infected by the same virus that had given them such a ravenous hunger. For savings! I thought Black Friday was a week ago, the trainee remarks as the doors slide open and the first of the mob spills inside. Welcome to the Mattress Madness Megastore, everyone. If you could kindly form an orderly... Within seconds, the trainee vanishes as a tidal wave of Madden Mattress Store customers starts to pile into the store. Each and every one of them is deranged. That much is clear, even from a distance. Across the store, the store manager watches as his colleagues are shoved and tackled out of the way, just from their misfortune of standing too close to the entrance. It's only as one of the mob wanders closer that the store manager notices their eyes. Both lids stay shut, somehow closed, despite the crazed customer standing upright. They aren't screwed tightly. It's clear this person isn't forcefully keeping their eyelids clamped down. Instead, they're gently sealed as if the customer is still asleep or sleepwalking. The whole situation was astounding. First thing in the morning, just at opening time, a horde of sleepwalking customers barged their way into the Mattress Madness megastore, moving and fighting retail staff as if they were all still awake and fully aware. And as if that isn't bizarre enough, it quickly turns out these people aren't here because they're eager not to miss out on great deals on their bedroom furniture. To the store manager's horror, the mob has come to the Mattress Madness megastore for breakfast. He watches an elderly woman, eyes closed, shuffle up to a luxury cashmere pillow top California king-size mattress and proceed to eat it. And not bite by bite either, not even ripping off pieces to chomp through like so much cotton candy. In a far more horrifying fashion, the old lady eats the mattress whole. The store manager feels his blood run cold at the sight of her mouth widening unnaturally, unhinging like a snake eating its prey. Except in this bizarre unaired nature documentary, the snake is a human being, and its meal is a perfectly good bed that moments before had been resting on a stylish ottoman frame. The same exact display of confusing carnage is unfolding all over the Mattress Madness megastore, people devouring entire Egyptian cotton mattresses. Some had even already devoured their respective meals and were already moving on to any accompanying pillows or cushions, feeding on them in much the same way. 
the few members of staff bold enough to try and intervene couldn't seem to wake the sleepwalking shoppers up. No matter how hard they grip each one by the shoulders and shake, nothing could deter them from devouring divans and munching on memory foam. A sudden, terrifying, and inescapable thought cuts through all the confusion, striking the store manager with an even greater fear. The stock room. Behind a series of doors, marked with signs reading, Employees Only, are shelves upon shelves of new units. The Mattress Madness Megastore being a much bigger outlet means that there's additional inventory to replace any mattresses on the shop floor that gets sold. And more mattresses mean more food for the mob. The worry that these sleepwalkers might soon develop a taste for human flesh never occurs to the store manager. He hurriedly races around the store, gathering up as many of his surviving staff as he can, and urges them to help him defend the stock in the back room. Some are already abandoning their posts, ripping name tags off their polo shirt uniforms and rushing to leave the store. They aren't willing to die for $7.25 an hour. The Mattress Madness Megastore has insurance. It'll cover the damaged stock once the crazed customers have feasted on feather beds, but the manager urges them to stay. The store's insurance covers stock that is damaged in transit, not mattresses that are eaten by hungry lunatics. A few stay, using the manager's desperation to leverage pay raises and more annual vacation days in exchange for their help during this crisis of Kashmir carnivory. With his resistance force gathered, the store manager commands the remaining employees to charge for the door at the back of the store, but some of the nearby mattress eaters overhear in their sleepwalking state. The staff freeze, uncertain whether to bolt for the stockroom and risk being chased by the hungry customers. They need a distraction, a sacrificial lamb to grab the horde's attention. And with a solemn expression, the store manager realizes what he must do. This isn't a fight he'll make it out of alive. He leaps up onto a twin inner spring and calls out to the crazed customers. Attention, everyone, he bellows. I'd like to announce that all our mattresses are half off for the next five minutes. The crowd goes even more rabid, all eager to eat the pillowy pedestal the store manager is standing upon. His staff flees in the opposite direction, rushing to barricade themselves inside the storeroom while their boss meets a grisly demise, and the crazed customers devour every remaining mattress in sight. But what on earth could have possibly caused such a scene to unfold? What was the inciting incident for this unprecedented act of mass matricide, the Devon destruction, and combination carnage? All it took was one seemingly innocuous image, an unassuming online post, to stir over 7,000 people into a featherbed feeding frenzy. It's December the 3rd, 2020, almost an entire day before the deranged events that would soon unfold at the Mattress Madness Megastore. And just like he does most days after college, the student is trawling various internet forums in search of things to laugh at. He's procrastinating and, through inaction, allowing himself to be buried under a veritable avalanche of assignments, all with rapidly approaching dates that they're due in by. But he doesn't care. He can always do them tomorrow. As far as he's concerned, there's plenty of time for him to waste doing, well, very little. But no matter where he looks, nothing brings with it even the smallest hit of dopamine. It's been hours since he stopped checking the clock at the bottom right-hand corner of his computer screen, instead wearing out the muscles of his finger as it spins the scrolling wheel of his mouse. His social media feed is all the same, more doom and gloom, and despite his searching, he can't find anything funny to alleviate his ongoing existential nightmare for so much as a second. If anything, seeing every anxiety-inducing post about the state of the world or dour headlines of reposted news articles only makes everything worse. That is, until the fateful link appears in his inbox. It's from one of his friends at college, living in the dorm across campus. The pair of them constantly swapped links and exchanged memes over direct messages, sometimes while sitting in the middle of important lectures. So the student quickly opens up the latest message from his friend, pleased to have something to relieve the monotony instilled by the prior several hours worth of mindless scrolling. Sure enough, his friend's message sits waiting to be read in his inbox. It's just a single blue hyperlink with no additional context offered, nothing to indicate what the link is or what website it leads to, or even why the student's friend bothered to send it. They're long past the need to provide context for the memes they send each other. The link redirects to a familiar corner of the internet to the student, the deep fried meme subreddit. Just seeing that written in the hyperlink is enough to spur an enthusiastic click. It's like going home back to somewhere warm and welcoming, where everybody knows your name and they're always glad you came, and where the student knows he's bound to find something to entertain himself. 
A deep-fried meme is usually a heavily edited image with a number of different filters added to it. Its contrast is boosted, the picture is oversaturated and distorted, all to the point wherein the colors are unnatural, and the image appears as a grainy, washed-out mess of pixels. And they're one of the student's favorite subgenre of funny posts. Opening up the link sent by his friend, he finds one such deep-fried meme staring back at him. It depicts a man, long-haired and wearing dark clothes, presumably a fan of heavy metal music. In front of the metalhead is a table with a chessboard placed neatly atop it. The pieces on the board are distributed in such a way that places the metalhead in checkmate, and his opponent? Directly opposite him at the table is a glass bowl filled with water and a goldfish aimlessly swimming around. And to top off this Louvre-worthy masterpiece is text, seemingly cut and paste from various different places, judging by the alternating fonts and styles. The words have been placed into a sentence that reads, Tell me your secrets, fish. And the student explodes with laughter, as if answering his prayers for some humorous entertainment to avoid working on his college assignments, his friend had appeared out of the blue and delivered a perfect deep-fried meme. But that momentary boost in serotonin levels quickly subsides, and the student knows how these exchanges work. This has to be reciprocal, a mutual trading of memes, like for like, akin to swapping trading cards in the playground at a younger age. And so he searches the subreddit for a token worthy of returning to his friend. He clicks on a search filter, sorting the results from the top posts of all time to the most recent posts of the day. These were fresh, hot off the presses, or out of the deep fryer in this case. And the newer they were, the lower the chances that his friend had already seen them. Scrolling through, the student is met with a few underwhelming attempts that weren't worthy of the prestige expected by the deep fried meme subreddit. They'd be better suited for posting on R cringe. But then, it appears, the perfect, deep fried, crispy, golden brown, cooked to perfection picture to send back to his friend. The distorted image is a photograph of a bed, specifically a king size mattress on what looks like a polished wooden bed frame although it's not easy to tell thanks to just how grainy the picture has been made. Whoever edited this meme knew what they were doing and has nailed the absurdist, bizarre humor that the student and his friend thrive on. A label over the mattress simply reads, King Size, and the meme is captioned in a classic top text, bottom text format with the phrase, A feast fit for a king. And the piece de resistance, the crowning touch that makes this meme worthy of the student's lofty standards, is the title given to it by the original poster. It sums up the meme perfectly, succinctly in three words. Eat your mattress. The student erupts into uncontrollable fits of laughter, so much so that tears start to stream down his face. His stomach almost feels like it might explode at just how fine he thinks the post he's found is. Through giggles that hit like the aftershock of an earthquake, he copies the link to the Eat Your Mattress meme into a message and hits send to share the hilarity with his friend. Little does he know, he's just condemned his friend to the same fate that now awaits him. As soon as he falls asleep, it'll happen. And the student and his friend aren't the only ones either. The post spreads, either sent directly from one person to another or seen by those just browsing the deep fried meme subreddit and happening across the Eat Your Mattress photo. Not all of them find it funny. They don't have to. They aren't even required to share it, to pass it on to someone else and help the post spread like wildfire. They've looked at it, and that's enough. Come the next day, an estimated 7,000 people across the world have seen the same meme, and it affects them all in the exact same way, becoming a directive, a command planted in their subconscious, one that they will act on without even realizing. It's been only a few hours since all the carnage erupted at the Mattress Madness Megastore, but by now, the SCP Foundation has swept in and taken control of the scene. A cordoned section of multiple blocks under the cover story of a dangerous gas leak. It's enough to keep civilians and prying eyes away without asking too many questions. But as for the Foundation personnel themselves, they've got plenty of unanswered questions of their own. Two members of the cleanup team are reviewing the store's security footage, baffled by the sights of the chaos that unfolded there earlier that same morning. On the screen, frenzied customers are eating entire mattresses, stretching their mouths wide open and swallowing them whole. They watch as the store manager appears to make an attempt at a noble sacrifice to distract the horde of ravenous customers so his employees can rush towards the storeroom. But the manager is fine. Once the horde has eaten all the mattresses out on the store's main floor, they start trying to break into the stockroom out back, where the other employees have used layers upon layers of cellophane-wrapped mattresses to barricade the door. 
By the time the Foundation arrives, the customers have already forced their way into the stockroom and have devoured around half the mattresses while exhausted employees try to wake them from their sleepwalking state. The Foundation sees to it that everyone affected is rapidly administered with memory-wiping amnestics to forget all about the ordeal. Their next job is to try and track down the source of whatever caused this unprecedented outbreak of mattress eating. But being experts in all things anomalous, it doesn't take the Foundation long to start pursuing possible explanations. Having already confirmed this wasn't a viral anomaly, their next course of action is to investigate possible mimetic causes, and sure enough, a common factor quickly presents itself. The mob that attacked the Mattress Madness Megastore, along with subjects who have engaged in similar acts of mattress eating across the world, all have one thing in common. Each one has been exposed to the Eat Your Mattress post on the Deep Fried Memes subreddit. It takes some deduction on the Foundation's part to figure out the cause, after all, the meme in question is similar to a number of others posted in the same subreddit. As a result, the Foundation's online detection software, or web crawlers, initially fail to flag the mattress meme as an anomalous image. Once they do, it is designated as SCP-5126. But with a cause established, the pieces start to fit together. The Foundation's researchers soon realize what the image does. Another reason it was initially missed is that its effects only occur once the subject that has seen it falls asleep. The student is one such subject who lived through this. He dozes off in his gaming chair well past the middle of the night, hours after he's first seen SCP-5126. While sound asleep, without waking up once, he starts to seek out his mattress, laying unoccupied on his bed on the other side of his cramped dorm room. He and all the others who have seen SCP-5126 then consume their mattresses, including in many cases their pillows, any cushions, and even plush toys. Their bodies stretch unnaturally to accommodate the meal, only to return to normal once they have done the deed. Having returned to normal, the student and the others like him remain unaware they've just eaten a mattress. But the Foundation is left puzzled. There's still one question that hasn't been answered. Their examination of the several hundred customers at the Mattress Madness Megastore revealed that the consumed mattresses aren't digested like food ordinarily is. They vanish without a trace. So this naturally begs the question, where are all these eaten mattresses going? Well, the Foundation quickly comes up with an experiment to find out. They place tracking devices inside of the cell of a member of D-Class personnel and expose him to SCP-5126. Sure enough, the meme takes effect, and once asleep, he eats his mattress. The experiment is going exactly as the Foundation planned. Now they can follow the signal from the tracking devices to pinpoint the destination that all the consumed mattresses are disappearing to. And after several sweeps of the Earth's surface, their satellites discover a ping coming from a remote location in the state of Montana. MTF Sigma-16 suit up, ready to head out to the location. This mobile task force operates under the code name slumber party, and it's up to them to investigate. They come across a large structure. It looks a lot like a medieval castle, but it has been built out of mattresses and large cushions. It's the ultimate pillow fort. It even has pillars and all the fortifications you'd expect from a real historical castle, all made out of even more pillows. The slumber party team enters the fort and quickly discovers that the structure is able to anomalously reconstruct itself. Sigma-3 kicks over a stack of pillows and plush toys arranged to resemble a statue and watches as it reforms after collapsing. The team ventures deeper into the pillow fort and is quickly met with humanoid entities that are also made out of pillows. An entity swipes a pillow arm at Sigma-1, but she ducks out of the path of the attack. Drawing her firearm, she fires, causing a plume of feathers to spray out of the pillow person. The entity is unfazed, and several additional shots do nothing. Even a taser is ineffective. The pillow entities are exhibiting extreme resistance to damage, but Sigma-2 has an idea. She grabs a pillow from one of the walls and uses it to bash the entity attacking her teammate Sigma-1. The pillow person collapses into a pile on the floor, inanimate, and just like that, the mobile task force has a way to fight back. They all grab pillows and make quick work of their attackers before they move on to explore the rest of the castle. Then they encounter the king. There is a man sitting atop a large stack of cushions, wearing a nightcap and pajamas, eating feathers from an expensive brand of pillow. Scattered around him are empty pillowcases. Trying to ignore the smell, the slumber party team attempts to interrogate him. He claims to be the king of cushion, a 
obsessed with pillows since a young age. Their smell, taste, and texture inspire him to create a kingdom of plush, his masterpiece of mattresses. It doesn't take very long for the Foundation operatives to realize that this man is insane. They question him about how SCP-5126, the Eat Your Mattress meme, works. How is it able to make people consume entire mattresses and send them to the king's cushiony castle? And why? Well, the king explains that buying mattresses is expensive, so in order to build his castle, he's outsourced the gathering of building materials. As he sees it, he is offering people affected by the meme a delicious meal in exchange for their beds, spreading the world of pillows so he can gather resources for his kingdom. Suddenly, he challenges the slumber party team to a pillow fight for having tracked him down. The King of Cushion takes up a pillow in one hand and charges towards the mobile task force, armed and ready to do battle with them all. He is quickly incapacitated by Sigma-1's taser and drops to the floor defeated. Now designated SCP-5126-A, the King of Cushion is transported back to the SCP Foundation for analysis and containment. Their testing reveals he possesses no anomalous properties whatsoever, and the king actually requires his stomach to be pumped thanks to the copious amounts of pillow feathers he's been eating. The Foundation gets to work dismantling his pillow fort and moving all the components into storage. And as for the Eat Your Mattress meme itself, the Foundation's web crawlers are keeping an eye out for any other posts of the anomalous image. And don't worry, if you find yourself giggling at a funny deep-fried image that jokingly implies you should eat your mattress, the Foundation will ensure you don't remember it happening, and they'll even throw in a replacement for your swallowed mattress at no added cost. Now that's a bargain. Warning lights flash, and heavy boots stomp down the sanitized hallways of Site-19. A mobile task force has been dispatched, wielding heavy weaponry and wearing tactical gear. But underneath their jet-black armor, these mobile task operatives are sweating. The SCP thereafter has a very particular set of skills, skills that make them a nightmare to people like this team. Plainly put, anything that the mobile task force can do, the anomaly can do better, because the anomaly that chose to breach containment is SCP-056, codenamed A Beautiful Person. This shape-shifting being takes the form of a superior version of whatever object or entity it encounters, though typically only by a relatively slim margin. The Foundation has no real way of truly containing SCP-056 because of the unique nature of its anomalous abilities. Instead, their tactic has long been playing to the truly toxic ego of the creature, designing the containment chamber more like a luxury hotel room, perfectly suited to 056's refined taste. However, as a sentient being with a mean streak, keeping an entity like 056 permanently caged is rarely as simple as sprucing up said cage. Some days, like today, 056 will want a change of scenery, and on those days, there's almost nothing the Foundation can do to stop it. As the mobile task forces dispatched to Site-19 scan the halls and spool through security footage, desperately hoping to find some clue as to the vain creature's presence, 056 is actually long gone. Having assumed the form of a handsome, charming scientist, after an average-looking scientist with bad social skills walked past its containment chamber, 056 had slipped out of the site undetected before anyone even realized that a breach had occurred. Then, seeing a vulture fly overhead, 056 had taken the form of a bald eagle and flown further, leaving the isolated Site-19 in the dust. 056 is ready and eager for a night on the town, but when 056 decides it's going to paint the town red, it doesn't always mean it in the metaphorical sense. 056 arrives in a small American town, like many that pop up along lonely desert highways. Noticing a plain, unremarkable woman walking past, it immediately transforms into an absolute stunner, with fine diamond jewelry and an expensive-looking red dress. As she walks to a local diner, she turns heads from everyone she passes, doing nothing to hide her conceited smirk. I really should do this more often, she thinks. When she passes a self-conscious looking woman with a fake Gucci handbag, 056 suddenly manifests the real deal, brimming with stacks of cash and even more jewelry. Everywhere she goes, her mere presence makes people feel terrible about themselves, and she couldn't be happier. She walks into a local diner, where a report on the radio is detailing abandoned, wrecked cars found along the side of a local highway. There were bodies inside in horrific states, so horrific that they couldn't even share the details on the broadcast. But 056 doesn't care about any of that. She simply orders some pancakes in the diner and rudely asks the cashier if he can break a $100 bill. 
When she receives her pancakes, she takes a single bite before throwing them at the wall and complaining about how terrible they are, then leaving. She takes joy in knowing how awful this will make people feel. On the way out, she decides to take a shortcut down a dark alley, where a woman in expensive clothes, carrying an expensive purse brimming with money, is liable to attract the wrong kind of attention. Two muggers, one armed with a switchblade and the other armed with a gun, emerge from the darkness, wearing malicious grins. That purse looks a little heavy there, lady, one of the muggers says. Yeah, how about you let us carry it for you, the other adds. 056 smiles and says, Are you sure you have the upper body strength? They don't take kindly to this. As the two muggers prepare to beat this strange woman within an inch of her life and steal all her earthly belongings, she suddenly transforms, shapeshifting into a ripped kung fu master in white robes. Before either of the muggers can respond to this baffling transformation, 056, in his kung fu master form, is beating the living hell out of them and leaving the dastardly duo in a crumpled heap on the ground as he walks away, whistling a merry tune. But making women feel inadequate, insulting small businesses, and beating up petty criminals isn't enough for SCP-056. This thoroughly unpleasant anomaly has the need for speed, and the best way to achieve that need is to obtain a car, or perhaps, even better, become one. Not long after the thought passes his mind, 056 arrives at a parking lot. He looks over the various parked cars, most of which are unremarkable specimens. That is, until he comes across a parked Ferrari and feels his imagination begin to soar with possibilities. A Ferrari? Oh, I can do better than that. In the following moments, SCP-056 flawlessly shapeshifts into a brand new, cherry red Bugatti sports car and starts doing gleeful donuts in the parking lot. 056 then puts the pedal to the metal and speeds out onto the road, where it can pick up some real speed, having no idea that for once it would attract some attention it didn't want. But 056 doesn't care about that yet. It's too focused on breaking its speedometer with sheer insane speed, tearing down the highway at over 100 miles an hour, then building and building and building. 056 is lucky that there are seemingly no other cars on the road tonight, well, except one that it notices far in the distance behind itself. Is that a beat-up old police cruiser? How embarrassing. 056 speeds up even more, hoping to leave the police cruiser as little more than a distant memory, but it doesn't work out that way. Instead, the beat-up police cruiser miles behind 056's sleek supercar begins to build in speed. Little by little, it seems to be doing the impossible, catching up. Being a thoroughly arrogant and unpleasant anomaly, 056 doesn't take the prospect of being humiliated lightly. It decides to take a sharp left turn off of the highway onto a mostly dirty side road, slowing down slightly, as though to challenge the police cruiser to carry on the chase. The police cruiser accepts the challenge and makes the turn after 056 with shocking speed. How is this busted up old police cruiser keeping pace with a brand new anomalous Bugatti? 056 doesn't understand, but it won't give in. It has to keep believing it's the best, no matter what. 056 tears off down the road until it reaches some dense woods with only a single dirt road cutting through the middle. The Bugatti's wheels kick up mud and dry leaves, its roaring engine sending the animals of the forest scattering in every direction. And still, the police cruiser follows, its high beams cutting through the murky gloom of the forest. Suddenly, it goes from eerie silence, save for the roar of twin engines, to the flashes of red and blue lights and the shrill wail of the police cruiser's siren. 056 finds the whole arrangement laughable. It's escaped the SCP Foundation before. Did some small-town cop really believe he could take 056 down? But what 056 doesn't know is that it isn't being followed by just any small-town cop. It gets a clue to the true horrifying nature of its pursuer, and the Bugatti's radio crackles into life, and a single word begins endlessly repeating in a warped, scratchy voice suffused with static. Run, 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 run. 056 is at a loss. This doesn't make sense. It shouldn't be possible for any normal police cruiser to have this effect, unless... Before 056 can even finish the thought, the police cruiser closes the distance in a single freakish burst of speed. It smashes into the back of the Bugatti and rams it into a brutal tailspin, sending it skidding off the dirt road and crashing into the trees, where it flips twice and comes to rest upside down. Totaled. Its radio still repeats that single warped, ominous word. Run, run, run. Run! 
056 is stunned as it lays, injured and in car form, against the cold and unyielding trees of this dark, isolated forest. How is that even possible? It doesn't make sense. Is this police cruiser some kind of undercover tactical vehicle in league with those worthless worms at the SCP Foundation? The police cruiser has ground to a halt on the dirt road, idling, its light still cutting through the gloom. The driver's door, marked with the words, protect and serve, slides open, and a shadowy figure steps out. 056 can immediately sense an inhuman presence in its midst. This may look like some doughy, middle-aged cop with a handlebar mustache, but that's just a disguise. And if anyone understands disguises, it's SCP-056. What 056 doesn't know is that the entity about to attack it is, in fact, known to the SCP Foundation, but isn't aligned with them in the slightest. They refer to it as SCP-973, codenamed Smokey, an anomalous police cruiser that contains a terrifying occupant. It's known as one of the more deadly, mysterious, and sadistic creatures that the Foundation still hasn't fully succeeded in containing. Any humans who fall prey to it have a terrifying demise in store for them, but how would an anomaly fare? We're about to find out. Smokey, the nightmarish anomalous police officer, begins walking down the grassy bank towards the overturned Bugatti. His skin is paper pale. His eyes glow a burning brimstone red. He clenches his pale, veiny fists, excited by the thought of the coming violence. This idiot in the sports car really thought it could get away from him? No one gets away from Smokey. Exit the vehicle, boy, Smokey says in a crackling southern drawl, or I'm gonna rip you out of it. But Smokey doesn't wait for an answer. He charges forward and digs his fingers into the metal of the car, displaying his terrifying superhuman strength. He begins tearing away parts of the car, peeling back panels of metal like a normal person would peel an orange. He imagines the terror of the person within, the sweet fruit under all these layers of obstruction. Gonna get you, boy he repeats, voice almost shaking with excitement. Gonna get you. Gonna get you. Gonna make you scream. Gonna make you scream like a scared little piggy. Then suddenly, the car just vanishes. The chunks of metal he's holding are gone. Smokey looks around, baffled. He's done strange and terrible things on these roads, but this is still a new one, even for him. He looks up and stares into the darkness of the forest. The car is nowhere to be seen out there. Where are you, boy? Smokey rasps. You think you can run from me? Smokey hears a subdued scoff coming from behind the tree in front of him, followed by a tall, dark stranger stepping out into the dim light of the cruiser's high beams. It's SCP-056, but it isn't taking the form of a luxury sports car anymore. Now, it's taking the form of a cinematic legend, Dirty Harry, as played by Clint Eastwood, the ultimate shoot-first-ask-questions-later cop. You think I'm running from you, punk? Harry asked. Truth is, I was sick of looking at that ugly mug of yours. Figured I'd take five, before I came back and put a bullet through it. Smokey growls, his jaw unhinging and extending into a horrific black hole. Not exactly disproving my point there, Slick, Harry chided. Smokey isn't one for trading barbs. He runs towards Harry with his hands extended, claws growing out of the tips of his fingers. But Harry knows he's dealing with a monster now, and he's ready to fight back. Quicker than Smokey can even notice, Harry reaches into a holster in his coat and pulls out his trademark weapon, a 44 Magnum revolver, one of the most powerful revolvers ever made, and he's a dead shot with it. Harry draws a bead on Smokey and fires a high-powered round through the monster's forehead. Smokey is staggered for a moment, seemingly almost stunned by the shot, but the effects wear off quickly. Smokey roars and swings for Harry, who dodges in the nick of time. Smokey's clawed hand tears through the bark of a nearby tree. 056 buries a moment of quiet anxiety. It thinks, Even for me, this thing is powerful. I need to watch my step. You ought to show me some respect, boy. Smokey growls, I'm a man of the law. You have no idea what you're dealing with. He swings again and again for Harry, forcing him further back into the forest. 056 tries its best to maintain that unflappable Eastwood calm. Respect is earned, not given, punk. Harry says, leveling his magnum. You think you're hot stuff because you torture and terrorize? Putting down scum like you is exactly why I joined the force. Harry unleashes, emptying the cylinder into Smokey's center mass. Bang, 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 bang. Smokey's body does the bullet dance as Harry's magnum rounds punch into him like hypersonic metal fists. Smokey digs his feet into the ground and steadies himself. 
Harry reaches into his pocket for some spare rounds, discharges the empty shells from the cylinder, and begins quickly reloading the revolver. Smokey gives him no quarter. The demonic cop charges forward and grabs Harry by the lapels of his suit jacket, lifting him off the ground and slamming his back into a nearby tree. The revolver falls from his hand and clatters to the forest floor. Smokey has the upper hand now. His grip is ironclad. It seems as though 056, even as Dirty Harry, won't be able to escape this one. Smokey presses him against the tree until 056 can feel the bark creaking and his bones beginning to buckle. Not so talky now, aren't we, boy? Smokey snickers. I'm gonna kill you slow. You're gonna beg for mercy. You're a good fighter, 056 said, beginning to shift. But I'm better. Moments later, SCP-056 is no longer Dirty Harry. Now, he's John Wick. The movie super assassin specialized in almost every form of combat. Smokey is briefly confused, and 056 takes advantage of that. With a few expert strikes to Smokey's face, 056 is able to wriggle out of his grip and kick Smokey in the chest, creating some distance between them. Let's go. It's been too long since I've had a decent workout, 056, as John Wick says. Smokey reaches for John Wick, but John, drawing upon his years of combat experience, blocks Smokey's attack and returns a brutal flurry of blows to Smokey's face and chest. Every time Smokey swings with his supernatural strength, 056 swipes at his arms and uses his momentum against him. While Smokey clearly has the strength advantage by the nature of SCP-056's anomalous ability, this form clearly trounces Smokey in terms of skill. Part of 056 is afraid, having rarely been met with this level of resistance. Another part of 056 is exhilarated. Getting to be better than an entity this formidable is a truly thrilling experience. You're really starting to get on my nerves, boy, Smokey says, pulling out a nightstick from his police belt. 056 draws a long titanium combat knife out of his coat. Prove it, he says, assuming a knife fighting stance. Smokey swings for 056 with his nightstick, who blocks it with the edge of his blade. What follows is almost a kind of sword fight, where 056 and Smokey take turns striking and parrying with their respective weapons. 056 cracks his neck, giving a smarmy grin that only irritates Smokey further. The demonic cop throws his nightstick directly at 056's face. The arrogant anomaly is able to deflect the well-aimed stick with his knife, only to realize that it was just a distraction from the following haymaker. Smokey's fist collides with 056's cheek with the force of a runaway car. It knocks him off his feet, taking his legs out from under him and throwing him to the ground with a mighty thud. And Smokey doesn't let up. He crouches over the stunned 056 and strikes him again and again, pounding his clenched fists into 056's head. If the self-obsessed anomaly had any chance to speak, it probably would have yelled, Not the face! Not the face! Unlucky for 056, mercy is not a word in Smokey's vocabulary. 056 doesn't have time to transform. With every punch, 056's body is pounded deeper into the dirt. He can feel himself losing consciousness under the flurry of blows. For the first time, he's truly terrified about what will happen to him if he passes out. What terrible things will Smokey do to him? Suddenly, floodlights illuminate the forest from every angle. The hum of helicopters sound from far above. Tactical vehicles surround the forest, manned by highly trained, highly armed SCP Foundation mobile task forces. Snipers line up their shots on Smokey, preparing to fire with armor-piercing 50 caliber rounds. Ground troops armed with assault rifles all pour in. As though a magic spell has been cast, Smokey, along with his cursed cruiser, disappears. All that's left is a bruised, bloody, and disoriented SCP-056, still shaking in pain and terror on the ground. It doesn't take long for 056 to be surrounded by Foundation personnel, ready to take it back into containment. To even its own surprise, it's tremendously relieved. 056, whimpering, says, I'd like to go back to my room, please. It's never a nice feeling waking up lying amongst shards of broken glass in the middle of the road. The dawn sky above the biker looks almost peaceful. It's as if nothing had gone wrong at all, as if everything is right in the world. But slowly, the throbbing pain washes into his helmeted head, and the sound of the traffic surrounding him rises in his ears. A sea of onlookers gathers around as the cars blast their horns. Through the cracked visor of his helmet, the biker can see concerned faces, people calling emergency services, and a few women crying. His paramedic bike is toppled on its side about 40 feet from him. There are long black tire marks running up to where it lies, smoking slightly on its side. With a groan, the biker sits himself up and shakes his head. Bad idea. 
Looking around, though, it seems he's the only one injured. His bike had gone into the front of a car at the junction. The occupants of the car stand by nervously, offering him whatever little assistance they can. But there's no time for that, the biker suddenly realizes. He looks down at his watch frantically. It's 12.03 p.m. There's not enough time. He rushes over to the bike as fast as he can and lifts it back upright. A couple of onlookers try to grab his arms, trying to sit down to rest, but he can't. There's no time. He has just three minutes to get to St. Mary's Hospital in central London. Right now, he's at the junction outside Baker Street Station. He can still make it on time if he gets on his bike and goes now. The biker swings his leg onto the bike and kicks it into life. He takes a deep gulp and looks over his shoulder at the box on the back of his bike. He can't risk opening it here. The damage may already be done. But if the heart is still alive in that box, it is the only chance that a 10-year-old boy has for a normal life. If he doesn't get to the hospital in the next three minutes, his life could be over. The school children stand in a circle, looking down at the dead bird with a morbid fascination. Do you think it's alive? No, no way. The boy in the middle of the group goes to pick up a stick. With an air of false confidence, he walks up to the bird and gives it a prod. It makes a squelching noise. The other kids all reel in shock, making retching noises and laughing about it. It's only when their teacher comes out to call them inside that the group disperses, leaving the animal carcass alone, sitting at the edge of the playground, outside the view of boring adults. Each passing day, the kids wander over to the bird's body. It's kind of the best biology lesson they've ever had as they watch the animal slowly decompose. At first, its body just shrinks, goes flat almost. The feathers start falling out and it loses all of its color. Then it starts to get puffy. Different parts of its flesh bulge out in weird places, as if they're being inflated like a balloon animal at someone's birthday party. But then, the maggots come. There are only a couple of tiny white crawling wrigglers in the bird's body at first, but a couple of days after that, it's infested with them. The creepy crawlies wriggle all over the body. But as the boy looks down at the dead bird, he spots something very peculiar, something they haven't seen in a biology class before. There's a red maggot wriggling and crawling in amongst the rest of the creepy crawlies. It squirms like the rest of them, but even over the course of the school day, it quickly grows larger than any of the others. What do you think it is? The boy stares at it. It looks like a worm. And a worm is exactly what it was. The next day, when the kids return, they see that the red maggot is now much larger than any of the others feasting on the bird. With a slightly translucent body, cherry red coloring, and small white speckles on its skin, it looks unlike anything they've ever seen before. Actually, not unlike anything they've ever seen before, it looks exactly like something that all the kids recognize very well. In fact, one of the kids has a bag of them right now that he's chewing on. A candied worm. The kids stare in curiosity, first at the bag of candy that their friend has in his hand, and then down at the worm, slowly eating its way through the decomposing bird. As far as their eyes can tell, the two things are exactly the same. Except, of course, that the one eating the bird seems to be alive. Kids being kids, the next thing that happened was sort of inevitable. One dares the boy to eat it. He almost wretches in disgust. There's no way he's even touching it. And then, another one of the children throws down the poison chalice and dares him. The boy stands there nervously. He knows that he's not allowed to eat worms. That had been a lesson ingrained in him from a very young age. But his mother isn't here right now, and this thing doesn't look like any kind of worm that he's seen before. It almost looks a bit… tasty. In exchange for eating the worm, another one of the children promises he'll give him five English pounds. The kids around the circle gasp. That's a lot of money. None of them have even got two pounds on them, let alone five. Think of all the sweets you could buy with that kind of money. But the boy is adamant. He puffs his chest out, he stands up tall, and he nods firmly. Five pounds, or he wouldn't do it. After some intense schoolyard debate, the deal is sealed. As the boy lies in bed that night, staring at the ceiling and grumbling, he knows that he is not happy about what his friends have done to him today. He's going to get them back for this. Only he's getting a bit of a tummy ache. Getting is the wrong word. He's had a tummy ache for most of the evening. What he's experiencing now is heartburn. It feels as if something is crawling in his chest. The boy just ignores it. It's probably just his worries about the worm inside of him. He chewed it up pretty well. There's no way that it's still alive in him, surely. 
His uneasy sleep is punctuated by rotten dreams, dreams in which he finds himself lying on the floor and his playground lying on the ground at school, unable to move as people gather around him to poke him with a stick. He feels his skin covered with maggots. They even crawl across the surface of his eyes. In his chest, there's a searing pain. The boy wakes with a start as he feels his heart pounding, thudding against his ribs. It's agonizing. Adrenaline courses through him as he sweats off his face. Crying out for his mom, the boy lies there in bed, feeling the heart attacking his system. When you decide to become a surgeon, you have to accept that you're not going to get very much sleep most nights. In fact, it's more than that. You have to not only accept that you won't get much sleep most nights, but you also have to be at your absolute best when you've had no sleep and it's the middle of the night. With over 40 years under his belt, the surgeon doesn't need coffee anymore, even when the junior doctor offers it to him as he strides toward the operating theater. Instead, he asks them to fill him in on the situation. Who's his patient? What's going on? What needs to be done? The doctor accompanying him reads the notes in a calm but hurried voice. They haven't got much time on this one at all. At any moment, the boy's heart could give out. The surgeon asks what's wrong with the organ, and the doctor looks at his notes in apparent confusion. Apparently, over the course of the night, the boy has suffered a 72% reduction in the mass of his heart. The surgeon stops just on the other side of the door. He doesn't want to have this conversation in front of his whole team. He whispers to the doctor in a terse voice, What kind of infection does this boy have that his heart has undergone that rapid of a deterioration? It's not an infection at all, sir. It's… well, sir, it's a worm. The doctor holds out a sheet to him. The surgeon takes it from him. He looks down at the x-ray to see a scan of the boy's chest cavity. It doesn't look so bad. There's a hole in the heart for sure, but the surgeon has encountered worse in his career. This was taken when the boy was first admitted. The doctor hands the surgeon a second x-ray. And this was taken just one hour later. It is barely recognizable as a human heart. There seems to be a mass growing in the cavity that was left by the heart. And there, infecting all of the boy's organs, was the shape of a worm. The biker weaves his way through the traffic down on Marylebone Road, eyes darting frantically in all directions. He may have a concussion, and he may not be allowed to drive at all right now. In fact, he knows he definitely isn't. But he is under strict instructions. This heart needs to get to St. Mary's Hospital before it's too late. The bike careens around the corner and skids to a halt outside the emergency doors. An ambulance team in front of him is trying to help an old lady out of the back of their vehicle, but the biker doesn't have time for them. He grabs the organ box from the back of the bike and races into the building. It takes all of his remaining concentration to navigate through the maze of hospital corridors on his way to the operating theater. On a better day, he'd be able to do this with no problem, but with his head injury, he can see the light starting to blur all around him. Ward 6, Ward 7, Ward 7A, Ward 7B, he runs as fast as his heavy boots will allow him, feeling that energy draining from his system. He can't look at his watch, he can't check the time, he just has to find this boy. Operating theater, there, right up ahead of him, just a couple of hundred feet. There's a doctor waiting outside the door who looks up at the sound of his footsteps. The biker rips his helmet off and holds out the box with the heart in it, panting heavily. It's the moment of truth. Is he too late? The doctor looks shell-shocked, not at the biker's arrival, but clearly at something else she's just seen. The man starts to explain, but runs out of words, and instead beckons the biker to follow him into the observation room. There, the two of them stand looking through the glass at the little boy lying on the operating table with the surgeon standing over him. There's something in the air. The biker sniffs, confused. Can anyone else smell sugar? Next time you open a packet of candied worms, take a second to look through the little creepy crawlies in the bag. Perhaps poke a couple of them, just to see if any of them are moving. You can never be too careful. If you had told the parents of that young boy on the night when their son woke up with heart palpitations, telling stories of eating a worm at school, that the only health concerns he would have going forward were mild diabetes and a slightly raised level of blood sugar, I'm sure they would have been thrilled to hear it. You see, SCP-839, commonly referred to within the Foundation as candied worms, is much scarier on the surface than it is underneath. Not only does this SCP resemble your usual candy worm, but its body is actually composed of sugar flavorings and colorings, roughly equivalent to what you would find in most convenience store candy aisles. Each instance even has a small raised bit of writing near the tail specifying which flavor it is. While the origins of these worms are yet to be determined, cases have sprung up across much of the Western world, with higher numbers reported in areas with higher levels of diabetes. 
There seems to be a parallel between high sugar diets and the presence of SCP-839. Whether they are of man-made or other origins is yet to be determined. That is not to say that SCP-839 cannot survive outside of human populations. This SCP in the wild primarily feeds on decomposing organic matter and is capable of sustaining itself on a purely vegetarian diet. However, when ingested into the human body, SCP-839 will target specific organs and burrow its way towards them. The organ in question depends on which color candied worm the SCP instance is. For example, the red cherry flavored candied worms will burrow towards the heart and consume that, while the blue raspberry ones will instead feed on the human's kidney. One would expect the health consequences of this feeding to be severe. However, as the SCP feeds, it will also change its own shape and chemical composition until the worm itself becomes a substitute organ for the one that it is consuming. However, this substitute organ is not a perfect replacement, as other health consequences are derived from its presence. For example, the green apple-flavored SCP-839-3 targets the eye and replaces it with a jelly-green version of the human eye. While this eye is mostly capable of sight, subjects have reported mild hallucinations and blurriness of vision, as well as a greenish tint to how they see the world. Fortunately for the Foundation, SCP-839 reproduces sexually, meaning that individual instances require a partner in order to have offspring. This has made containment of this SCP much more feasible. Though they are a relatively low-priority entity in the broader scope of the Foundation, there are no known cases as of yet of any SCP-839 infections leading to death or serious chronic illness. Therefore, any instances that are captured by the Foundation are sent to Storage Site 839-1, where they are kept in a glass housing and regularly fed a diet of plant matter each day. Here, their reproductive activity can be closely monitored and controlled based on what research is needed. Those infected with SCP-839 instances can continue to live long and healthy lives with only minor health complications arising. Therefore, the Foundation is comfortable allowing a reasonable number of cases to go unexamined in the world. So, like I said, for next time you open up a bag of candied worms, maybe just give them a quick poke. You could be saving yourself a trip to the hospital and a lifetime dependence on insulin. A man opens his mouth to bite a hot dog and suddenly freezes. His eyes widen and the hot dog drops from his hand, falling to the ground. Ahead, a stampede of people is running toward him, screaming, crying out for help. Behind them, a man walks at an ordinary, casual pace, but something is off. His eyes have a glazed, unfocused look to them, and he keeps shoveling random items into his open mouth, swallowing them down. He eats a clipboard and pen, a discarded shoe, and as the first man watches in horror, the very hungry man grabs the ankle of a fallen member of the crowd and pulls him into his mouth, devouring him. The first man turns to run for his life, only to be knocked to the ground by the rest of the crowd, trying to escape. He struggles to climb back to his feet, and a hand reaches out to take his. When he makes it to his feet, he looks up and sees the hungry man pulling him in, mouth stretching open wide. The sky is a perfect, cloudless blue. The air is warm from the unbroken sunlight, but cooled to the perfect temperature by a gentle breeze, and there is a sense of electricity, excitement, and competition in the air. Throngs of people have gathered together in a makeshift arena, piled into plastic chairs and swarming around concession stands, all training their eyes on the arena's center. What are they here for? Some sort of Olympic Games? A baseball tournament? A horse race? No, it's something greater, something meatier. It is the annual Midsummer Hot Dog Eating Contest, and locals and tourists alike are coming together to see just who can cram the most pork or beef hot dogs and buns down their gullets in front of a roaring crowd. The announcer makes his way to the front of the arena, standing with his arms wide in front of the long table behind him. As he calls out the names of this year's contestants, they file in, each taking his place behind the table. There is the previous year's champion, a burly man with a bushy beard and twinkling eyes, and there is this year's surprise competitor, a skinny 19-year-old college student with a hungry grin. Then there are the lesser-known contestants, a local father who signed up after making a joke with his daughter, an uncle who scrawled his name on the sign-up sheet after a few too many drinks, a recently retired man checking off another item on his golden year's bucket list. All have come to the event today with full hearts and empty stomachs, ready to see who the year's victor will be. The announcer riles up the crowd, encouraging them to cheer as loudly as possible to spur on their chosen competitor. 
All the while, staff are carrying out trays piled high with hot dogs. More hot dogs than most people see in a year, except for the people who just really, really love hot dogs. Each contestant receives a tray of hot dogs, a bucket of water, and an additional empty bucket, just in case, well, you get the idea. With the supplies and competitors all in place, it is time to begin the countdown. The announcer holds up his favorite air horn and calls out, Three, two, one, eat! At the sound of the air horn's blast, the men leap into action, seizing hot dogs from plates and each engaging in their unique competitive eating technique. The previous year's champion employs the method of famous hot dog eating champion Joey Chestnut, dunking his entire hot dog sloppily into his water, then swallowing it as quickly as possible. The new challenger, on the other hand, employs the Solomon method, named for King Solomon. Much like the fabled king suggested doing with a stolen infant, eaters using the Solomon method break the focus of their feasting in half before polishing it off. One of the more casual competitors attempts a divide-and-conquer technique, eating first the dog itself and then the bun. Others employ no specific technique at all, attempting to devour the stack of hot dogs before them, using the same classic eating style they might employ at a family barbecue. This is a grave mistake. One by one, the less prepared competitors drop out, spitting into their buckets, wiping meat sweats from their foreheads, waddling out of the arena while groaning and holding their aching stomachs. Soon, only the two front runners remain. But what's this? A challenger approaches. An unassuming black man, clad in a shirt and dress pants, rushes into the arena, his face a mask of single-minded determination, and begins seizing the discarded hot dogs off the table, gobbling them up as fast as he can. The announcer and the rest of the audience watch in stunned disbelief. This is unprecedented, and as exciting as it is, definitely against the rules. This man is not a registered competitor, and he certainly can't join the contest in the champion stretch. Unsure of what else to do, the announcer beckons to the staff on the sidelines, ushering them back toward the table to clear the food and escort this surprise drop-in out of the arena. The audience watches with rapt attention as the staff members attempt to remove the stranger from his place at the table. He shakes his head violently, refusing to go, and snatches the hot dogs away from them even as they try to clear the trays away. All the while, the remaining competitors standing are attempting to stay the course and finish strong in spite of the interruption. The new, younger man collapses, slumping down onto the table in a hot dog-induced stupor. He has tapped out. The victor is the previous year's champion, with a staggering ultimate tally of 38 hot dogs. As four staff members work together to wrestle the stranger out of the arena, the champion steps forward to receive his trophy. The crowd roars as he holds up his arms, grinning ear to ear and basking in yet another win. The announcer can still see the staff struggling with the stranger out of the corner of his eye, but this crowd wants to see their champion crown, and the show must go on. So he grabs the Hot Dog King sash, the crown made from gold, well, gold-plated, hot dogs, and even the massive gold trophy. He crowns the winner, placing the sash over his shoulders. Then, as the music swells triumphantly, courtesy of the local high school marching band, the announcer holds up the trophy, sunlight glinting off its shiny surface. It represents so many things, achievement, celebration, the ability to eat just so much meat and not get sick, and now it is time for it to be awarded to the man who earned it. The announcer stretches his arms, handing over the trophy to the contest winner, when all of a sudden, another hand grabs hold of its handle, ripping it from the announcer's grasp. The stranger has returned, somehow freeing himself from the multiple security guards who escorted him away, and he has taken the trophy for himself. But he isn't just attempting to crown himself the hot dog king. No, this is not a simple coup de hot dog. He lifts the trophy up over his head, opening his mouth as wide as it will go, and tears the metal in half with a horrible screeching sound, shoving the pieces into his mouth, chewing and swallowing. By the time the announcer and the champion recover from their shock enough to move again, the trophy is completely gone, vanished into the stranger's belly. After a day of seemingly impossible feats of feasting, the sight of this strange man consuming a truly impossible meal of metal is just too much for the already anxious crowd to take. The arena erupts into absolute chaos as people spill out of their seats en masse, fleeing the area. The champion, however, does not turn and run. He feels robbed of his victory. Though it may have occurred in an utterly bizarre fashion, he won't stand for this kind of disrespect. He has trained all year for this moment, only to watch his trophy be eaten right in front of him. He marches right up to the stranger and pokes him in the chest, demanding to know who he thinks he is, what gives him the right to crash the hot dog eating contest, interrupt the proceedings, and upstage his victory by chowing down on the trophy. 
The man doesn't answer him, so the champion continues to berate him, wagging his finger in his face. The stranger's eyes follow the finger, and slowly he opens his mouth. There is a sudden chop, and the champion screams, holding his hand to his chest, using his shirt to stem the bleeding. He turns to run with the rest of the crowd, but it's too late. The stranger's hand clamps down on his shoulder, holding him in place with a surprising strength. The only thing he sees before his life is snuffed out is the stranger's wide open mouth before everything goes dark with another sickening chomp. All the while, the crowd's terror rises to a fever pitch at the horrible sight. They trample each other as they scramble to vacate the area, shoving strangers and loved ones alike out of the way in a bid to escape this mysterious equal opportunity omnivore with an appetite for far more than just hot dogs. Some manage to escape, running far enough from the arena that they can stop to catch their breaths and glance back at the ones who were not so lucky. Those who tripped and fell in the madness, who had the wind knocked out of them by an elbow to the gut from one of their neighbors, those with weak ankles or who hadn't tied their shoes carefully enough. All of these poor, unfortunate souls are next on the menu for the stranger. He devours them one by one, rarely even stopping to chew. As one surviving woman watching from a distance pulls out her phone to call 911, she can't escape noticing the parallels to the contest itself, the way the stranger eats with a singular focus on consuming as much as possible. There's no pause to enjoy the meal, but there is no sadism or malice in the act either, just the sheer, undeniable drive to keep eating. The woman's call to the police is one of the strangest moments of her life and utterly baffles the local police department. Ma'am, please calm down, one officer repeats again and again. What do you mean there's a man eating people? I mean exactly what I said, she shouts. A man showed up at the hot dog contest and started eating people. Please, you have to do something. I think this is above our pay grade, miss, another officer chimes in. You think we should call, you know, the first officer trails off. Who? Who? The woman demands, but the line goes dead before she can ask another question. The police are clearly no help, and she isn't about to stick around and see just how big this stranger's appetite is. She tried to save the others, but now she needs to save herself. She runs all the way home without another glance back. Meanwhile, the local police did make that mysterious call, and an SCP Foundation mobile task force is currently en route to the scene. By the time they arrive, the park is a ghost town, with nothing but the blood-stained grass and abandoned arena to suggest that something horrible ever happened here at all. But these aren't some bumbling local police officers who have no idea what to do with a man-eating anomaly. This team has seen enough bizarre sights to fill a lifetime, and another lifetime after that. They spy a trail of sticky red footprints leading away from the arena. At first, they assume that the substance is blood, but a closer examination reveals that it is, in fact, ketchup. They track the savory footprints away from the scene of the day's unsavory events, following them to a nearby warehouse. Judging from the scattered wooden beams, rustling metal, and boarded up windows, this place has been abandoned for some time. The perfect place for an anomaly to hide away. If they weren't certain, the sound of someone inside biting through sheets of metal is plenty of indication that this is the right place. With no time to waste, they break down the door of the warehouse, weapons drawn and ready. They follow the sound of the chewing, splitting up to apprehend the subject from all available directions. The shriek of tearing metal echoes through the building, bouncing off the walls and creating a cacophony that is difficult to track. They do their best to follow the sound, but quickly veer off in separate directions in an attempt to cover as much ground as possible. One operative confronts the stranger just as he is reaching for another piece of metal. He watches as the man takes a massive bite out of the steel, a bite that should have shattered his teeth and broken his jaw. Instead, a cartoonish bite mark is taken out of the metal. He approaches the stranger, who, upon locking eyes with him, begins to shake his head, still chewing. The MTF operative ignores this visual cue, approaching the man and attempting to physically restrain him. This, like the confrontation with the champion before, is cut off with a fateful chomp and the operative screams ringing out through the warehouse, alerting his teammates to his unfortunate fate. The screams suddenly go silent, and another MTF operative stops cold, listening as the sound of chewing draws nearer and nearer. He spins around to face the presence behind him and spots the stranger standing there. The otherwise ordinary man is polishing off the tip of a steel beam, grimacing as he swallows it. The operative lifts his weapon, pointing it at the subject. The operative tells him to stand down and come quietly. The hungry man pleads wide-eyed for the operative to turn and run while he still can. He takes small, reluctant steps toward the operative, muttering that he can't stop. The operative brandishes his weapon again, barking another order for the man to stop. 
Before he can make another move, the stranger snatches the weapon out of his hand, opens his mouth, and swallows it. He winces as he does, but does not stop until the weapon is completely devoured. All at once, he lets out a loud belch, his knees buckle, and he slumps to the ground. He rubs his stomach, wipes his brow, and sighs heavily. I'm so sorry about that. I was just so hungry I couldn't help it. The man shakes his head sadly. I hope you can get a new weapon. And I'm sorry about your friend, too. You said you couldn't help it. Why'd you stop? The stranger shrugs, sighs again, and simply says, Well, because I was full. After a bit of convincing, and a test confirming that the subject's strength and bite force has returned to ordinary human levels, the remaining mobile task force agree to bring him into Foundation custody unharmed, though restrained. They pile into one of the SCP Foundation's trademark unmarked vans and set off toward the nearest Foundation site. About one hour into the trip, the subject begins to lament his growling stomach, asking if they could possibly stop somewhere for a bite to eat. Ordinarily, this is against protocol, but after what happened to their teammate, the task force members aren't taking any chances. They pull into a fast food drive through and permit the subject to order whatever he wants. They'll declare it as a business expense later. Five burgers, five fries, five tacos, five pies, five cokes, ten tater tots, ten tenders, five shakes, five pancakes, five jalapeno poppers, and five baked potatoes later, the task force successfully reached the Foundation site with their newest subject, SCP-913. SCP-913 appears to be an average African-American man around middle age. Though his appearance is completely ordinary, his metabolism is unnaturally fast. He requires the recommended daily caloric intake for an average human being every two hours and has an unusually high internal temperature, though the specific number has been redacted from his official file. If he does not meet his calorie requirement for a given two-hour period, he will enter a trance state in which he is unable to control himself. In this state, he will break down and ingest any solid matter in his line of sight. This includes matter that would ordinarily be indigestible, including wood, plastic, and metal. In this state, his appetite does not distinguish between living and non-living subjects. When he is in this hunger-driven state, he is aware of all his actions, but cannot stop himself, even when he eats dense materials that cause him extreme discomfort. If this state hits while the subject is sleeping, he will be forced awake. In addition to his anomalous appetite, SCP-913 can rend objects at an estimated force of 3,000 newtons and can bite objects with an estimated force of 5,000 newtons when eating them. Whenever he is not in his trance state, he cannot replicate this strength. An examination of SCP-913's liver tissue showed that it is capable of producing new enzymes in response to foreign material, allowing his body to digest matter that should be highly dangerous to consume. These enzymes metabolize the substrate at an efficiency of approximately 98%, detoxifying any drugs or toxins consumed by the subject during the hunger state or otherwise. This includes, but is not limited to, amnestics and anesthetics. When SCP-913 was first discovered, he was wearing a shirt and dress pants, both with the brand name Doctor's Orders sewn onto their tags. SCP-913 has no tattoos aside from one on his right calf, which reads, Mr. Hungry, from Little Misters by Dr. Wondertainment. Just in case you aren't aware, the Little Misters are a line of humanoid anomalies created by the mysterious Dr. Wondertainment Corporation, including the fish-headed Mr. Fish, the candy-coated Ms. Sweetie, and Mr. Life and Mr. Death, who is every bit as existentially upsetting as he sounds. The purpose of these creations is currently unknown, though like many Dr. Wondertainment products, their existence invites endless speculation. SCP-913 must be contained in a customized humanoid containment cell lined with one meter thick carbon steel. 913 is to be provided standard furnishings for his containment cell, coinciding with the usual necessities for a comfortable humanoid dwelling. He may be given pre-recorded entertainment materials, such as concerts, films, and television shows upon request. The cell may be accessed via a reinforced carbon steel door. Once every two hours, SCP-913 is provided with one nutritional supplement as specified in Document 913-2. I attempted to locate a copy of 913-2 for further details on said nutritional supplement, but access to it appears to be limited to researchers assigned to SCP-913. While the subject is sleeping, nutrition is provided to SCP-913 via a central venous catheter that must be changed once every three months. These measures allow SCP-913 to receive the calories that he needs to avoid entering a hunger state, ensuring the safety of everyone on site as well as his own comfort. Like the rest of the Little Misters, SCP-913 presents a puzzle that may never be solved. 
I could spend my limited time on this earth wondering why Dr. Wondertainment would create a being that seems to serve no purpose other than eating as much as possible, lest he unwillingly destroy the environment around him. But I believe that would be a waste of time. Why does Dr. Wondertainment do anything that they do? Why create a woman who can turn men into candy soldiers? Why create an ordinary man with a fish head, a tiny top hat, and a Boston accent? The personal motivations of Dr. Wondertainment, whether they are an individual or a massive conglomerate, are as inscrutable to me as the meaning of life itself, or the reasons why a person would want to eat more than two hot dogs in one sitting. If he breathes, the bear will see him. Lying flat in his stomach, the boy has no choice but to watch as the hulking brute eats his father before his very eyes. Lying in the thicket just a few trees away, the boy knows that any small movement he makes could prove fatal. A bear this large, hunting for its hibernation, will have no issue chasing him down in a split second and doing exactly what it did to his father, to him. The boy is utterly powerless. All he can do is stay deathly still and watch. They'd found the tracks too late. On the way back to camp, they'd been following the wooded cliff that lines the ocean's edge. Bows and salmon slung over their shoulders, they'd been so proud of their catch and the prospect of bringing it back to the tribe that they hadn't kept their wits about them. By the time they'd seen the enormous prints in the dirt, the sound of lumbering footsteps were already echoing through the trees behind them. The boy's bow is too far out of reach. He dropped it when his father pushed him into the thicket. He's got the knife hanging at his side, but he doubts it's long enough to even get through the bear's fatty hide. In contrast, the only thing protecting him from its bite is the leather hide slung across his shoulders and a woven garment from the tribe's elders. One slash of the bear's claw, and he'd be… A breeze ruffles his hair. The boy's eyes widen in horror. That wind hadn't come from in front of him, but from behind, blowing his scent, his fear, directly towards the bear's nostrils. The boy plants his muddy palms into the dirt, staring at the animal. Its nostril twitches, then twitches again. It half turns its head, sniffing the air. Maybe it won't bother with him. The bear's turning back to its meal already. The boy lets out a sigh of relief, and a twig snaps. The bear snarls and whips its head around. For a second, the two of them lock eyes, predator and prey. Then the boy takes off running. Fast as he can, he leaps through the undergrowth, ferns and nettles whipping at his shins. He fumbles the knife out of its sheath and slings the water skin off his shoulder, throwing it wildly behind him. He doesn't know if he hit the bear. He doesn't have time to turn around and see. It's going to be on him in an instant. Up ahead, he sees sunlight streaming through the thick trees, the cliff edge. If he can just get to that, maybe he can climb down and… No, there's no time. Besides, bears are better climbers, better swimmers, better runners. All the boy can hope for is that he's a better jumper. Him and the boys from the tribe have left off plenty of cliffs along the shore, but never these ones. There are too many rocks, too many shallows. But the thundering of four enormous paws behind him is looming larger and larger. He can almost feel the bear's hot breath on the back of his neck. There's nothing for it. Here goes. The trees clear, the sun blasts his skin, a claw slashes at his back, and the boy launches himself into the air. The wind carries him, the weightlessness of wheeling his arms and legs through the empty sky is almost enough to make him laugh with joy, until the boy looks down. The cliff is higher, much, much higher than he'd realized. His momentum carries his torso forwards into a tumble. He's not going to land straight, and he can see jagged rocks everywhere beneath him. The boy closes his eyes and crashes into the sea. All of the air is slammed out of his lungs. His knee hits something hard and sharp in the water. A swell throws him away from the shore and pulls him deep. Without air in his chest, he can't float. Kicking hard as he can, the boy swims upwards, eyes still screwed shut. His face bashes into a sandy rock. No, that's not upwards. Which way is it? Which way should he swim? The ocean current rolls him over and over. Darkness fills his mind. But his feet find a hard surface, and he pushes against it, launching himself through the water, kicking as hard as he can. The darkness fades. Light. The boy's head breaches the water, and he splutters for air, rubbing the water out of his eyes. He looks around wildly. The sea has carried him away from the cliff and out into open water. It's lifting and dropping him with each wave, carrying him this way and that, like a flower in the wind. And there, traversing the cliff face, scrambling down the rocks, is the bear. The boy's stomach turns. It reaches the bottom of the cliff and sees him there in the water. Tipping back its head, it roars at an almighty volume, deafening the boy over the sound of the waters. 
Even from this distance, the animal looks impossibly large. It dwarfs the boulders that line the water's edge. It slips into the water, barely making a ripple, and kicks off from the shore. Going straight for him, the bear is covering the distance so fast he only has seconds left. With barely the strength to keep himself afloat, the boy knows he'll never be able to outswim this creature. Instead, he takes a deep breath and looks up at the woods, remembering all of the happy moments he'd spent in there with his father. A current swells beneath the boy and almost throws him out of the water. An enormous shadow flies through the depth beneath him. A whale? It couldn't be. Whatever it is, the shadow is swimming straight at the advancing bear. So fixated on its prey, the bear doesn't even notice what's approaching until it's too late. The ocean explodes. A blast of water as tall as the cliffs themselves shoots up into the air and showers the boy's head. Somewhere in the midst of the spray, a monster erupts from the depths. Snapping its jaw around the bear, it lifts the animal into the air and throws it against the cliff. The impact is so strong that a small landslide follows the bear's rolling body as it tumbles back towards the water. But the boy has eyes only for the monster emerging from the sea. Crawling up the rocks with one gnarled foot after another, the boy can hardly make sense of what he's looking at. It seems to have some kind of scaly hide, harder than the rocks surrounding it. A wave crashes against the monster as it leers over the bear and sinks its teeth into the animal's hide. Unable to look away, the boy kicks out and starts swimming away up the coast. Only once he's a long way around the bay does he dare to clamber out and back onto land. That night, once the rest of the tribe have gone to sleep, the boy can't help but lie wide awake in his tent. Without his father here, it's just… it's not the same. Quietly rolling up the hide doorway, the boy slips out into the night. They're camped by a small cave with beautiful smooth walls inside. They say it's the cave of their ancestors, the place where all life started. The fire in the cave has to always burn. Fortunately for him, the cave is empty. The boy stares up at the wall in wonder. Finger drawings of animals, hunters, mothers, shamans, gods, and forests fill almost every part of it. Only one space remains in the corner, the finger painting of the rocky cliffs with the swelling sea beneath. Dipping his finger into the paint, the boy sits by the wall and starts to paint. A terrible monster crawling out of the sea, with a scaly hide stronger than any rock. That's it. You know that from just some finger painting. The archaeologist turns to the group of researchers surrounding him in the cave. UV lights are set up all along the walls, with the blue and violet shapes revealed all across the stonework. The archaeologist can't help but empathize with the spiritualism of their long-forgotten ancestors who lived in these caves thousands of years ago. The professor was the one who asked the question. A cold woman, standing well over six feet tall with a crop of fiery ginger hair. To him, she seems less of a scientist and more of a military leader. But what does he know? Walk with me, she says and leads him out of the cave. Personnel fills the surrounding area, most of them are armed. Cranes lift huge sheets of reinforced lead plating into place. Several mysterious vats line the edge of the forest, each adorned with more warning and hazard signs than you'd see in a nuclear power station. The two of them have to pause for a moment as three tanks roll past them. The archaeologist breaks the silence. You know the reason I started all my research in the first place? Did I ever tell you that story? Every early civilization in the world, whether it's ancient China, Mesopotamia, South America, Northern Europe, all these cultures, you take a look at their mythology and what do you find? The professor ignores him, instead choosing to bark orders at a group of agents talking over coffee. They all immediately dump their drinks and get back to work. What one thing do they all talk about, even though it never existed? Dragons! All these disparate people with no contact with one another, all of them still draw pictures of dragons. The professor stops walking at the edge of the cliff. The pair of them stand there, surveying the vast ocean stretching out in front of them, as researchers, agents, and workers rush around behind them. After a long pause, the professor asks him to proceed. In ancient Hebrew texts, when they talk about God creating the world in seven days, what happens on day five? The professor flicks the hair out of her eyes and replies curtly, God created fish in the sea and birds in the sky. Well, not exactly. Look at the original Hebrew. He created all of the fish that teem in the seashore, but he also created Leviathan, a serpent-like monster from the depths, as old as the world itself. You think that's what we're dealing with? Maybe. Or something worse. By nightfall, preparations are operational. Enormous floodlights switch on, one after another, illuminating an enormous steel box with an open lid at the top, surrounded by armed agents, huge net launchers, and several tanks. It all seems a bit excessive as far as the archaeologist is concerned. 
He isn't officially still supposed to be here, but in all the scramble for the Foundation to get the capture site ready, no one noticed that he had stuck around. From the viewing platform several hundred meters away, he has to watch it all unfold through a pair of binoculars. Out above the water, suspended from one of the cranes, is an elephant carcass. The professor told him that the Foundation had even marinated it for extra flavor. He had only been recruited into this project a couple of months ago, but from what he could tell, it's been an ongoing priority for the Foundation for several years now. The scale of the operation of just setting up at this site is already mind-boggling, but they've been chasing up leads like this for years now. Arriving at scenes, they suspect this creature has been sighted in the past and setting up traps for it. He was only brought in out of desperation. The Foundation had exhausted all recent hunting grounds and was trying to cast the net even wider. He'd just been quietly working on his university research paper about ancient reptile drawings when the agents had let themselves into his office. But staring through his binoculars now, the archaeologist knows there's no chance of this operation actually working. They have floodlights for crying out loud. No intelligent predator would come anywhere near that elephant carcass. Movement. Not in the waters or any of the lit up areas. No, there's something in the forest line, just behind a group of researchers. He reaches instinctively for his walkie-talkie, then stops himself. How many times had he got jittery before and reported something preemptively? The agents already don't take him seriously as it is. He can't be jumping at shadows. But there it is again, a shape moving fast through the trees. He scans the binoculars this way and that, trying to find it. Just a group of researchers there, some agents there, supply crates, researchers, agents… wait. Weren't there more of them a second ago? He looks closer. Someone's gone missing. He clicks on the radio. Uh, South Lookout Team, report in. Nothing. South Lookout Team? A sickening feeling settles in his stomach. With all those bright lights everywhere, they're casting a lot of dark shadows. He has to do something fast. Running down from the lookout point, the archaeologist takes off running through the trees to the site. He holds his radio up to his mouth as he goes, trying to get anyone to respond. But it's hopeless. The thicket cracks and crunches under his feet as he tries to make his way through the dark woods, ignoring the feeling that crawls up his neck of being watched. A boulder blocks his way. The archaeologist grabs onto it with both hands and hauls himself on top of it, stopping for a moment to catch his breath. From up here, he can see the floodlit capture site. The tanks and cranes still sit rumbling ready to go at a moment's notice, but he can't see any ground crew anymore. He switches the radio to the open channel and calls out for anyone to respond. The professor's voice crackles back at him. What are you still doing here? This is a highly dangerous operation that you don't have clearance for. He yells at her to cancel it. They need to evacuate the site immediately. It's compromised. She laughs derisively and cuts off the channel. No, she has to believe him. People are dying, and more of them will if she doesn't... The archaeologist whispers to himself in the darkness. It's no monster. It's just an innocent creature. You're playing with a power you don't understand. It's strange. For a moment, he swears he almost hears a voice whispering something back to him in the woods. But when he looks around, he's all on his own. He has to keep moving. The creature could be anywhere. Hopping off the jagged boulder, the archaeologist takes off running through the forest once more, looking over his shoulder every few steps. The light must be playing tricks on him. In the darkness, he can't see the boulder he was standing on a moment ago anywhere. He bursts out of the tree line and into the clearing right next to the steel box. A ramp leads up to the top of it, with a large trap door suspended over the open lid. Well, if he wants to be seen and heard, that's where he needs to go. The archaeologist runs up the ramp and waves his hands wildly in the air. The tanks all turn their turrets to aim at him. The crane holding the enormous steel lid for the enclosure looms menacingly above his head. And there, marching out onto the field, looking absolutely furious, is the professor. Her red hair looks more like a ball of flames right now. We need to evacuate the site now! It's here! She snarls and marches up the ramp to meet him, jabbing a finger in the archaeologist's face. He suddenly realizes how much taller she is. You are not jeopardizing our one chance of catching this thing. Get out of the way, or I will have you detained. Besides, what evidence do you have? But the archaeologist isn't looking at her. Instead, his eyes stare in horror at the elephant carcass suspended behind her. There was a huge, reptilian bite mark taken out of it. A testing bite, like the ones given by sharks. She turns to follow his gaze, and all of her rage is washed away in a sickening delight. It's here. A scream from the crane holding the elephant makes them both jump, but by the time they look up at the cabin, all they see is a hulking shadow leaping away into the darkness. The professor clicks on her walkie-talkie and starts issuing commands. No one responds, except the tank crews. She tries again. Radio silence. 
Now the gravity of the situation really starts to hit her. Eyes wide with panic, she runs off down the ramp, barking into a radio and leaving the archaeologist up here on his own. Suddenly, under all of these lights, he feels very exposed. It could be anywhere in the shadows. Footsteps, heavy planted footsteps tremor through the ground, and out of the woods walks the creature. Several meters long, fat from all of its hunting, the beast that would soon be known as SCP-682 slinks into view. It looks up at him, standing there on the trap door over a metal box, and looks like it's almost ready to laugh at how easy this will be. Boom! The tank blast hits the creature square in the torso, knocking it sideways. Boom! 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 The three tanks open fire one after the other, laying round after round into the colossal reptile, kicking more and more dust into the air. Before long, there's a crater in the ground so large that it looks almost like an asteroid hit it. Smoke and dust fill the air. The archaeologist's eyes fill with tears. That majestic creature, roaming the earth long before mankind ever did, exterminated just like that. Cowards. That's what people really are. Cowards. But as the dust clears, a groaning sound echoes around the clearing. The archaeologist shields his eyes and peers into the crater as best he can. But there's nothing there. Boom! He wheels around and almost falls backwards in shock. The SCP is snuck through the haze and leapt onto one of the tanks. It bites and tears at the armored bodywork, doing all it can to destroy it. In a panic, two of the tanks point toward one another and fire, destroying themselves in the process. The creature rounds on the remaining tank and bites down hard on the barrel. The tank fires, the round going straight down the monster's throat and exploding inside its gut. The backdraft from the blast shoots back through the tank and a puff of smoke trails out of the hatch at the top. And suddenly, once again, the clearing is quiet. Turning back to the archaeologist, SCP-682 slinks towards him, smoke still curling up out of his leering teeth. With heavy, thunking steps, it climbs the ramp towards him, stopping just short of the trap door. The two of them stare each other in the eye, predator and prey. Neither move for a moment. Then it opens its mouth. The archaeologist closes his eyes. Do you know that you disgusting creatures deserve this? He opens them. Did the monster just speak? What do they hope to accomplish by attacking me? He gulps hard. That whisper he heard in the woods, the rock he'd been standing on. They're scientists. Scientists always try to learn more things, understand the world better. We think you can't be killed, so we're there testing their hypothesis. The creature growls. The stench of rotten flesh fills the archaeologist's nose. It takes a step towards him, then another. The archaeologist runs. He'll leap off the other end of the platform. It's a big jump, but he can make it. The predator's breath is on the back of his neck. He jumps, just as the trap door gives way. With an enormous thud, the SCP falls into the steel enclosure. Before it has a chance to move, the crane unhitches the steel lid, and it crashes down into place, sealing the monster inside. The archaeologist lands in the dirt and rolls onto his back to see the professor, wild-eyed and cheering, up in the crane's cabin. He lies there on his back, panting and staring up at the stars. A clunking sound echoes through the clearing and the gurgle of a liquid flowing through pipes. He sits up, adrenaline still pumping through him. The professor has plugged a pipe into the metal enclosure and is running gallons and gallons of liquid into it. He follows the tube with his eyes, all the way to the enormous hazardous vats on the edge of the clearing hydrochloric acid. His eyes widen in horror. The professor laughs at him. Come on, cheer up. We're just scientists, that's what you said. Just testing a hypothesis. A wasp stings a cockroach in the brain, rendering it a mindless zombie that she can lead to her home and fill with eggs that will hatch and devour the insect from the inside. A snail accidentally eats the eggs of a flatworm, and the eggs hatch, filling the snail's eye stalks with sacks of wriggling larvae. They mimic the movements of caterpillars, attracting hapless birds and enticing them to swoop down, attack, eat, and continue the life cycle of the worms. The spores of the cordyceps fungus make their way inside of a doomed ant, taking over its nervous system, puppeteering its body, and forcing it to march to the nearest highest point, only to die and split open, fungus blooming from its corpse and spreading spores to the next victim. Underwater, the sea louse settles into its new home inside of a fish's mouth, feeding on blood from the tongue until it withers away. 
There, the louse attaches itself in the tongue's place, serving as a mimic of the original organ, while the fish is none the wiser. Back on land, humans are not exempt. Nematode worm larvae infect the bloodstream through fly bites, hiding undetected until their host feels them wriggling beneath the cornea. Guinea worms enter the system when a person drinks infested water, growing longer and longer, then forcing their way out through the foot. Nature is full of terrifying parasitic creatures, but far scarier than the parasites we know about are the parasites that we haven't discovered yet. The creatures sneaking in and burrowing under the skin of their hosts without anyone even knowing they exist. After all, if you don't know something is there, how can you possibly hope to protect yourself from it? As a man hikes through the woods of the Pacific Northwest, he's thinking about repelling mosquitoes and pulling up his socks to stop ticks from latching onto his flesh, but he has no idea what else is lurking out here in the wild with him. He knows to look out for mountain lions and bears, to watch for signs of rabid animals, and avoid being bitten or scratched. But he doesn't notice the tiny, almost invisible flecks drifting through the air around him. He doesn't notice when one happens to get caught on the breeze of his inhale, pulled into his nostril. He rubs at his nose idly, sniffing to clear his airways, then turns his attention to a bird nesting in a nearby tree. All the while, something is taking root right under his nose. Well, actually, inside of it. But he doesn't feel a thing other than the occasional urge to sneeze. He does, sneezing loud enough to startle the bird he was observing moments ago, but it doesn't do any good. Sneezes are for clearing out dust and debris, foreign objects that wind up in the nose by happenstance. This new intruder is there by design, and it is holding on tight. The hiker continues the rest of his walk without a care in the world, taking deep breaths of fresh forest air and relishing the feeling of the breeze on his face. By the time he gets back home, He's made it out of the woods without a single mosquito bite, with nary a tick to be found in his meticulous pre-shower check. That night, he sleeps soundly, and the next morning as he goes back to work at his office job, all thoughts of the wilderness slowly drift from his mind. He goes about his ordinary routine for months, all the while carrying a hidden passenger with him from place to place, a tiny little thing steadily growing larger and larger, spreading spindly appendages out and up through the nasal passages up toward the skull. One night, about six months after that fateful hike, the man is sleeping peacefully in his bed, dreaming of a sunlit forest clearing and the pleasant chirping of birds, when all of a sudden, he's jerked awake by a splitting pain in his head. His vision swims from the throbbing pain, and he clutches his face, pressing against his forehead. It must be a migraine, he thinks. He hasn't had one in quite some time, but this is clearly no ordinary headache. Eventually, the pain subsides, and he's able to drift back to sleep. But the next day, at the office, it returns. That same sharp pain radiating through his skull, like the worst sinus headache he has ever had. The persistent feeling of pain and pressure in his head becomes too much to bear, and he decides to take the rest of the day off of work and go to the doctor. Much to the man's relief, his doctor is not concerned. With no other troubling symptoms presenting themselves, the situation seems relatively straightforward. She writes a prescription for some migraine medication, then sends the man on his way. That night, when the headache returns, the man takes some of the medicine, and the cloud of pain clears. Sweet relief. Once again, things are good. For a couple months, at least. But then, one day, on his morning walk to the office, just as he's lifting his travel mug of coffee to his lips, his vision cuts out. It's as if something is blocking his eyes, as if someone were covering them and preventing him from seeing directly ahead. But when he lifts his hand to feel his face, there's nothing there. Panicking at the sudden loss of sight, he drops his cup, spilling coffee all over the sidewalk. He doesn't even notice the spill, too busy grasping at his face and feeling his eyes with his fingers. He fumbles in his pocket for his phone, hoping he can remember where the numbers on the screen are well enough to call 911. But his hands are shaking so hard that he drops the phone, hearing it clatter on the pavement. He exclaims in frustration and fear, and turns around following the sound of the phone. And as he turns, his vision suddenly clears, the blinders lifted, and he's able to see just as well as he did before. Experimentally, he turns back to face his original direction, and again, he loses his sight, something blocking his view. He turns around, and he can see again. He tries this a few more times, spinning back and forth, back and forth, watching his vision flicker in and out. He only stops when a passing jogger shouts at him, asking what the hell he's doing. 
The interruption startles him, bringing him back to Earth. What is happening? Surely this can't be normal. What is it about facing one direction that causes him to lose his sight, while another direction returns him to normal? A sinking feeling in his stomach tells him that, whatever was causing his headaches before, it was not something he should ignore any longer. He grabs his phone off the ground, calls out of work, and schedules an urgent appointment with his doctor. At first, he considers running home and getting his car or his bicycle, but his unreliable vision would make taking either mode of transportation a potentially deadly mistake. So instead, he walks. The walk to the doctor's office is the most difficult walk of the man's life. Every time he turns a corner, he wonders if his vision will flicker out again, if the mysterious obstacle will block his sight and force him to reroute himself or start from scratch. While trying to maintain a consistent line of sight, he loses his balance several times and nearly collides with the lamppost. Eventually, he reaches the doctor's office. One look at the man's terrified face is enough for the doctor to insist on some immediate x-rays of his head. The man sits on the examination table, nervously bouncing his knee, waiting for the doctor to return with the results. What could it be? Some undiagnosed degenerative illness? A tumor? Irreparable damage caused by looking at a solar eclipse as a child? The man can hear the doctor speaking to a nurse in hushed, frightened tones just outside of the exam room door. He can't quite tell what she is saying, but he makes out one word that makes his blood run cold. Infestation. When the door opens and the doctor enters holding the man's chart, her expression is neutral and professional, but her face is pale, her forehead dotted with sweat. She can't hide the fact that whatever she saw on that x-ray, it horrified her. What is it? he asks, though he isn't sure he wants to hear the answer. The doctor is silent for a moment, turning over the right words to say in her mind. After a seemingly endless pause, she pulls an x-ray from the stack of papers on her clipboard and pins it up for them both to see. There the man can see his skull, a white outline against the dark background, his skeleton on display. But inside of the skull, there's a mass that definitely shouldn't be there. It starts in his nose, a rounded shape, but it stretches out in long limbs that travel up into his brain. After a long pause, the doctor speaks. I've never seen anything quite like this before. At first, I thought it might be some sort of growth, but as I reviewed the scans, I realized that it showed signs of movement. Whatever is in there, I'm afraid that it's alive. The man's stomach turns, and he worries for a moment that he might be sick all over the clean white floor. Instead, he just asks the doctor what can be done to help him. She explains that she plans to give him a local anesthetic, then attempt to get a closer look at the situation. Once she has eyes on the parasite, she will see if she can surgically remove it without causing any additional damage to his brain tissue. All the man can think about is that thing inside of his skull and how badly he wants it gone by any means necessary. He immediately agrees, and after a few quick injections, he's lying on his back, staring up at the ceiling as the doctor performs a nasal endoscopy. She slides the tube up his nostril a little bit at a time, monitoring the image on a nearby screen. Suddenly, she freezes, a small gasp escaping her lips. He demands to know what she's seeing, and she stammers, saying only that it's a creature she's never seen before, but it looks quite a bit like a sea spider. The man's eyes widen, and he's about to say something else, when suddenly his vision goes dark again. Now he knows what that means, and the doctor's startled cry confirms it. The creature is moving. The man begins shaking, begging the doctor to get it out of him, to just grab the invader with some tweezers or whatever it is doctors do in this situation and get it out of his head. She grabs a pair of nasal forceps and slowly eases them into his nose, but the creature feels her coming and lurches upward away from her grasp. The man feels a sudden burst of pain, and then everything goes dark as he loses consciousness, his eyes fluttering shut. The doctor checks his pulse, checks his breathing, and attempts to rouse her patient, but he's out cold. As she examines him, she notices a fluttering motion beneath his right eyelid. At first, she thinks she imagines it and takes a closer look. The flutter turns into a distinct, undeniable bulge beneath the eyelid, and then a slender limb pokes out from beneath the thin veil of flesh. It curves under the eyelid, tucking it open to reveal the unfocused eyeball beneath and something else. Something moving, pushing the eyeball aside just slightly without knocking it from the socket. The doctor watches in open-mouthed horror as more long, thin appendages join the first, poking out from behind the eye toward the air. The many-legged creature pulls itself from the ocular cavity, 
and began scuttling down her patient's face over his neck and off the edge of the exam table and onto the floor. As it nears the door, the doctor regains her ability to move and rushes to try and catch the thing. She grabs a jar and the forceps, hoping to capture it without touching it. Even with gloves on, she shudders at the thought of touching the thing. It evades her grasp, darting away from her forceps. It scrabbles back toward the table, and in a moment of primal instinct and revulsion, the doctor brings her foot up and stomps on the little parasite with all of her strength. When she lifts her shoe, all that's left on the ground is a few spindly legs and a small brown stain. She curses herself for acting impulsively and not finding a way to trap the thing and keep it for observation, but that ship has sailed. The only thing she can do now is tend to her patient and monitor his well-being. As she approaches the man on the table, his eyes open, and he gasps, sitting up suddenly and gripping his head. The man awakes with a headache and a foggy feeling in his head, but also with a sense of relief, a feeling that the unwelcome presence that took up residence in his skull for so many months is thankfully gone. He asks the doctor, haltingly struggling to find his words, if she was able to remove the creature. She tells him, simply, that it is gone now. The man slowly climbs off of the table, and ignoring the protests from the doctor as she begs him to sit back down and let her examine him, he walks out of the office and heads back home. Over the next several weeks, the man returns to normal life. He feels a little bit different, a little hazier, a little slower to respond. He tires more easily, going to bed earlier and sleeping in later, but overall, he feels nothing but relief. Still, that night, when he tries to fall asleep, he thinks of those x-rays. He imagines what that creature might have looked like when the doctor got it out, how it might have moved. He wonders where it came from, or if it will come back. He never goes hiking in those particular woods again. Meanwhile, the doctor receives an influx of patients complaining of persistent headaches. Sometimes it's a sinus infection, sometimes it's a hormone imbalance, sometimes it's stress. But a few times, well, she knows what to look for now. She tells her patients to watch out for changes in vision, for a feeling of pressure in their skull. She learns how to keep a straight face when looking at their x-rays and seeing that familiar long-limbed shape burrow deep in their nasal cavities. She puts her patients under now when she tries to remove the creatures. It doesn't make much of a difference, but it saves them the terror of the truth, saves them the feeling of the creature thrashing inside their head until it knocks them out. She manages to collect a few specimens for study and contacts her friend at the Centers for Disease Control. He's never seen or heard of anything like these parasites either, but he does know someone who might be able to offer their expertise. When the doctor comes into work the next day, there are two strangers waiting in her office. They introduce themselves as employees of a specialized research foundation and ask to see her samples. The next thing she knows, the doctor is waking up in bed the following morning, and she has no memory of ever seeing a patient with a strange spidery parasite in their skull. If she remembered enough to look for the records, she would find that they had disappeared from her office along with the living specimens she had collected. But she doesn't remember, and her discovery is now in the hands of the SCP Foundation, who have given it an official designation, SCP-1104. SCP-1104, commonly nicknamed nose crabs, is a species of organism tentatively identified as a member of the order Chelicerata, which includes sea spiders and horseshoe crabs. The life cycle of the organism consists of at least two phases. The first of these is a larval stage, at which point the creature is approximately 0.4 millimeters in diameter. At irregular intervals, SCP-1104 larvae are expelled from tubes at a concentration of up to 200 per cubic meter. These larvae drift through the air for as long as 14 hours at a time and have been spotted traveling for several kilometers under the right weather conditions. Whenever an SCP-1104 larva is inhaled, it will attach to the nasal mucosa of its host and begin to excrete H1 receptor antagonists that suppress inflammation as well as the implantation of any further larvae. Over the next six to eight months, SCP-1104 will grow larger, extending appendages through the ethmoidal canals of the host. Aside from occasional persistent headaches, the host will likely not notice the presence of SCP-1104 during this period. Once the organism has matured, however, it will begin to apply pressure to its host's optic nerves, causing its central visual field to be obstructed. SCP-1104 will apply this pressure selectively whenever the host is not oriented toward the gradient of atmospheric hydrogen sulfide. SCP-1104 can detect this hydrogen sulfide through its host's nasal respiration. At first, this effect is distressing to the host, but after a little while, they will begin to adjust their behavior accordingly, 
showing a preference for facing and moving in directions that do not cause those visual disturbances. Without realizing it, the host is moving closer and closer to higher concentrations of hydrogen sulfide. Once the host reaches an area with sufficient hydrogen sulfide concentration, SCP-1104 will extend its appendages into the host's prefrontal cortex, causing the host to lose consciousness. While the host is passed out, SCP-1104 will exit through their ocular cavity. Once SCP-1104 has left its host, it will attempt to find and enter the source of the hydrogen sulfide. This can include, but is not limited to, a lava tube or a sewer pipe. Whatever it does next is currently unknown, as its subterranean behavior and development has not been documented. Humans show the same instinctive aversion to SCP-1104's visual disturbances as other animal hosts, but they are also able to defy this influence. They are especially able to avoid following SCP-1104's prompting if they are informed of the nature of the infestation. Any attempt to surgically remove or poison a fully developed SCP-1104 will trigger its exit response, and it will flee through the host's ocular cavity and scuttle away. Following SCP-1104's exit, the former host displays a lack of spontaneous response to external stimulus, with delayed reactions as well as changes to personality linked to orbital frontal lesions. While individual instances of SCP-1104 are relatively easy to destroy, the species as a whole is considered endemic to certain subsurface geological formations. As it currently stands, the general population of SCP-1104 cannot be reached by convenient means of extermination. An area 10 meters in diameter, thought to contain the majority of SCP-1104, has been blocked off from the public under the guise of conservation and designated Site-104. Any non-Foundation personnel mammalian organisms larger than 10 kilograms found in the area should be considered contaminated and promptly incinerated on site. Once the SCP Foundation has discovered a way to effectively exterminate SCP-1104, doing so has been strongly endorsed by the O5 Council. However, such a method has not yet been discovered. So for now, SCP-1104 continues thriving underground, spouting larvae into the air to crawl up the noses of unsuspecting deer, possums, squirrels, and humans. So if you go out walking and feel a little tickle in your nose, it might just be a bit of extra pollen in the air. Or it might be a tiny nose crab, burrowing itself into your mucosal tissue, growing just a little bigger every day until it reaches your brain. But like I said, maybe it's nothing. No need to get crabby about it. The lights go out on Maple Street as a young woman takes stock of her marriage and the man she once thought she knew. She sits at the kitchen counter, absently stirring a cup of tea that went cold hours ago, but she just can't bring herself to stand and heat it back up. She glances at the baby monitor sitting next to her, grabs it, and holds it to her ear. Steady, peaceful breathing. The baby is fine. No one needs a thing from her right now. She stares at the seat across from her, where her husband sits every morning, sharing coffee and breakfast before they start the day. She glances at the clock. 8 p.m. He'll be home soon. She'll have to face him have to find a way to look him in the eye, force a smile, pretend she doesn't know that he's getting home two hours late from who knows where. The thought turns her stomach. It wasn't always like this. Their marriage wasn't always a tense charade, their home a haunted house. He was sweet that first year. He'd buy her flowers and take her out to dinner. He'd kiss her in the morning before they'd even brush their teeth. He wouldn't come home smelling like his secretary's perfume. But ever since the baby, something's been different. The light behind his eyes has gone dim. He won't help with late night feedings, won't change diapers. Most of the time, he acts as if the baby doesn't exist. His own son. He just comes home, stares vacantly at the TV, and expects her to handle everything without so much as a single complaint. She hasn't slept in weeks. She hasn't been down to her art studio in the basement in months. Then, a sound shakes her from her thoughts. She hears the unmistakable rumble of a car pulling into the driveway and fixes a stiff smile on her face. Maybe she'll leave him. Maybe tonight she'll work up the courage to say those words that will change everything. I want a divorce. The baby barely has a father now. What difference would it really make? The woman's husband stumbles through the door, lipstick on his collar and the smell of whiskey on his breath. He greets her with a kiss on the cheek, more out of obligation than anything else, and grabs himself a can of soda from the fridge. She offers him some stew from the stovetop, he brushes her off, saying, I already ate. She doesn't bother asking when or how, when he supposedly came straight home from work. There's no point. She knows he'll only lie. Do you want to say goodnight to the baby? She asks. 
It's a test, as she watches his face for any flicker of fatherly affection. Isn't it asleep by now? It. He calls their son, It. He's sleeping, but you could still go up and see him, if you're quiet. I had a long day, I'm tired, I'll see you in the morning. She can't help herself. Him. What was that? Him. He's not a thing, he's our child. He sets the can on the coffee table with a heavy clatter. Do you have to nitpick every word that comes out of my mouth? She deflates at the outburst. No. He sighs, shaking his head. Don't look at me like that. I can't stand when you stare at me like that. She averts her eyes, looking down. Fine. I'll go up and check on him. You enjoy your relaxation time. That's it. Tonight is the night. She's going to pack a bag tonight. She'll leave and start a new life, just her and her son. You won't even miss them when they're gone. It'll be better for everyone this way. She'll just go upstairs, check the baby, wait for him to fall asleep. Then she'll just cut and run. It's not like he deserves a proper goodbye from her. She can go away, go to her sister's place. As she fantasizes about leaving him, spending peaceful days in a little country house with her son and maybe a dog, she finds that the baby has spit up all over his pajamas. She scoops him up into her arms to make sure everything is okay otherwise, and he's fine, just a mess. As she holds him, he stirs awake and begins to cry. Oh, sweetheart, oh, I need to change you and give you a bath. Shh, sh it's okay, you're all right. What's wrong? Her husband's voice comes from the doorway, startling her. It doesn't concern you. She can't help herself. Her resentment creeps into her voice. He just needs a bath. What, you think I can't bathe my own son? <laughs> he scoffs. That's it? Well, you haven't done it yet. So, when she turns to look at her husband, there are tears in his eyes. I'll do it now. Something in his voice is so sincere, she falters in her determination for a moment. Maybe he'll really try. Maybe things will go back to how they used to be. And she really, really needs a rest. So she hands the baby over to him and sits down in the soft chair in the corner of the nursery. Before too long, the exhaustion overcomes her and she nods off. In her sleep, she can't see her husband leaving the bathroom to go downstairs and catch the last 20 minutes of the Dodgers game leaving the baby alone in the tub. When she stirs awake, the crib is still empty. She can hear the water running, and she knows. She just knows what has happened. What she let happen. No, what he did. A glance into the bathroom confirms her suspicions, and with a primal scream of pain, rage, and heartbreak, she tears down the stairs to confront the murderer himself. She finds him asleep on the couch, and takes a moment to catch her breath, to wipe the tears from her eyes. Did he do it by accident, or on purpose, to punish her, to free himself from their marriage once and for all, to break her heart beyond repair? It doesn't matter in the end. What's done is done, whether he meant it or not. But what can she do? What could ever make this right? She wants to scream, to set the house on fire, to tear him to shreds. Then she spots it. The baseball bat leaned against the wall by the door in case of an intruder. She picks it up, feeling the weight of the wood in her hands, the heft of it. Swung hard enough with real intent behind it, it could really do some damage. Slowly, thoughtfully, she walks back toward the couch, raises the bat, and swings. It only takes one good hit to get the job done, but she swings the bat a few more times anyway as something inside of her bends and bends and breaks, until the tears stop falling, until her vision comes back and everything stops looking like a wash of red. He doesn't even scream, never wakes from his stupor to see the look on his wife's face when she gets her revenge. He's just gone. She wipes the red from her eyes and lets the bloody bat drop to the floor. She started the day as a wife, as a mother, but now she's ending it as a killer. He deserved it, she tells herself. He took her baby from her, so she got him back. But why doesn't she feel any relief? Why does she still feel the gnawing grief in the pit of her stomach, feel the darkness clawing at her heart? First things first, she needs to get him out of the living room, out of sight of prying eyes and nosy neighbors. She could try to bury him, but where? The yard isn't exactly private, and she's not sure how much she could even dig up before sunrise. No, that won't do. Then the idea hits her and she grabs him by the arms and begins dragging the lifeless body of the man she once loved toward the basement stairs. He's heavy, much heavier than she expected, 
but she supposed they called it dead weight for a reason. She grunts and struggles as she drags him down the stairs, wincing as his head bumps against the steps, before reminding herself he's not using it anymore. She surprises herself with a laugh, a dry sound echoing in the empty basement. She drags him past the last chair, and he lands on the floor with a thud in the room that she converted into her home art studio when they first bought the house, back when things were still good. Her eyes dart about the room, the half-finished paintings, the wood carvings she abandoned when she got pregnant, the paints and long dried out lumps of clay, the potter's wheel in the corner. Her eyes settle on a metal frame, large and twisted into a vaguely human shape. She had crafted it years ago, intending to cover it with concrete and paint it, but never got around to it. No, she had been forced to put it away. Her husband hadn't liked it, had thought it was creepy and odd, and didn't want her working with such heavy materials. Just another thing he took from her, another dream he destroyed. It's just about his size, now that she takes a look at it with him lying limply on the ground so close by. With a little bit of muscle, some determination, he would fit right inside, and there are the tubs of cement, still sealed tight and ready to mix, just as she left them. She could shove him into the frame, paint him with layer on layer of cement, and it would be like he had disappeared in the night. A fitting coffin for the man, she thought. The perfect place to hide him, too. No one would ever know. No bones to dig up in the garden out back, no smell of rot seeping out from beneath the floorboard. She smiled to herself, just a little bit. In death, her husband would help her finish her greatest work. She didn't consider herself a wife or a mother, not anymore, but she was still an artist, and he would be her art. As she mixes the cement, she hums a little song to herself, beginning to feel something like peace. Everything is ruined, her life as she knew it completely turned upside down, but she is here in the art studio, creating again. Not a waste of time now, is it? She remarks to her husband's body. He doesn't answer. Typical. Why get an art degree, you said? Well, it prepared me for this, didn't it? I wonder what I'll do with you when you're done. Maybe I'll keep you down here. That seems like a waste. Maybe I'll get you displayed in a gallery. Let people buy tickets to take a look at you. You'll be my masterpiece. You'd hate that, wouldn't you? Me, thriving, creating, all without you there to make snide comments and treat me like dirt. As she waits for the concrete to become usable, she turns her attention back to the metal frame. Time to put her ex-husband in his place. She lifts him and begins to wedge his body into the metal structure. He's heavy, getting heavier all the time, and left a trail of blood behind on the floor that she would have to clean up and bleach later. But after several sweaty minutes, he is in place. He looks correct to her, sitting there in the frame, ready to become something new, something different, something better than he ever was in life. The concrete is ready, and she begins to smooth it over the body and metal frame, flesh and blood, and sweat and grit, layer upon layer upon layer. Mix, smooth, wait, mix, smooth, wait. All the while she talks to him, weeps bitter tears into the concrete. At one point, she pricks her finger, her blood dripping into the mixture and becoming part of the sculpture. For days she carries on this way, not breaking to eat, bathe, or sleep. After three days pass, she runs out of concrete, but the sculpture is not finished. She'll need to go out and get more. She takes a shower, washing away the dust, the blood, and the guilt, changes into fresh, clean clothes, and takes a drive into town. She picks up more concrete first, telling the clerk some story about home improvements she's working on. He asks if she's married, if her husband will be helping with the work. I'm recently separated, she replies. On the way home, a small store catches her eye. It's a place she's driven by plenty of times, a little occult shop filled with herbs and tapered candles and strange leather-bound books. She isn't sure if she believes in this sort of thing, not really, but something makes her park and walk inside anyway. A gnarled old woman behind the counter spots her, and without speaking, points her toward a room in the back. It's different there darker, filled with vials of thick, dark liquid, shelves full of skulls that might be human, though she isn't sure. In the back of the room, there is a bottle of paint, deep red and vibrant. What it's doing here, she couldn't be certain, but as soon as she sets eyes on it, she knows she needs to have it, needs to add it to her sculpture to make it truly complete. She brings it to the woman at the counter, but she just says, take it, no charge, I can tell you really need it, just be careful what you use it for. It's powerful stuff. She wants to ask what that means, what's so powerful about this little bottle of strange red paint, but she doesn't. 
she's much too exhausted and much too determined to get back home and put the finishing touches on her masterpiece. She drives straight home and hauls the concrete and paint inside, carrying it down into the basement. She's dizzy from hunger and lack of sleep, but she doesn't care. She has one singular vision right now, and she must see it carried out. She mixes more concrete and slathers the whole shape again, sculpting out the round, bulbous head, the arms at its sides, the legs and feet, the curve of the whole figure covered in thick gray sludge. In potential, a blank canvas. Before it dries, she opens the paint. It smells musty, rich, and somehow ancient. It clings to the bristles of her brush like a living thing and takes to the surface of the sculpture eagerly, spreading out as if of its own volition as she brushes it on evenly. She paints the whole thing, every inch of it. At first, it doesn't seem as if there will be enough paint to finish the job, but somehow that little bottle coats the whole figure in deep, dark red. She looks down at her hands, stained just as brightly as they were when she swung that baseball bat. She looks back up at her creation, the amalgamation of the fear, the pain, the heartbreak, the pure, primal rage, and begins to cry. The tears fall freely into her palms, and without thinking, she smears them into the concrete and paint until they disappear into the art. Then she takes a step back, watching it all dry. All of that work, all of that time, that great yawning chasm of loss. And this is what she has made of it. She loves it, and she hates it all at once. And she can't stop staring at the place where its eyes would be if it had them. She half expects to see something looking back. She shakes her head, looking down at the floor for a moment. Then she hears the sound of stone and metal grinding together. Her gaze snaps back up, and she sees that the sculpture has moved just a little. Its head turned in her direction. In an instant, her husband's words come back to her. Don't look at me like that. I can't stand when you stare at me like that. It couldn't be. She stares at it for a long time, her eyes watering from the effort. She blinks. Her eyes open, and the sculpture is gone. There it is again, the grind of metal and stone against each other. Then, with the sound of bones snapping, everything went dark. Her hate, her vengeance, her desperate act of violence and creation, with a splash of the most unusual paint, led to the creation of a deadly masterpiece that would one day be known as SCP-173. A face screams in terrible agony. In the darkness, you can't quite make out the shape of its body, but it doesn't look human. It's large and square, almost boxy. Two things you should know. This is a fate worse than death. And it isn't the only one. It's a busy but ordinary day in Hangzhou, China. People are rushing to and from work, going to school, going for walks, buying a hot meal and a cup of tea. But for one young police officer, this is a monumental day. He has been assigned the biggest case of his career, and he grips the stack of files with sweaty, trembling hands as he considers the weight of this moment. It isn't just one case, not really. It's actually six six separate missing person cases that he's beginning to suspect might be connected. Our detective wishes he could take a moment and transport himself away from these harrowing missing person cases and clear his head. But while he's unable to, we can. Thanks to the sponsor of today's video, Raid Shadow Legends, the hit mobile hero collection RPG played by over 80 million players across the world. And they've got some huge news for both new and returning players, the recently added Live Arena. To tell us about it, I've invited a fellow academic to join us today. Professor Death Knight here with a lesson about Live Arena, the new PvP mode where you can fight against other players in real time. <gasps> Sounds terrifying? Well, so's going to the dentist. You should still do it. Live Arena has a draft feature where you can pick and ban champions to fight for you. <laughs> Teamwork! When you win matches, you'll get live arena crests towards unlocking special area bonuses, or so I hear. I'm too afraid to try any of this out. All right, class. Any questions? Yes, Dr. Bob here. What's your personal strategy for live arena? Well, everyone thinks I'll go in fighting, but nobody expects my charm. My best strength is the gift of gab. So when they try to attack, I'll just be like, Nice weather we're having, eh? Nobody will see it coming. That doesn't sound like a very effective strategy. Do not pick me for live arena. Seriously, don't. I'm too young to be bone meal. 
Well, thank you for your- Class dismissed! Do we have a bell? Oh, we should totally get a bell. Class definitely not dismissed, but there's a bunch of brand new content in Raid Shadow Legends related to the animated limited series Call of the Arbiter, including a free legendary champion, the mighty orc warlord Artak. All you have to do to get him is log into Raid for seven days between now and July 24th. Easy. New players, use my link or scan the QR code right here and get a free starter pack with this cool in-game loot. So just hit my link in the description and I'll see you on the battlefield. And now, back to the case at hand. The detective was beginning to suspect that the six separate missing person cases might be connected. At first glance, they seem unrelated. The victims have very little in common, except one thing. They all worked at the same office, an office that closed one month ago, a casualty of international corporate downsizing. No one from his police department has bothered to look into this angle, assuming that it will lead back to more dead leads, but the young officer can't shake the feeling that there is important information waiting for him in that abandoned office building. So after finishing up his lunch and dabbing the nervous sweat from his brow with a handkerchief from his pocket, he sets off toward the old office building in hopes of cracking the case wide open. As he makes the trip, he considers some other possible theories. Maybe the missing employees skipped town, overwhelmed and depressed from their unexpected job loss. But would they really let their families worry like this? Some of them have wives, husbands, children, all of whom would notice their absence and assume the worst. No, this isn't a simple case of a group of colleagues all vanishing to blow off steam in another city somewhere. Something bad happened. He can just feel it. Maybe they uncovered corporate secrets and someone decided to silence them before they could blow the whistle. But then again, what sort of secrets would be worth killing for at a printer company? It feels worthless trying to guess, trying to fill in the gaps in his knowledge with wild speculation. The only way to find out was to examine the building for himself and see if he can find any clues at all that lead him to the whereabouts of the missing six. When the young officer reaches the building, he finds the door padlocked shut. Luckily, he prepared for this and brought some industrial strength bolt cutters that snapped the lock into pieces with very little effort. Why lock up the building like this? There can't be anything valuable left inside. To prevent squatters, most likely, he assures himself, brushing off the sense of dread creeping up his spine as he walks inside. As he crosses the threshold of the empty office, the first thing he notices is the smell. It reeks of sulfur and bleach and a whiff of something electrical that stings the inside of his nostrils with each breath. New possibilities turn over in his mind. Perhaps some sort of deadly workplace accident claimed the lives of the missing when they came back in to collect their belongings and clear out the building. Before he can decide if that theory holds any water, his thoughts are interrupted by a piercing scream coming from a nearby room. The officer isn't alone here. There's someone in the building with him, and they sound like they're in trouble. The officer grabs the taser from his holster and runs toward the sound. He skids to a stop, nearly knocking over a water cooler when he reaches the source of the screaming. There's a man hanging from the wall, screaming over and over again. The officer can barely process what he's seeing. The man is covered in machinery, all whirring and clicking as it works. Next to him, a printer is printing sheet after sheet of paper, and all the while, the man screams. The officer recognizes the man's face from one of the files. This is one of the missing employees. He can't determine what is causing the man such distress, and he tries to ask the man what happened to him. The man just continues to scream, eyes wide open and wild, rolling around in their sockets, unfocused and unseeing. The officer grabs the man, attempting to remove him from the wall, but he won't budge. It's as if his body is wired into the wall itself, and the harder the officer tugs, the more it appears as if the man's flesh will begin to tear away. The officer stops, turning his attention to the machinery. Perhaps if he unplugs it, he'll be able to remove the man more easily. He starts with the printer, and as he reaches for its plug, he gets a closer look at the paper it continues to spit out. It doesn't look like any paper he's ever seen, and unable to help himself, he reaches out to touch it. It's warm, soft, pliable, and nauseatingly familiar. It isn't paper at all. It's skin. In that moment, all of the officer's training falls out of his mind, replaced with blind terror. He runs from the building as fast as he can, all the way back to the police station, where he tearfully informs his captain about what he found. This is no longer a police matter, his captain tells him. They need to escalate this to a specialized organization. The young officer is sent home, placed on psychiatric leave, and the next day, 
The SCP Foundation investigates the building it will come to refer to as SCP-2535. SCP-2535 is a former two-story Hewlett-Packard branch office building in the Zhaoshan district of Hangzhou, China. The building's anomalous nature is characterized by the presence of a detailed network of electrical and biological components of unknown origins. The walls of the building's entire first story are covered with 63,512 USB 2.0 standard A sockets, placed in a grid pattern made up of 20-centimeter semi-regular intervals. Each of these sockets is connected to wires running through the walls, but these are no ordinary wires. They consist of a woven mixture of copper strands and human optic nerve tissue, all wrapped in a layer of keratin. In spite of the inclusion of organic material in their structure, the wires have not shown any signs of decay or deterioration since the Foundation discovered SCP-2535. This curious, off-putting mix of the technological and the biological persists throughout the location and only gets stranger as one moves deeper into the building. If one were to follow the path of these wires, going against their better judgment and the scream of their most primal instincts, they would find that the wires lead to a room on the building's second floor. The room is currently inaccessible, but is thought to have once been the server room. Whatever is blocking the door is large enough that it cannot be budged, and non-intrusive imaging has determined that it is some sort of biological mass. The inside of the former server room, like the wires that lead there, emits heat at a consistent temperature of 47.6 degrees Celsius. Foundation personnel who approach the room have reported a persistent smell of sulfur and ozone coming from inside, as well as the loud sound of a running printer. 317 of the USB socket and power outlets in SCP-2535 are connected to HP brand USB 2.0 compatible devices. Of these devices, 20 have displayed anomalous, potentially ectoentropic functions. But what exactly does that mean? Allow me to elaborate. Just remember, you asked for this. Don't blame me if you aren't able to stomach the details. There are five former employees of the Hewlett-Packard Hangzhou branch still located inside of SCP-2535. These employees are in an anomalous sort of status, requiring no sleep, food, or water in spite of their continued, seemingly endless consciousness. Since the building's discovery in April of 2013, they have not changed in any way, or at least not in any visible way. All attempts to remove these former employees from their, let's call them predicaments, have proven unsuccessful. Allow me to discard any euphemism and explain just what exactly became of these unfortunate workers. First, there is Guo Pingping, the former branch manager. He can be found in the bathroom near the receptionist's desk on the first floor. Goa's head has been forced into the feed tray of a DP DeskJet 1112 printer, which is plugged into the wall. This is troubling for a number of reasons, one of which is that the internal dimensions of this particular desk jet model's feed tray are not large enough to accommodate a human head, and its components are not strong enough to crush a human skull into a shape that would fit. Nonetheless, Goa's head is firmly lodged into the feed tray. One would assume this would have killed him, but his body continues to move, kicking and thrashing about as if he is in pain. The former assistant branch manager, James Gu Yonggun, is located in the employee pantry on the building's second floor. His body is attached to the wall in a vertical position, held there via 92 20-inch USB 2.0 M-M cables. Five additional cables have been used to secure the actuating unit of an HP DeskJet 2540 all-in-one printer to Gu's lower jaw. The arm of the actuating unit is also attached to a single HP 10 original ink cartridge in the color black. This ink cartridge is attached into Gu's throat at a continuous rate of one stroke per second and, in defiance of the known properties of ordinary ink cartridges, has yet to run out of ink in the years since its discovery. Gu appears to be partially conscious, but is unable to communicate intelligibly when addressed. The former Human Resources Department head, Angel Li Huimin, is still in her former office on the second floor, though she no longer performs the duties of her old position. She is still, in a sense, in human resources, or rather, is a human resource. I apologize, sometimes I have to make a joke to cope with the dark subject matter at hand, but Angel's fate is no laughing matter. Like Goo, she is attached to the wall via a series of USB cables. There is an additional cable, one of unspecified length, inserted into her lower abdomen, which is slightly distended, as though filled with a foreign object. Though a proper analysis has not yet been conducted, 
The variety of sounds and motions originating from the area seem to indicate that there is a fully operational HP USB single station thermal receipt printer lodged near her small intestine. As a consequence of this, a never ending stream of thermal receipt paper is pouring from Angel's mouth at all times, causing her considerable pain and distress. Wang Liang, the former head of the IT department, is permanently placed near the water cooler on the first floor. Like the others, he's bound to the wall by several USB cables, 37 to be exact. There are 12 HP Scanjet 200 scanners pressed against his body, all switched on and running at all times. Next to him, an HP DeskJet 1112 printer is attached to the wall and constantly printing out sheets of… something. A closer inspection reveals that it is not paper, but rather, sheets of skin. He is conscious, but no successful interview with Wang has been conducted due to his nearly constant, wordless screams of agony. The fifth human subject found in SCP-2535 is Chen Yupeng, who once worked as a trainee technical writer. Now he spends his days in the branch manager's office on the second floor of the building. His body has been wedged into the paper tray and backup paper tray of an HP LaserJet Pro 500 multifunction printer, which has been plugged into the wall via a standard power cable and a 3 feet USB 2.0 M-M cable. His head sticks out of an aperture, cut into the side of the printer. The printer itself functions normally, printing copies of the HP standard print quality diagnostic page and the HP LaserJet 500 technical repair manual, alternating between the two. Since SCP-2535's discovery, it has not run out of either paper or ink. Chen himself is unconscious and shows signs of severe blood loss that, under ordinary circumstances, likely would have resulted in death by now. During a preliminary inspection of the building, one Foundation operative discovered a Canon PIXMA E480 printer in the first floor janitor's closet. This printer was dented and heavily corroded, most likely from the application of liquid bleach, and was also covered with human teeth marks. It has spent the most recent several years attempting to print a 91-page document, but has been unsuccessful due to an apparent jam in its paper tray and feed mechanism. The seams of the printer occasionally ooze human blood, which DNA testing has matched to Yan Xiaoxia, former creative consultant of the Hangzhou branch. SCP-2535 must be sealed away from the public, under the guise of health and safety concerns. At least two agents are to be stationed in a nearby building at all times, for the purposes of observation. Wherever possible, the inside of SCP-2535 must be soundproofed. All material generated by the building's anomalies must be collected and disposed of on a daily basis. So far, these containment measures have been sufficient to keep civilians away from SCP-2535, as far as the friends and family of the missing employees know, their loved ones were never found. It's better that they think of them as lost or dead, rather than learn what truly became of them. As I was poring over the file for SCP-2535, something curious caught my attention. This is not the only anomaly catalogued by the SCP Foundation concerning a branch of the Hewlett-Packard Corporation. I considered leaving well enough alone, but I've never been particularly good at that. When another path presents itself to me, no matter how dark or foreboding it may seem, I cannot resist the urge to see where it will lead. In this case, the path led me to SCP-2211. SCP-2211 was a collection of four anomalies discovered in the Shanghai offices of Hewlett Packard. Notice that I said, was, rather than is. More on that later. First, allow me to describe the nature of each anomaly. SCP-2211-1 is a 932 megabyte video file titled simply longsmile.wmv. When played, the video depicts a pair of lips on the right edge of the screen. The lips hold a closed mouth smile for a moment, then open to reveal teeth. At this point in the video, the camera pans to the right, revealing more and more teeth, seemingly forever. Though the length of the video file is listed as 55 seconds, testing revealed that the file will continue to play, revealing endless, maddening rows of teeth for more than 150 straight hours. It will possibly run even longer than that, but testing was through before that could be seen. The video has no audio track. When longsmile.wmv is played for longer than 59 minutes and 20 seconds, the device used to play it will begin to secrete a small amount of human saliva. A sample of saliva was collected for DNA testing, but the results were inconclusive and did not match any known human being on record. SCP-2211-2 is a 2.0 megabyte audio file entitled EYEE-79.WAV. 
Each playthrough of the audio file is different, but tends to contain bursts of modulated static that go on for 2 to 10 seconds before being cut off for around 0.3 seconds of silence at a time. Like Long Smile, this file can play for a seemingly infinite amount of time, in spite of its listed length of 3 minutes and 3 seconds. When SCP-2211-2 is played for longer than 59 minutes and 20 seconds, the device will begin to secrete a clear fluid, identified as a mixture of water and sodium chloride, amino acids, glutathione, ascorbic acid, and human collagen fibers. Essentially, the device will begin to leak human tears. SCP-2211-3 is a 599 kilobyte file titled R.exe. When this file is run on a computer, it uses up a great deal of memory, causing the device to overheat and its built-in fans to speed up. In spite of the overheating and any damage it might cause, the computer will continue to run until disconnected from its power source. When the file is run for longer than 59 minutes and 20 seconds, air coming through the built-in fans will begin to emit a strong smell of earwax, though no physical traces of earwax have been found. SCP-2211-4 is a USB adapter-powered coffee reheater. When it is plugged into the USB port of a computer, any liquid placed into the container will be heated to approximately 65 degrees Celsius and will also transform into human mucus at a rate of 1 milliliter per minute. This effect is the same whether or not the computer is on. DNA analysis of the mucus revealed that it is a match with the saliva produced by SCP-2211-1. All of this would have been bizarre enough, a series of files and devices that produce human biological material and are seemingly all connected, but something else happened. All instances of SCP-2211 were kept in a pair of containment lockers. However, on June 10, 2014, this containment was breached. I have included a surveillance log transcript that captured the incident. It occurred as follows. Sound of banging metal detected near second floor of Wing B. Door of small item containment locker DAD-2838 is heavily deformed outwards and has experienced a heavy impact from its inside. The sound of banging metal persists for the next three minutes as the door of containment locker DAD-2838 begins to burst outwards. Security teams are deployed to cordon off the area and manage the situation. Containment locker DAD-2838 is fully breached from the inside when a segmented, humanoid arm emerges, extending to reveal numerous joints along its length. Security teams begin opening fire on the arm to little effect. While the video feed shows that the arm terminates in a seven-fingered hand, personnel present on the scene reported a number of fingers ranging from five to approximately thirty. The arm repeatedly strikes and breaches the containment locker containing SCP-2211-4, approximately five meters from containment locker DAD-2838. It subsequently reaches for SCP-2211-4 and pulls it back into containment locker DAD-2838. No further activity detected. Arm presumed to have dematerialized. Following this incident, the containment locker was examined, but no traces of the many-fingered arm were found inside. Further examination of the locker's contents revealed that SCP-2211-1, 2, and 3 had vanished from their storage media. The files were gone. SCP-2211-4, when tested, no longer displayed any anomalous properties. It was just an ordinary coffee heater, though no staff wanted to use it to heat their coffee, no matter how many times it was washed. Head researcher Min declared SCP-2211 uncontained on August 10, 2014. But there was one more unusual finding. The USB drive that once contained SCP-2211-1 was not empty. There was an untitled text file on the drive. When opened, it simply read, Got my my nose, followed by an unusual text emoticon, colon colon o o, end parentheses, end parentheses. As a man of science, one who has devoted my life to exploring the unexplained and seeking answers to questions that most are afraid to even ask, Nothing troubles me quite like a mystery left unsolved. But the tales of these Chinese Hewlett-Packard offices are composed almost entirely of disturbing mysteries, of frayed wires and broken printers, of survivors that cannot tell their stories, and messages we will never get to read. What happened after that Hangzhou branch closed? Was it connected to the findings at the Shanghai branch? Did that mysterious arm grab hold of the Hangzhou team, contorting their bodies into unrecognizable shapes and forcing them to meld with the products they once sold? Or was it once an employee too, broken down into spare parts and trapped as files and desktop beverage warmers? I can't be certain. But I do know this. 
I'm throwing out my printer. I think I'll just write my notes by hand from now on. I won't necessarily suggest you do the same, but do be careful while handling the machinery. Treat it with respect. After all, you never know if that printer was once as human as you or me. The researchers and guards scream in terror as the creatures run rampant through the factory. Nobody ever imagined they could be so dangerous, and all for a little live entertainment. The janitor rolls his mop cart down the hall of his brand new workplace. It's his first day on the job, and you would never let anyone hear him admit it, but he's a little bit nervous. The building is a huge, fancy research facility, an intimidating, sprawling building, bustling with researchers in lab coats, executives in suits, and dozens of security guards. The previous place he'd worked had cubicles and a break room with a 20-year-old coffee machine, and this place had state-of-the-art technology and keycard locks on every door. Still, he was here to do a job, and that's what he was going to do. Though he was getting distracted by the intensity of the place when there are spills to clean, and apparently there's a big one. As soon as the janitor had clocked in, a researcher had rushed over to tell him that he was desperately needed on one of the lower levels. So here he was, rolling his cart toward the elevator, holding the researcher's keycard in his hand. His own won't work to take him down to the appropriate level. His security clearance isn't high enough. He wonders, idly, why this company has such tight security, but figures that it isn't his job to ask that sort of question. Instead, he enters the elevator, swipes the card, and hits the button for LG-1. The elevator doors open with a ding, and the janitor wheels his cart out. Right away, he notices something off about this level. There are rows of massive glass boxes, filled with what look like giant fuzzy puppets. He can hear the usual sounds of chatter and footsteps, but there's also the clucking of chickens, the bleat of a goat. Are there farm animals down here? Maybe that's the source of the mess they were talking about, test subject animals or something. He continues past the glass boxes, searching for someone who can direct him toward the mess. As he walks, he feels dozens of eyes on him and stops to glance over his shoulder. His stomach drops as he sees that the creatures he thought were puppets have moved. They turn to face him as he passed by, eyes locked onto his back. Whatever these things are, they're alive and they're all watching him. He shudders but continues walking. At the other side of the hall, he can see a huge red spill on the tile floor. His footsteps quicken as he approaches the spill, and a metallic smell fills his nose. He had assumed it was some sort of leakage from machinery, but now, up close, he can tell it's blood. That's it. No paycheck is worth whatever is going on here. He turns to leave, abandoning the mop cart, and comes face to face with a giant furry thing at least eight feet tall. It grins down at him, reaching toward him with outstretched arms. Before he can run, it wraps those arms around him and pulls him into an inescapable, bone-crushing hug. He struggles, but he can't break free. He can't breathe. The air squeezed from his lungs. In a halting, inhuman voice, the monster says, Teamwork makes the dream work. Then, everything goes black. About one week after that janitor's ill-fated first day at work, the local police station received a video transmission from an unidentified man reporting an emergency at the facility. No further information was given, other than the exact location of the facility and the insistence that help be sent as quickly as possible. When the police arrived, however, they quickly realized that the situation was above their pay grade and contacted an organization much more experienced with handling unusual occurrences, the SCP Foundation. The Foundation quickly arrived, administered amnestics to all witnesses, and investigated the area. There, they found something unlike anything they had ever seen before, and for the SCP Foundation, that was saying something. All human personnel at the facility had been terminated, or were missing altogether. There was still activity present in the building, however, though none of it was human. There were anomalous creatures roaming the facility uninhibited. They did not resemble humans or any known animals but instead looked more like costumed characters from a children's television show, along the lines of Sesame Street or Barney. The site manager's office was completely empty of any files, and all hard drives found within had been wiped. Every surface had been sterilized and cleaned to remove any DNA evidence or fingerprints. The anomalous creatures were promptly captured, though they did not go without a fight. Several of the creatures were heard moving through the vents and were unable to be removed due to their speed, agility, and excretion of caustic material. 
In the underground laboratory spaces of the facility, the Foundation agents discovered glass tubes filled with amniotic fluid in which underdeveloped specimens were being grown. Agents also discovered containment chambers made of bulletproof glass, as well as pens filled with deceased farm animals, including cows, chickens, and goats. Once the Foundation had rounded up all of the creatures, the facility was blocked off from the outside world and given the official designation SCP-3325. SCP-3325 is an abandoned facility belonging to Real Characters Industries. The facility includes a recording studio, a series of underground laboratories, staff living quarters, storage, containment areas, and an industrial-grade incinerator. There are also several administrative areas, as well as a helipad on the structure's roof. The containment areas are home to a collection of biologically engineered organisms that bear a cursory resemblance to puppets or human beings wearing plush costumes, like those seen on children's television shows. For research purposes, these organisms have been designated SCP-3325-1. Despite their colorful appearance, which could even be mistaken for inviting and wholesome from a distance, instances of SCP-3325-1 are incredibly hostile to humans and any other organisms outside their own species. Though they are vulnerable to attacks with conventional weapons, these creatures lack any sense of pain and will continue to go after an intended target until they are effectively destroyed. In addition to their penchant for aggression, the instances of SCP-3325-1 are carnivorous and will eat any meat they are given access to. Thankfully, these organisms lack reproductive organs, so there won't be any baby plush monsters running around anytime soon. Instances of SCP-3325-1 behave in an unpredictable manner Though their most common activities are either staring at personnel blankly for long stretches of time, attempting to attack them, or repeating assorted canned children's television-friendly phrases in voices that Foundation personnel have described as unsettling and disturbing. Over the course of the initial discovery and containment of SCP-3325, SCP Foundation staff created an observation log describing all known types of SCP-3325-1. The breakdown is as follows. SCP-3325-1 A Long neck avian organism with feathers, 3 meters tall. Its wings are redundant, unable to facilitate flight. Instances are able to reach a speed of approximately 72 kilometers an hour. Aggressive behavior patterns are similar to that of a cassowary. Instance frequently damages its beak by running into objects. Color varies. I've encountered cassowaries before while conducting field research and let me just say, the dinosaurs never really did die out. They live on in those monstrous birds. But I digress. SCP-3325-1b Bipedal reptilian organism, observed in colors of purple, green, and yellow. SCP-3325-1c Bipedal organism covered in fur, one meter tall, able to sprint at speeds of around 60 kilometers an hour observed to attack in packs. Upon acquiring a target, an instance will vocalize a random phrase, which elicits aggressive behavior in other nearby instances. Color varies. SCP-3325-1D Unknown organism that hides in vents. Object is able to secrete and project a corrosive fluid. The appearance of the organism is unknown. Specimens have yet to be obtained. SCP-3325-1E bipedal reptilian organism, 5 meters tall, constantly sings in a distorted voice. The lyrics of its song are unintelligible, presumably due to malformed vocal cords. Only one instance has been encountered. The other observed variety of SCP-3325-1 is not one specific type of organism, but rather a collection of malformed creatures characterized by the presence of conditions that, in any other organism, would cause death shortly after, if not during, birth. These include but are not limited to necrosis, missing skin, tumors, additional organs in places where they shouldn't be, or other life-threatening deformations. As you might imagine, the appearance of specimens with this classification varies greatly. Following my initial research into SCP-3325, several addenda were added to the official file, consisting of several pieces of pertinent and often troubling media. The first was a brochure discovered on the floor of the facility, depicting a dissatisfied crying child standing next to a puppet, in contrast to an image of the same child laughing and clapping in the presence of an SCP-3325-1 specimen. In addition to these images, the brochure contains this text. 
In today's world, children are bored of animation, puppets, costumes, and even the once groundbreaking computer-generated graphics. They've seen it all. They know it's all fake. Children nowadays want more. But what is the next step in the entertainment industry? Think outside the box. We're not talking about puppets or any of those materials children know are fake. We, as humans, inherently need to associate with living, breathing creatures, not puppets or moving pictures. We're talking about real characters. Our goal is to provide children with characters that are alive, that will teach them how to manage their emotions and solve life problems realistically. You can't get more real than that. During a subsequent sweep of the facility grounds, an SCP Foundation employee discovered a videotape wedged between the wall and a large papier-mâché apple. Scrawled in pen across the tape's case were the words, We shouldn't have played God. A transcript of the videotape's contents is included in the file's second addendum, which I will attempt to summarize for you now. The video depicts an unidentified woman standing next to a green instance of the cassowary-like avian species of SCP-3325-1. Two men stand behind the camera, directing the action. Context clues suggest that this tape was intended to serve as a demonstration of the facility's characters, possibly for potential clients or investors. At the start of the video, the woman expresses discomfort with the bird-like creature, which stares at her, still and unblinking. She is instructed to say her lines as scripted, but when action is called and the actress begins to speak, the creature bites her arm. One of the men steps in front of the camera to intervene, but the entity does not respond to his commands. Even when the man begins to strike the creature with a baton, it does not budge. Instead, it bites down harder and harder until blood is drawn. Security is called, and the footage is cut short. After the first tape was discovered, the Foundation conducted several more sweeps of the property in an attempt to locate any additional media they may have missed the first time. During a search of the security room, an officer's backpack was located. It contained several personal items, including a very expired yogurt, a Nicholas Sparks novel, and a bag of sour cream and onion chips. At the bottom of the bag, however, another tape was found. This one appeared to have been surveillance footage captured by security cameras. This was particularly notable, given that all other surveillance footage found at the facility had been destroyed or corrupted, most likely deliberately. To this date, this is the only security footage successfully recovered from SCP-3325. The footage depicts two figures, presumably security guards, standing on a catwalk, looking down at containment pens filled with instances of SCP-3325-1. Each guard holds a long pole with a device attached to the tip, appearing to function similarly to a taser or a cattle prod. The guards talk amongst themselves, joking about shocking the creatures for fun. One guard points out a particular instance of SCP-3325-1, which is standing still and staring dead ahead. The other guard points out another stagnant creature, which appears to be staring directly at the other guard. Disquieted by this, the guard decides to knock the entity's hat off of its head. He grabs an empty bottle, throwing it at the instance. The bottle collides with the hat, but the item does not budge. Instead, it breaks open and begins to bleed, revealing it to be a part of the creature's body rather than a costume piece. The two guards begin to panic at the sight of the security camera before asking Danny in the security room to take the tape. The second guard admonishes the first for his behavior, and the footage cuts. The next addendum to the SCP-3325 file is, in the opinion of this researcher, the most disturbing. Field agents retrieved 79 steel containers from a storage area on the bottom floor of the facility. 41 of these containers contained human bodies preserved in a formaldehyde solution. Additionally, each container had documents attached, detailing each person's name and position at the company, as well as the cause of their death. Causes of death listed included mauling, organ failure, necrosis, and scheduled termination. SCP-3325 is classified as Euclid. Currently, SCP-3325 is contained on site, surrounded by a fence and guarded by no fewer than four security guards at any given time. Due to the isolated nature of the location, no further security measures have been deemed necessary. As for the specimens of SCP-3325-1, they are kept in large animal containment cells at a research sector whose precise designation has been redacted from official files. Each of these containment cells has an audio recording device inside. Each specimen is to be fed twice a day on a diet of raw meat, and no direct interaction between research staff and these specimens is permitted without first tranquilizing the entity. 
the effort to locate and contain all pieces of equipment associated with SCP-3325, as well as any documents pertaining to it, is an ongoing project. At this time, it's uncertain if any of us will ever know what Real Characters Industries was up to, and when it turned from an attempt to revolutionize the children's entertainment market to something far more sinister. What did the researchers discover that signed their eventual death warrants? Was the project truly abandoned, or just moved deeper underground, to a new facility staffed with fresh faces who won't ask too many questions? One thing is certain. Be wary of cuddly new characters that appear at theme parks, at birthday parties, and on screen in the coming years. It's possible that these creatures are just actors in suits, or life-size puppets, and all they want is a hug. But it's also possible that their wide, vacant eyes and friendly smiles hide an uncontrollable rage, an unpredictable intelligence, and a thirst for blood. The boy screams as his body transforms, his bones warp and twist as feathers emerge from its pores and his skull sharpens into a long, hard beak. He's in a living nightmare. And who could have guessed it all started with an innocent attempt to play hooky? It's an ordinary Monday morning, and all over town, children are waking up and reluctantly dragging themselves out of bed for school. Some are oversleeping, hitting the snooze on their alarms, and getting a bit of extra shut-eye before their exhausted parents notice, wake them up, and rush to get them to school before the first morning bell. In one particular bedroom, a young boy is awake but still in bed, brainstorming as fast as he can. He is determined to skip school today however he can. He usually doesn't mind school very much, but today all he can think about is the math test he didn't study for and the mean classmate who likes to knock his books out of his hands, but he can't just ask to skip school for no reason. He has to come up with a plan. He runs to the bathroom, splashing hot water in his face to give him a flushed appearance and a warm forehead. Then he hops back into bed and begins to loudly cough and sniffle until his mother comes to check on him. He complains that he doesn't feel well enough to go to school, and sure enough, when his mother feels his forehead, it is hot to the touch. She agrees to let him stay home from school for the day, provided he stays in bed and gets plenty of rest. He promises that he will, and she leaves to go to work. On her way to work, the boy's mother remembers that there isn't much for him to eat while he's home alone all day. At least, there isn't much that he would want to eat while he's sick. She decides that she can be a little bit late to work for the sake of her son's health and pulls into a nearby grocery store. She rushes out of her car and into the store, making a beeline for the soup aisle. She reaches for her usual go-to brand of chicken noodle soup, but finds the shelf completely bare. That's right, it's flu season. Of course, the soup is sold out. Oh great, this is exactly what she needs. A sick kid at home, one can of chicken noodle soup left at the store, and the machine won't even scan it. She smacks the side of the machine in frustration, and the screen reads invalid code, transaction cancelled. With a heavy sigh, she glances over her shoulder. No one is watching. She tried to pay for the can to do the right thing, but the machine wouldn't let her. So she grabs the can and runs out of the store before anyone can spot her. While his mother is out, the boy is at home raiding the pantry for snacks to sate his not at all sick appetite. He fills up on Oreos and toaster pastries, cheesy crackers and chips. When he hears his mother's car pulling into the driveway, he quickly wipes the crumbs from his face and jumps back into bed, just in time for his mother to find him there, resting like he promised he would. She gives him a kiss on the forehead and tells him that she will heat up some chicken noodle soup for him to eat. She's in a hurry to make it to work though, so she'll need to leave it in the microwave for him. She pours the contents of the soup into a bowl, adds a bit of water, and pops the bowl into the microwave for a few minutes. She calls up to her son, letting him know that the soup will be ready when the microwave dings. Then she rushes out the door and heads to work for the day, confident that her son will be fine through her shift. If he happens to need anything, he can call her and let her know. The boy hears the microwave ding, but his stomach is too full from his rummage through the pantry for him to want any of the soup, in spite of its heavenly aroma. Instead, he creeps into the living room and sits down to play video games until his eyes start to hurt. As he boots up his gaming system, he thinks for a moment that he can hear a strange noise coming from the kitchen, a soft, clucking sound, like the chickens he saw on his grandparents' farm. But he quickly forgets about the sound as the screen lights up and he disappears into the world of his favorite game. He plays for hours until the grumbling of his stomach interrupts his concentration. He's suddenly very hungry and remembers the soup his mother left in the microwave. It is certainly cold and unappealing by now, but he can just reheat it first. He punches the buttons on the microwave and waits for the soup to be ready. Again, 
He can hear strange noises coming from the microwave, but he doesn't think anything of it. The microwave dings, and he pulls out the bowl of soup, grabs a spoon, and digs in. A little while later, the boy's mother pulls into the driveway in a panic. She left work early when her phone rang with a call from her son. She answered, asking what was wrong, but he wouldn't answer her. All she could hear on the other end was rustling, heavy breathing, and some pained grunting. Fearing the worst, she drove back as fast as she could, running several red lights along the way. Now she fumbles with her keys as she unlocks the door, terrified of what she will find. She grips her phone in her other hand, thumb hovering over the buttons, ready to dial 911 if the situation calls for it. She pushes the front door open, calling her son's name. He doesn't answer, and her stomach drops. Suddenly, she hears the loud thud of something heavy being knocked to the ground. Something is terribly wrong here, and even though she might find her worst nightmare, she has to face whatever is waiting for her inside. She runs into the kitchen and finds it a mess. The bowl of soup is shattered on the floor, congealed, cold soup pooling on the tile. The kitchen table is turned over on its side. The kitchen chairs are in disarray. But the strangest sight is the dozens of tiny, white, fluffy things on the floor, counters, and furniture. She picks one up for a closer look and finds herself even more confused than before. It's a feather. They're all feathers. She calls her son's name again, praying for a response. This time, she receives one, though not the one she hopes for. She hears the sound of shuffling footsteps up above, followed by a strangled sound like a scream caught in someone's throat. She sprints up the stairs as fast as her legs can carry her, throwing open the door to her son's bedroom. There, she finds him. But this is not the bright-eyed boy that she left behind when she left for work. His arms are covered with a thick layer of white feathers, the same feathers that are beginning to poke through the skin of his face. The top of his head has elongated into a floppy comb of excess skin, the same sort of excess skin that is wobbling below his chin. And his mouth, it doesn't look like a mouth anymore. It's pointed and hard, and his lips click together when he speaks, or rather, clucks. His bare feet are scaly and red, with claws protruding from his toes. He flaps his wings frantically, eyes wide and wild, clucking and running back and forth across the room. When he looks at her, she does not see recognition in his gaze. Her son, her beloved boy, has turned into a chicken. Unable to do anything else, the mother calls an ambulance. At first, the paramedics that arrive on the scene think the call was some sort of elaborate prank, but when they set eyes on the boy, they agree that something truly bizarre is going on. They speed to the hospital with the chicken boy in tow, but sadly are unable to save his life. The mother turns over the can of the mysterious soup to the authorities, who launch a formal investigation. Unfortunately, they are unable to trace the can to any store, nor are they able to verify the existence of the company name on its label. Employees of the grocery store where she found the can insist that they have never seen it in their lives. Several weeks after this incident occurred, the SCP Foundation conducted a raid on a New York office of Marshall, Carter, and Dark. For those of you unfamiliar with the organization, and that is most of the general population by design, Marshall, Carter, and Dark LTD is an extremely powerful multinational corporation founded by three individuals with those surnames, specializing in the acquisition and sale of anomalous items, entities, and experiences. To put it simply, they run the largest anomalous black market in the world and are the crime bosses of the paranormal world. During this particular raid, SCP Foundation operatives recovered 17 different unusual items. Among the items discovered was a shipping crate, recently delivered by the Federal Postal Service from an invalid return address. This crate contained 103 cans of SCP-2057, as well as a copy of a letter written to one of the company's associates. So far, the letter has not been traced to an address. It reads, Dear Cyrus, Maria has told me of the unfortunate circumstances that have befallen your children. I had hoped to hear about the improvement of their condition soon. As their godfather, I am extremely distressed to hear this. Having experienced a child suffering from the measles myself, I know how terrifying it can be when it seems as if they are getting worse. Recently, we received a shipment of something that I hope can help your family. There is a crate in the storage area marked with Wondertainment, Discontinued Item. It will not be there long, as it goes to auction next week. I will leave a key under the photo of your family on your desk. Follow the instructions exactly. Do not under any circumstances do anything different than what is directed on the can. Destroy this message as soon as possible. I do not want any of this to come back on us. 
Be careful, my friend. Williams. SCP-2057 consists of 92 318 milliliter cans of condensed chicken noodle soup. Each can is covered with a brightly colored label depicting images of noodles, a cartoon chicken, and dancing vegetables. In addition to this inviting imagery, each label is emblazoned with the text, Dr. Wondertainment's Ultralicious Chicken Noodle Soup for Kids. Each can has a pull-top lid for easy opening and is printed with a set of nutrition facts, ingredients, and instructions for heating. The nutrition facts are as follows. Calories, 95. Fat, 3.17 grams. Carbohydrates, 2.2 grams. Protein, 13.48 grams. Vitamin W, 2 grams. And Mother's Love, 10 grams. The SCP Foundation attempted to analyze the contents of the soup in order to compare it to the posted nutrition facts. The calories, fat, carbohydrates, and protein were found to be accurately reported. Vitamin W was present in the reported amount as well, though it was not a compound that the Foundation scientists had ever encountered before. Mother's love, as it is an intangible concept, was not able to be identified or measured in the analyzed soup samples. The ingredients are listed as ultralicious chicken stock, enriched Chinese egg noodles, finest cooked chicken breast, farm fresh carrots, crispy crunchy celery, sweet Vidalia onions, no paint thinner, fresh mountain spring water, vitamin W. Contains less than 2% of the following ingredients. A pinch of salt, a smidgen of chicken fat, sprinkle of spice extracted from rare plants, a dash of high quality unicorn tears. The instructions for heating read, Hey kids, feeling sick, icky, or downright yucky? Just pop open a can of Dr. Wondertainment's Ultralicious Chicken Noodle Soup for Kids. Place contents of the can in a medium-sized soup pot. Add a can of water, stir, and heat. Watch as the fun begins. Eat hearty, and you'll feel better and ready to play with Dr. Wondertainment toys in no time. All of this is relatively straightforward, give or take a few unusual ingredients. Someone taking only a quick look might mistake a can of this soup for any other chicken noodle soup. However, it does have something that most ordinary canned soup does not. A warning label. Dr. Wondertainment's Ultralicious Chicken Noodle Soup for Kids is intended to be eaten while it is hot to make you feel better in no time at all. Do not consume after it has become cold. Do not reheat. By purchasing from Dr. Wondertainment, you agree to not hold Dr. Wondertainment or any of Dr. Wondertainment's affiliates accountable for injuries or damages incurred by your product. Thank you for purchasing from Dr. Wondertainment. So what exactly is in a can of Dr. Wondertainment's Ultralicious Chicken Noodle Soup for Kids? Well, when the SCP Foundation first opened a can to take a look, they found that it was filled with condensed chicken broth and a mass of egg noodles shaped like an egg. When water was added and the contents of the can were heated to a temperature of 70 degrees Celsius, the noodle-based egg hatched. Inside was a small domesticated chicken made up of egg noodles, carrot, celery, onion, and cooked chicken breast. For simplicity's sake, this chicken noodle soup chicken is referred to as SCP-2057-1. As the Foundation researchers continued to heat the broth to a higher temperature, SCP-2057-1 began to move around, make audible chirping sounds, and eat the broth. As it ate, it grew larger and larger until it reached a mass of 85 grams and resembled a miniature adult chicken. At a temperature between 35 and 70 degrees Celsius, SCP-2057-1 behaved much like an ordinary chicken. It continued to behave normally even as it was consumed or cut apart, apparently feeling no pain or awareness of its situation. Dissection of SCP-2057-1 revealed that its insides were made up of soup ingredients, including celery and onion bones, cooked chicken breast muscles, carrot beak and legs, and chicken broth blood. When SCP-2057-1's temperature dropped below 35 degrees Celsius, it stopped moving and collapsed into the soup. At a temperature below 20 degrees Celsius, it became congealed and unappetizing. With these observations completed, the Foundation then attempted to measure the effects of this unusual chicken soup on a person that ingested it. When test subjects were fed samples of the soup at a temperature between 35 and 70 degrees Celsius, they had a very positive experience. The soup's taste was described as excellent, delicious, and homey. Though the meal caused a bit of psychological distress due to the soup chicken's realistic appearance and behavior, it improved every test subject's physical well-being. This eventually applied to test subjects with a case of influenza, measles, or the common cold. Following consumption of SCP-2057, 
Each subject with a diagnosed illness of this kind reported immediate relief from their symptoms, including fever, aches and pains, cough, and congestion. With this positive, if a bit disturbing, effect documented, the Foundation next set out to determine what would happen if they let the soup get cold before it was eaten. Test subjects served this version of the soup had a far worse experience, describing the taste of their meal as bland, disgusting, and repulsive. 67% of the test subjects experienced cramps, chills, and diarrhea following their consumption of the soup, and 62% found themselves making involuntary clucking noises, as well as experiencing a strong aversion to poultry products. Again, several test subjects were deliberately selected based on their cases of influenza, measles, and the common cold. These test subjects immediately began to develop troubling symptoms, including the growth of pin feathers on their forearms, loosened excess skin on their heads and under their chins, a change in their ability to walk normally, and distressing hallucinations of being hung upside down by the ankles. Following these two rounds of testing, the research team decided to see why exactly the warning label advised against reheating the soup. D-Class 45782 was selected as the test subject for this particular experiment and was instructed to reheat a bowl of cooled SCP-2057-1 in a microwave on high for 2 minutes and 30 seconds. Then, he was to consume the reheated soup and report his experience to a camera placed in the room with him. As instructed, D-45782 microwaved the bowl of soup. As it heated in the microwave, it emitted unintelligible vocalizations in a deep voice. After removing the bowl from the microwave, D-45782 noted that it was gelatinous-looking, with blackened burnt bits around the edges. He took three bites of the disgusting, hot and cold at the same time mixture before spitting it out onto the floor and refusing to eat another bite. Fifteen minutes after tasting the reheated soup, D-45872 began to exhibit significant distress, plucking angrily into the camera. Five minutes later, D-45872 became more difficult to understand clucks and other chicken-like vocalizations, making up most of his attempted speech. He began scratching vigorously at his arms to the point of drawing blood. Loose skin could be seen gathering on the top of his head and under his neck. Six minutes later, D-45872 had lost the ability to speak. Large white pin feathers had sprouted from his arms, covering the skin, and smaller white feathers were beginning to sprout from his face. After 16 more minutes passed, D-45872 began attacking other objects in the room, attempting to destroy the microwave, knocking the bowl of soup to the floor, and flipping over a table and chair. He had grown feathers over 67% of his skin, and his face had begun to change drastically. His nasal area was elongated and hardened, joining with his lower jaw in an appendage resembling a bird's beak. His upper lip had disappeared into his nasal cavity. Only five minutes later, D-45872 suddenly stopped moving and collapsed to the floor, dead. Following D-45872's death, an autopsy was performed. These were the findings. Autopsy revealed D-45782's cause of death was due to extreme and sudden physical change of internal organs, resulting in shock and cardiac arrest. 93% of the subject's skin was covered in feathers. Physical changes in the face resulted in a beak-like alteration of the nose and mouth, Loose skin under the neck and on the top of the head resemble a waddle and comb. Subjects' lower legs were found to be covered in thick, scaly skin, with the toes of the subject's feet ending in small, rounded claws. The subject and instance of SCP-2057-1 were incinerated after testing and autopsy. Whenever not being used for approved experimentation, all cans of SCP-2057 must be stored in a standard, large-volume storage locker in Containment Area 27 and kept at a temperature of 25 degrees Celsius. Because SCP-2057 is in limited supply, all experiments must first be approved by at least two personnel with 2-1103 clearance, as well as receiving the go-ahead from Dr. Applegate. There are still 41 cans of Dr. Wondertainment's chicken soup unaccounted for, and the Foundation has been unable to track them down so far. Who knows where they ended up? Maybe at another office of Marshall Carter and Dark. Or maybe, just maybe, one made its way onto the shelves at your local grocery store. Best to be careful out there. When you're feeling sick, hungry, or in need of a little pick-me-up, there's nothing quite like a steaming hot bowl of chicken noodle soup. Just make sure to read the label carefully and always follow the printed instructions. If you ignore them, you might just find that your chickens have come home to roost. After all, as the saying goes, you are what you eat. A knife in the dark, bloody teeth, 
and an appetite about to bring an end to one of history's most infamous monsters. The year is 1888, and the streets of London are teeming with tension and fear. In the daytime, people struggle to find work, fighting each other tooth and nail for scraps of opportunity. The sunlight only serves to illuminate the grime and misery, the workhouses and the factories, the smokestacks pumping poison into the sky. At night, though, it's even worse. The gas lamps provide only ghostly wisps of dim light, just enough to see a stranger's shadow from the corner of your eye, but not enough to see if the glint of something shiny in his hand is his pocket watch or his knife. You might glance over your shoulder for a closer look, but he's already disappeared into the fog if he was ever even there at all. These streets feel haunted even on the quietest of nights, but lately there are rumors swirling in the air of something far worse than a ghost skulking through the alleys. More real than the devil, more evil than any ordinary man, there's a killer on the prowl, and his name is Jack the Ripper. At first, most citizens refused to take notice of his presence, writing off his victims as women of ill repute, bound to meet a dreadful demise sooner or later. But as the bodies piled up, the sheer brutality of the killings became impossible to ignore. Now, everyone is on edge, particularly if their daily business takes them to London's east side, where the murders began. Once hoped to be a place of opportunity for those traveling to London from afar to seek their fortunes, Whitechapel has become a den of sin and terror. No one can breathe easy here, not until the Ripper is caught, if he ever is. There are theories, of course, accused noblemen, surgeons, butchers, and doctors. Whoever the culprit is, one thing is certain. He knows his way around a knife. Still, no one suspect seems to stick, and no one theory is compelling enough to lead to an arrest. Privately, behind locked doors where no policeman can hear them whispering, the people of Whitechapel are beginning to wonder whether the Ripper will ever be found. Perhaps this nightmare won't cease until the streets run red with blood. But even in the middle of hell on earth, day-to-day -day matters must still be attended to. So even as he worries for the lives of his customers and his own livelihood, the owner of a local pub posts a job listing, seeking a new cook. He doesn't need anything fancy, he can't pay for much, just a fellow who knows his way around a kitchen and can cook up decent enough food without accidentally slicing his fingers off. Still, he's not sure there's anyone out there who would be too happy to take a job so close to Jack the Ripper's domain at the moment. But the next day, as he comes in to unlock the doors and set up for the day, he finds an applicant waiting for him outside, grinning ear to ear. He's a massive fellow towering over the pub owner at a height he's never seen before outside of a circus performer on stilts. But he greets the pub owner with a firm handshake and follows him inside, though he has to hunch a great deal to fit through the door. It's not as if there's a line of applicants out the door, so the pub owner goes ahead and hires him as the new cook. The cook is a Frenchman, but he won't hold it against him. That night, when the pub opens for business, the new cook gets right to work. From his disposition, one would never know he's working for pennies in a dingy pub in the most dangerous part of town. He bustles around the modest kitchen, chopping meat and singing in a warm, loud voice that carries through the whole building, bringing some much-needed cheer to the exhausted customers. Pretty soon, they get a taste of the new cook's work, mutton and potatoes and juicy meat pies. Whoever this new worker is, the crowd is pleased to have him around. The owner does advise the cook to stay in the kitchen, though. His food and his singing may be popular but his appearance might frighten the already skittish regulars. There's plenty to be afraid of these days, no need to add a giant to the mix. When the pub closes up for the night, the owner stops for a moment to chat with his new cook. He can't help but be curious about the man, where he came from, what brought him to London. The cook tells him, tearfully, that he was once a soldier in the French army, but that he lost his military career following a tragic accident he refused to disclose the details of. After that, he worked in a circus, then as a private chef in the home of a wealthy French family, until he was thrown out over a forbidden love affair with his boss's daughter. The pub owner isn't sure he believes a word of it, but he nods along just the same. He asks the cook when he first arrived in London. The first of April, he says, and with that, he heads off home, leaving the pub owner alone with his thoughts, the color draining from his face. April 1st was only two days before the first Jack the Ripper victim was discovered. It couldn't be. Could it? As the pub owner embarked on his journey home, he replayed the image of the cook's work that night over and over in his mind. The man was plenty competent with a knife, that was certain, 
He was strong enough to kill quickly, too. With those hands, he could squeeze the life out of someone before they even got the chance to scream. He could have done it. But why would he? He seemed like such a friendly man, odd though he was. And he was odd, almost frightening. He had clearly lied about his past as well. What reason would he have for doing that, if not to conceal a dark and terrible secret? The pub owner lies awake all night, horrific visions of his new cook keeping him from sleep. The next day, the pub owner's suspicions begin to fester and grow. He notices things he didn't pick up on before, the strange way the cook always speaks through his teeth, the deft way that he handles a butcher knife, slicing through the cuts of meat that he brings to the pub himself. What butcher is he going to? Where is he finding so much meat in such scarce times? The owner shudders at the possibilities. His customers are starting to take notice of his change in attitude, too. They see the sweat dotting his brow, his furtive glances toward the kitchen, and the way his hands shake when he brings them their plates of food. Several customers corner the owner and demand an explanation. These days, they can't let any unusual behavior go on for long. Something sinister could be afoot, after all. The pub owner relents and confesses his suspicions that his newly hired cook might be the Ripper himself. Not only that, but he's afraid the meat he's been preparing might not be sourced from any livestock, but from more of the Ripper's victims. It was an unwise choice to admit these fears to a group of men driven to the edge of reason by their own dread, bodies in the streets, and a bit too much ale. They swarm the kitchen to confront the cook and are shocked at the sight of the behemoth they find there. The cook greets them with his usual smile, but they aren't having any of it. They attack him in spite of his intimidating size, pummeling him with their fists. The cook tries to reason with the men, but they are determined to get an answer out of him, and his previously unfailing smile falters. He opens his mouth wide and in a truly shocking display, gobbles up one of the men in two quick bites. He spits out a shoe and it flies across the room, hitting another one of the men in the face. There is silence for a long moment, and then sheer pandemonium. The surviving men tear out of the pub, spilling into the streets in a drunken, panic-stricken mob. Wiping his mouth, the cook turns to see his boss, staring at him with wide eyes, frozen to the spot in fear. With a polite bow, the cook gives his resignation, apologizes for the disruption, and turns to see himself out. Meanwhile, the pub patrons are cornering a policeman, demanding he follows them to the location of a giant, man-eating monster who they believe to be the Ripper. The policeman laughs in their faces and advises them to head home and sleep off their drinks before they get themselves into any more trouble. With a full belly, but without a job, and without anywhere else to go, the cook ducks out the door to the pub and begins to stroll slowly down the dark, dingy streets. Up ahead, he sees a woman walking alone. She drops something on the ground, a small coin purse. She doesn't notice it fall, and keeps walking. But the cook is very much a gentleman, in spite of his cannibalistic indiscretion before. He hurries over and bends to pick it up. When he looks back at the woman, he sees a man creeping up behind her. The shadowy man draws a knife and lifts his arm, preparing to strike. The cook cries out to warn the woman, and she turns, letting out a blood-curdling scream at the sight of both the would-be killer and the giant with blood still dripping from his chin. She picks up her skirts and runs as fast as she can, disappearing down a nearby alley and out of sight. The cook still holds her coin purse in his massive hand, but there's no way she'll come back to retrieve it now. The man with the knife turns on the cook with a roar of primal rage. He slashes at the giant with his knife, but it merely glances off of the enormous man's tough skin, not drawing so much as a single drop of blood. He tries again and again, but fails to make even a mark. Frustrated, exhausted, and still a little bit hungry, the giant grabs hold of the attempted killer, lifts him into the air, opens his mouth wide, and swallows him whole in a single gulp. The knife, still stained with the blood of his previous victims, clatters to the ground. The cook sighs and tucks the coin purse into his pocket. Then he continues on his way, walking out of London and on to the next chapter of his life's grand adventure. He has no idea that his climactic meal in Whitechapel was none other than the infamous Jack the Ripper, and the people of London will never know of the unintentional act of heroism he committed that day. They will only remember the fear and the sight of a giant devouring a man alive. But soon enough, that will fade from memory, replaced with relief when no new victims are found, and then replaced again with a mystery that will endure for hundreds of years. Though that cook was no ripper, he was also clearly no ordinary man. Before they decided to drive him out of town, 
the people of Whitechapel had, unbeknownst to them, been eating and drinking with SCP-082. SCP-082 is, according to his genetic makeup, a perfectly ordinary human. However, one look at SCP-082 makes it clear that he is far from ordinary. Some sort of external process has caused him to grow to an enormous size, standing at 8 feet tall and weighing around 700 pounds. Foundation researchers are divided in opinion over the exact cause of SCP-082's unique proportions. Some theorize that it is some sort of mutation, others propose an extreme hormone imbalance, some believe it to be chemical in nature, while others insist that only a supernatural force could be responsible for such a dramatic deviation from the norm. Whatever the case may be, SCP-082 is a formidable and visually impressive specimen. His head is bald and slightly pointed, his chin and jaw are large and round, his nose is bulbous, and his eyes are dark and sunken. His body has a high fat content but also contains notable muscle mass, and his physical strength should not be discounted. His forearms have a circumference of around 28 inches, and his fists are nearly an entire foot across the knuckles. Suffice it to say, he is not the sort of opponent you would want to come up against in a fight, and certainly not someone to antagonize, though medical examinations of his body indicate that at least a few likely ill-fated individuals have tried over the years. His skin is covered with scars, and though his x-rays are difficult to read due to the density of muscle tissue, scans have indicated that there are dozens of bullets and several blades, from knives and swords alike, buried in the man's flesh. Clearly, SCP-082 has been through a great deal of hardship. But you wouldn't know it from his disposition. He is gregarious and polite, with a personality as big as the rest of him. Oh, that reminds me, I've been extremely rude. He has a name. It's Fernand. At least, that's what he says. Fernand speaks fluent French, but is proficient in English as well, though he speaks with a heavy accent. Whenever he does speak, he does so with a smile, talking through his tightly clenched and massive teeth. Occasionally, he clenches these teeth so hard that his gums will begin bleeding from the effort. The reason for this is unknown, but the SCP Foundation considers it normal behavior for Fernand, whatever that means. I have my own personal theory regarding Fernand's penchant for clenching his teeth, but I won't get into that just yet. Fernand does occasionally open his mouth all the way and separate his teeth, but only when he is eating or singing. He is quite the musical talent, serenading the SCP Foundation with his takes on well-known classical music, as well as long-forgotten drinking songs and the occasional sea shanty. He loves to sing while cooking, which he is permitted to do under strict Foundation supervision. He is allowed access to a rudimentary set of cooking implements whenever he prepares his food, including a butcher knife that he also uses to shave his unusually thick facial hair. He is given various ingredients to prepare on request, with the stipulation that these ingredients must not be too expensive or human in origin. In spite of his off-putting appearance and tendency to speak through his teeth, Fernand is easily one of the more likable anomalies contained by the Foundation. He doesn't express overt hostility like SCP-682, nor does he attempt to diagnose staff with any sort of pestilence like SCP-049. All he seemingly wants to do is cook, sing, and play dress-up. Did I mention his costume trunk yet? Well, he has one. Some of his favorite outfits include a tuxedo, complete with top hat and a monocle, a military uniform serves of the French Revolution, a ball gown that comes with an elegant fan and matching beaded purse, and a clown costume that includes a wig and a trick water-squirting flower in its pocket. New costume pieces are made on request in order to keep Fernand's morale high. According to my findings, in-house costumers are currently hard at work making Fernand a detective costume, a chef's hat, and a set of footy pajamas. Fernand is an indisputable charmer, greeting Foundation researchers with a wide smile, a joke, and more often than not, an invitation to join him for dinner. Unfortunately, those same staff members occasionally find themselves on the menu. In spite of all his endearing qualities, Fernand has the unfortunate habit of routinely snapping, giving in to his voracious appetite, and eating his visitors alive. He doesn't intend to do so, and frequently expresses regret at his poor manners. After all, Having company for dinner doesn't mean you eat your company, but still he can't help himself, no matter how recent his latest meal was. Though I have yet to confirm this hypothesis, I believe this cannibalistic impulse to devour others may be the reason for Fernand's constant clenching of his teeth. Whether consciously or not, I think he is attempting to hold off on attacking for as long as he can, before he inevitably succumbs to the hunger once more. When his gums bleed, it could be a sign that one of his attacks is drawing near. Again, I have yet to confirm this, but it seems entirely possible. 
It's unlikely that Fernand will ever be able to verify this for himself, as his connection to the truth is tenuous at best. Though he is highly intelligent in terms of his memory, puzzle-solving skills, and grasp of language, Fernand struggles to differentiate between fact and fiction when consuming media. He assumes that any movie or television show he watches is depicting a real person and that any book he reads is essentially a biography. This doesn't limit his enjoyment of this media. On the contrary, he gets a great deal of joy from watching films and reading books, particularly works of fiction revolving around Hannibal Lecter, who Fernand has described as his favorite person and someone he would very much like to meet one day. To make matters even more interesting, Fernand does understand the concept of lying. He's able to identify when someone is lying directly to him and also displays signs of being a compulsive liar himself, particularly when it comes to his personal history. Over the course of his containment, he is claimed to be a vampire, a homunculus, beloved Sesame Street character Big Bird, also beloved actor and wrestler Andre the Giant, Napoleon Bonaparte, French comic book character Obelix, the Foundation's own Dr. Bright, the Incredible Hulk, Alexander the Great, Captain Hook, and Detective Sherlock Holmes. He has also claimed, at different times and once on the same day, to be both Dr. Frankenstein and Frankenstein's monster. When called out directly on these lies, Fernand offers only this explanation. But I only lie when it's through my teeth. Which I have to admit, is pretty funny. SCP-082, Fernand, is currently contained in enlarged living quarters in armed biocontainment area 14. As he is unfazed by most standard weaponry, his cooperation has been ensured through deception rather than physical force. Fernand has been led to believe that he is acting king of France, placed in a secret palace for his own protection from potential assassins. Any personnel that interacts with Fernand must address him as if he were, in fact, the king of France, and any deviation from the charade is met with swift discipline. Any housekeeping done in 082's containment area must be performed by Class D personnel only, as it poses too much of a risk to non-disposable staff. Guards assigned to SCP-082's containment will receive level 2 clearance but are not permitted to interact directly with SCP-082, no matter how friendly he is, no matter how many knock-knock jokes he tells them, and no matter how he tries to entice them into a round of karaoke. SCP-082 is a curious mix of congenial and threatening, the consummate host who loves to sing and cook for anyone willing to sit at his table. He's also strong enough to snap a spine in half, and has teeth that can crack open skulls, a skill that he demonstrates with stomach-churning regularity. Still, he seems to genuinely enjoy the company of others and has an earnest, playful spirit. From his giving spirit to his diet, SCP-082 really gives a new meaning to the word humanitarian. If you ever have the chance to meet him, just be careful not to let your guard all the way down, because there's a fine, fine line between being his dinner guest and being his dinner. Imagine a gaping maw that could swallow you whole. Not just you, but any creature of any size. Imagine a creature capable of constant transformation and evolution, taking any traits it needs from its prey. It is indestructible, intelligent, unstoppable. The perfect organism. And would you believe me if I told you? It was downright adorable. A little boy wanders through a toy store, a small wad of money in hand, searching for the perfect thing to play with. Desperate to help quell some of his summer vacation boredom, his parents gave him a little cash and brought him to the store to pick out a new distraction. But what will he choose? A superhero action figure? A toy car? Some brightly colored plastic bricks to build with? None of it seems quite right. The truth is, he doesn't really want a toy so much as he wants someone to play with. But his parents don't get the summer off like he does, and they don't have the time to entertain him in between the seemingly endless meetings and phone calls. He's just about to give up and tell his parents that there isn't anything he wants, when he suddenly spots a friendly, plush face peering out from between a few remote control trucks. He reaches out his hand to touch the soft fabric, only for the toy's face to meet his hand halfway toddles off of the shelf on short little legs, bumping its head against the boy's hand like a cat asking for pets. The boy grants the toy's request, patting it gently on the head, and it emits a high-pitched sound like a little meow, crawling closer and pressing itself against his leg affectionately. The boy beams, scarcely able to believe his luck. This isn't a toy at all. It's a new friend. There isn't a price tag on the soft creature or a barcode that a cashier could scan. Is he supposed to pay for it? 
anxious about the possibility of doing something wrong, but even more afraid that he won't get to bring his new friend home after all. He places the money on the shelf where the creature came from, then scoops it into his arms. Delighted to be held, it falls into a peaceful sleep, and by the time the boy rejoins his parents at the front of the store, it looks to them as if he bought himself an ordinary plush toy. It isn't the most adventurous pick by any means, but they haven't seen him this happy in a while, so they don't ask any further questions. That is, until it starts to move of its own free will. Immediately, the boy's screaming mother starts chasing the impossible creature with a broom. It gives a desperate meep and tries to avoid her onslaught, but its four little legs can only carry it so far. It needs some kind of boost to escape, and luckily, it finds one, in the form of a dead cockroach lying underneath the kitchen table. The plush creature's thin mouth expands, swallowing the dead cockroach whole. Immediately, two extra legs, giving it a total of six, grow out of the creature's flank. Six legs, yes, that's more like it. It scuttles away at great speed, chasing its way up the wall as the boy's mother screams in horror. But that won't dissuade the father. He's taken up his double-barreled shotgun and unloads two slugs into the creature. The force knocks it off the wall, making it tumble to the ground. But despite taking the brute force of a powerful shotgun, it somehow still lives. It skitters away at full speed as the father, loading two more slugs, gives chase. It escapes through the doggy door, the father and his screaming wife hot on its heels. Luckily for the creature, there's another boon just outside the house, a dead pigeon that had met its demise in an unfortunate collision with the living room window a few hours earlier. The creature doesn't waste any time. Its impossibly elastic mouth stretches open and swallows the pigeon whole, the decaying bird disappearing into the darkness. As soon as the creature's mouth closes, it starts to change again. Its extra legs disappear, and it begins to take on a more bird-like shape, with wings and tail feathers that help it take flight. The door swings open, and the creature swoops into the air. Not to be deterred or dishonored, the father levels his shotgun again and takes aim. Boom! The blast hits the now-flying creature again, sending it spinning through the air with a high-pitched squeak. It doesn't understand why these people are being so mean to it, after it was allowed so warmly into their home not long ago. Despite being shot with a shotgun, twice, it is still unharmed, just a little shocked. When it lands, it does so on the side of a wooded road to catch its breath. All that flying worked up a powerful hunger, and luckily for the creature, there's a nearly intact deer carcass laying on the grassy verge nearby. Not long before, it had been sent on an express trip to the afterlife by the grill of an SUV. Waste not, want not, the creature thinks. The creature's mouth expands and devours the deer, despite the deer being several times its own size. Once the less than fortunate fawn has been consumed, the creature sprouts four long, majestic legs and a little cotton tail before galloping off into the woods. No, don't worry, you haven't completely lost your mind. You've just witnessed SCP-4966 in the wild, and if that story was a little too much for you, I regret to inform you that this case file gets far, far stranger from there. SCP-4966 is a quadrupedal stuffed animal constructed from gray fabric. It also just so happens to be alive. Any attempts to pierce this fabric and examine the creature's contents have failed. It appears to be essentially indestructible. After dissection failed, the Foundation attempted to examine the internal structures of SCP-4966's body using X-rays, but it seemed to show a complete lack of skeleton or musculature, or anything else that would allow the creature to move as it does. Aside from two black eyes and a woven mouth, SCP-4966 has no visible markings or orifices on its body. Its vocalizations resemble that of a kitten, and its disposition is highly social. If it does not receive socialization on a regular basis, the creature will become anxious and withdrawn. Just as cats are known for mirroring the behavior of the fellow felines and human owners, SCP-4966 will imitate the actions of other entities it spends time with. It does not appear to need food, water, or air, but will eat, drink, and breathe if in the presence of an entity doing the same. There is, however, one scenario in which SCP-4966 will eat regardless of the behavior of other entities in the area. When the creature is presented with the corpse of an organism, it will extend its mouth to an anomalous degree and consume the body whole. The creature's body will bulge and stretch around its meal, but the density of its plush skin remains the same throughout the process. There appears to be no size limit on the corpses it can consume, as the creature was once witnessed consuming an adult blue whale's body during one particularly ambitious test. 
Once SCP-4966 has completely enveloped a given corpse, its body will slowly return to its original size. During this transition phase, the creature will display changes to its morphology, consistent with the characteristics of its most recent meal. These alterations vary widely, but the existing facial features and gray coloration will always remain unchanged. This process goes on for approximately four hours, at which point the creature will regurgitate some manner of biological waste composed of various elements of the original organism. If this process is hard for you to wrap your head around, I can relate. Perplexed by this entity's physiology and the manner in which it feeds, I attempted to uncover the experiment log for SCP-4966. I was unable to access it in its entirety, but did get my hands on several excerpts that I found quite illuminating. They answered absolutely none of my initial questions, but were thoroughly entertaining to read just the same. I won't keep you in suspense. Allow me to elaborate. In one experiment, a deceased adult male timber rattlesnake was placed in front of SCP-4966. The creature quickly devoured it and began to change. Its torso extended 150 centimeters longer than it previously had, and its abdomen terminated in a visibly developed tail and rattle. After lengthening in this way, the creature used its new shape to snake around the limbs and bodies of attending researchers. It did not wrap tightly enough to restrict blood flow, but instead appeared to be interested in providing the researchers with hugs. The rattle was shaking at a near constant rate throughout this process, not as a warning of impending peril, but more in the manner that a dog might wag its tail when excited. When four hours had passed, SCP-4966 proceeded to regurgitate a mass of decomposing keratin and liquefied organic matter. During another test, SCP-4966 was fed an adult female lionfish at an advanced stage of decomposition. In spite of the fish's venomous spines, SCP-4966 suffered no adverse effects when consuming it. After swallowing its unappetizing meal, SCP-4966 developed a pair of pectoral fins, a rear fin, and a large dorsal fin that was constructed of several long spines. SCP-4966 struggled to move with these fins, primarily flopping along the ground like a fish out of water. A chemical analysis of the spines matched the composition of lionfish venom, and the researchers avoided touching the creature for the remainder of the test. When it was time to regurgitate, SCP-4966 spat up some broken spines and liquefied organic matter. With reptiles and fish taken care of, the research team decided to get a little bit wild and introduced SCP-4966 to some plant matter. Frankly, I'm glad to see it getting a well-balanced diet and eating some greens for once. Well, browns, really. It was presented with a pile of deceased sycamore maple leaves. SCP-4966 consumed one single leaf, then immediately regurgitated it. Not a fan of vegetables, I suppose. It spent the remainder of the test playing with the pile of leaves, climbing up onto its provided furniture, then diving into the leaves again and again, emitting high-pitched, gleeful vocalizations. During another test, a severely damaged female ostrich corpse was presented to SCP-4966. Still, the extent of the degradation did not seem to impact SCP-4966's anomalous ability. Because upon consumption, the creature's legs extended approximately 1.3 meters, developing two large toes, and its head extended approximately 1.2 meters upward, forming a large, curved neck. A pair of featherless wings sprouted from the sides of SCP-4966's torso. The creature attempted to fly using these wings, but much like the ostrich that had imbued it with them in the first place, it was sadly flightless. Upon regurgitating several shattered portions of bone and a large amount of liquefied organic matter, it reverted to its usual form. During another experiment, SCP-4966 was presented with the head of a male adult eastern moose, taxidermied and well-preserved. SCP-4966 quickly consumed this taxidermy, no doubt missing from some tackily decorated hunting lodge, and began to transform. It developed large antlers, approximately 1.4 meters across. Due to the size of these antlers, relative to SCP-496's head and the rest of its body, its sense of balance and mobility were severely hindered, causing it to wobble with every step. Additionally, it developed large ears that, due to a lack of structural support, could not remain upright and instead flopped down around the creature's head. I only wish that the experiment log had included a photo because, to be perfectly frank, the resulting effect sounds utterly adorable. Less adorable is what SCP-4966 regurgitated after the test, a large, compact mass of metal, wood pulp, and shattered bone. Curious to see how close an item needed to be to an actual corpse to be effective, 
the researchers provided SCP-4966 with a pair of genuine leather boots. This was, I assume, an attempt to see if SCP-4966 would recognize these as part of a deceased cow or not. The answer, it would appear, is not. SCP-4966 approached the boots curiously, lightly biting the toe of the left boot as if tasting it. Then it moved on to the right boot, gently biting the toe, then giving up on eating them. SCP-4966 knocked over the right boot, climbed inside of it, and promptly fell asleep. Soft snoring could be heard from within for the next hour. At this point in my research, I was prompted to enter some additional security credentials. Luckily, through methods I don't feel especially comfortable disclosing here, I was able to obtain these very credentials and continued my investigation. What secrets could a sentient plush toy, albeit an anomalous omnivorous one, have that would require this level of secrecy? I know that curiosity killed the cat, but I was banking on the probability that satisfaction would bring it back, as well as the fact that I am rather notably lacking in feline attributes. So, I proceeded. It seems that after exhausting all other species, the research staff decided to provide SCP-4966 with a human corpse, that of D-01763 to be exact. When SCP-4966 consumed this body, there were no apparent physical alterations to the creature at all. However, it did begin to vocalize, speaking for the first time in recognizable, although slightly incoherent English. Blessed with the ability to communicate clearly for the first time, the entity made several complaints about its enclosure, specifically the low-quality material of its bedding. But then, it revealed something fascinating. When it consumes a deceased human, SCP-4966 is able to access the memories of that person. It also apparently gains the ability to speak at the level of a young child. This capacity for speech is lost when the organic matter of the meal is regurgitated, but the memories remain. A compelling enough discovery on its own, but what happened next was truly shocking. Shortly after this foray into human experimentation with SCP-4966, the Chaos Insurgency staged a raid on Site-17, during which they attempted to gain access to several anomalies, including SCP-4966. This raid proved unsuccessful, but its occurrence, and the discovery of a Chaos Insurgency document containing classified Foundation information on SCP-4966 raised several concerning questions. How did the insurgency gain this information? Why were they so interested in SCP-4966? And how did they know where it was contained? Several corpses of insurgency members were provided to SCP-4966 in an attempt to uncover the answers. Once it regained the ability to speak, Dr. Randall Bannock conducted an interview with SCP-4966. For the first two hours and 14 minutes of the interview, SCP-4966 was not helpful in the slightest. It focused its attention on a relentless demand for snacks, or as it calls them, munchies. After giving the creature seven biscuits, Dr. Bannock was beginning to lose his grip and begged it to cooperate. It responded with yet another complaint. I want a better bed too. The one you guys have is lumpy. Make a bed out of munchies so I can eat it when I get hungry. Dr. Bannock promised the creature another biscuit if it could explain how the insurgency knew its location. The red shooty people? They found the room with my name on it. Dr. Bannock sighed, then reworded his question to ask how the group knew its item number. I was in the room, so the room had my name. They made lots of banging on the door and noisy noises. I was sleeping, but it was too loud and the bed was lumpy. Dr. Bannock promised the creature that a new bed would be delivered the following day, then continued his line of questioning. How did the insurgency know where the building was? The creature refused to answer until it received an additional biscuit. The pet people who visit me, they tell the wed people stuff through the head pots. Understandably, Dr. Bannock required clarification on the identities of the, quote, pat people. Um, lots of people give me pets. The white coat woman who gives me the toys is nice. I like her. She gave me the ball with the bell in it, and it makes a ringy noise. The orange person that gives me lots of pats, but his face keeps being different between pat times. He gives me pats, though, so it's a good orange. Um, you give me munchies and smell like a cake, and that's a good munchie. Also, you said you were going to get me a good bed, but... Dr. Bannock interrupted the creature here, redirecting it to the topic at hand. After bribing SCP-4966 with two more biscuits, it continued to try and explain. I think they use the head squishies, like the one in the red guy I munched, and the one in the spiky stripey, but that one wasn't too good. This only served to add more confusion, and Dr. Bannock asked for clarification. Did the creature mean they used their brains? Um, I don't know about squishy pots. I think the big pot that looks like a watermelon is used to talk. 
I'm not an organ psychic. At this point, rather than do what I would do and ask what on earth an organ psychic is, Dr. Bannock pressed for details on the so-called orange person that SCP-4966 ate. Um, the orange person was colder and was kinda too mushy. The red people had lots more stuff about shooty guns, but I don't like to hurt people so I say no thank you, mister. The orange person had a lot more about like being stuck in a room, and I don't think they ever got to taste the crispy crunch of a munchie, which is sad. Dr. Bannock acknowledged the sadness of life without the joys of a crispy crunch, then continued his line of questioning about the brain-based communication between D-Class and insurgency members. Um, one second, I'm gonna do a real big thing. SCP-4966 sat in silence for several minutes, humming to itself in confusion. I think I found something from the wed people, but it's a bit scrambly and they use some big words I don't know. They keep saying words about sonic chips, but they aren't eating any chips and I'm confused. Wait, I think the orange people had the sonic chips already. Maybe they forgot them at the store because they were saying stuff about not noticing the sonic chips. I want that munchy sonic chips like the orange person gets. Eventually, after a lot of prodding and several tangents regarding the demand for additional munchies, SCP-4966 listed the identification numbers of 14 D-Class personnel. Autopsies of each of these personnel revealed a small device in the cerebellum capable of psionic transmissions. As a reward for its help in uncovering the cause of a concerning security breach, SCP-4966 was given a bag of Tostitos brand tortilla chips, which it promptly consumed with great enthusiasm. SCP-4966 is kept within a modified humanoid containment cell, sized appropriately for the free movement of a domestic cat or creature of similar size. The cell is furnished with several pieces of cushioned furniture and recreational objects such as climbing towers, soft plush toys, and small plastic objects such as toy dinosaurs are also placed throughout the room. In addition to its toys, SCP-4966 is to be given socialization on a tri-weekly basis by the on-site researchers. Any tests involving SCP-4966 must be approved by Dr. Bannock. Several members of personnel have expressed an interest in providing SCP-4966 with additional toys and recreational objects, but the Foundation has insisted that these be purchased using personal funds rather than tapping into the Foundation's budget. As far as I know, SCP-4966 lives a relatively peaceful life in the aftermath of its brush with the Chaos Insurgency. But it just goes to show that in the world of the SCP Foundation, nothing is ever as simple as it first appears. Even a soft, cuddly, squishy little plush toy can be the key to uncovering a web of secrets, conspiracy, and espionage. I'm just glad he got a nice snack after. A bear mauling you to death, being stalked by cougars in the dead of night, only to be eaten in your sleep. Wandering off the path and getting lost for days, the elements slowly withering you away to nothingness. There are plenty of ways you can die in the wilderness, but few would expect death to come as a result of a simple bodily function with a decidedly anomalous twist. Springtime in the Sierra Nevada is undeniably beautiful. The unpredictable storms of winter are a thing of the past, but the oppressive heat of summer hasn't yet crept in. The highest peaks of the mountains are still spotted with snow, but in the foothills, the wildflowers sprout from the earth, blooming in a tapestry of yellow, pink, purple, and orange. Crystal clear waterfalls roar down the rocky mountainsides, water set free from its slumber by the melting ice as the world wakes up from a long hibernation. The summer vacation crowds haven't yet flooded the hiking trails and ski slopes, but a few groups of early adventurers can be spotted hiking through the mountains, taking in the sights and breathing in the fresh, fragrant air. Among these springtime visitors are a pair of young men, one with blonde hair and one with dark hair, each wearing a small backpack and carrying a canteen of water not a scuff to be seen on their brand new hiking boots. These two young men are on their senior spring break from college, gleefully taking the hiking trip they have been talking about since they were paired up as roommates their freshman year. Neither of these young men is especially experienced in hiking, but they have both spent dozens of hours in the library reading up on wilderness survival, on the best ways to pitch a tent and start a fire with nothing more than a stick and two rocks. The lighter-haired of the two especially prides himself on his knowledge of foraging for edible wild plants, a skill he is excited to put to the test on this trip. His dark-haired companion is a bit more suspicious of wild plants, frightened by the stories of foraging gone wrong and unfortunate explorers confusing a delicious mushroom for one that stops the heart in minutes. 
he has filled his bag with provisions, with granola and jerky, dried fruits, and cans of beans that he hopes his friend will share with him, rather than risking his safety by gambling on a wild root or berry. Still, his concerns about foraging are soon forgotten, as the two proceed further along the trail, passing sparkling waterfalls, bighorn sheep grazing on wild plants, and a bird that just might be a bald eagle soaring by overhead. The two are lost in the majesty of nature. So lost, in fact, that they forget to eat until the sun is dipping over the horizon and the world is growing dark around them. Out here in the mountains, with no light pollution to speak of, dark is dark. Even with the help of the lanterns they brought, the two men can scarcely see well enough to put up their tents and build a small fire. Still, they remember all of their reading and manage to set up a modest camp for the night. The dark-haired man pulls a bag of beans from his backpack and begins to heat them over the flame. He offers some to his companion, but he refuses. The blonde man has found a shrub that he recognizes, weighed down with ripe fruit. This shrub, he explains to his friend, is a species of manzanita, an evergreen shrub that produces berries similar in flavor to little apples. The dark-haired man is dubious. Aren't manzanita berries typically red in color? These appear to be a shade of brown. Wait! The young man reaches out and stops his friend just before he can pop the berries into his mouth. At least let me look them up on my phone. That won't work out here, his friend tells him. The government blocks access to the web out here. They don't want you on the internet. It's a big conspiracy. Everyone knows about it. Page unavailable. His friend is right. But wait! He has the ultimate tool to defeat this intrusion on his lunch lookup liberties because he has Surfshark VPN. Surfshark, the sponsor of today's video. The virtual private network that keeps your online identity safe by encrypting all of the information sent between your device and the internet. With the simple press of a button, he's able to change his location to somewhere well outside the Sierra Nevadas and access the blocked content thanks to over 3,200 servers Surfshark has around the world in 100 countries that allow you to bypass censorship and geo restrictions no matter where you are. And you don't need to worry about who might be watching you since Surfshark masks your IP address to make sure that your city, country, and download history aren't linked back to your identity. It's the absolute best way to stay safe online and keep your personal information secure from whoever might want to use it for their nefarious deeds. So why not try it out for yourself? Surfshark offers a 30-day money-back guarantee, so there's no risk. Dr. Bob viewers who use my code Dr. Bob get an extra three months free. So use the link in the description and check it out for yourself. You'll be glad you did. The wannabe forager insists that he has correctly identified the plant and that these berries will be his dinner. The dark-haired man shrugs and treats himself to a meal of beans and dried apples, while his friend munches on handfuls of the brown berries. He has no complaints about the taste and does not immediately drop dead upon eating them, so perhaps he was right, and these are manzanitas after all. As soon as the thought crosses the dark-haired man's mind, he sees his friend double over, clutching at his stomach in discomfort. Afraid for his friend's safety, he rushes to his side, only to be met with a long, loud fart. The two share a laugh, the tension broken by the sudden smelly outburst, but the humor soon fades as the blonde man farts again, and again, and again. All through the night, he continues to emit loud, excruciatingly smelly farts. The smell permeates the campsite, seeping into the dark-haired man's tent no matter how he tries to cover his nose with his sleeping bag. He doesn't get a wink of sleep, spending the night wide awake, staring at the ceiling of his tent, and silently wishing for the relentless stream of gas to stop. But it doesn't. It just carries on until the dark-haired man can scarcely remember a time when he wasn't listening to the maddening sound. Again and again and again, the endless farts. He clenches his fists until the knuckles turn white, clenches his jaw, and grinds his teeth. It's enough to drive a man insane. The next morning, it is still happening. The blonde man expresses embarrassment but does not apologize for ignoring his friend's warnings about the berries. He tries to laugh it off, but the dark-haired man does not join him in his laughter. If he had only listened, they wouldn't be in this situation. They wouldn't be about to continue their hike with this rancid, gaseous albatross around their necks. As they pack up camp, the dark-haired man glances down at the tent pole in his hand. One good swing, and he could put a stop to the madness. No, that's ridiculous. He shakes his head, clearing the impulse from his mind. The gastrointestinal distress will pass soon, and they will be able to continue the trip like they planned. But it doesn't pass. Nothing passes, but the gas itself. The blonde man asks if they can stop for water before they've even been hiking for an hour. He isn't feeling very well, he explains. He woke up dizzy and nauseated, disoriented from lying there all night, breathing in the fumes. 
The dark-haired man wants to say something to retort that he too was suffering all night, but he doesn't. He just lets his friend stop to drink some water and they proceed with the hike. Gone is the magic of the previous day, the time before the cursed berries. The men can no longer smell the wildflowers, the crisp mountain air. There are no wild animals to be found, not a single ground squirrel or little bird. Up ahead on the trail, the dark-haired man catches the barest glimpse of a tail vanishing into the brush as a mountain lion runs the other way. Is it fleeing from them? From the stench? He wouldn't blame the beast if it was. They have five more days of this planned and he can feel his resolve beginning to fade. Maybe he can turn back, ask to cut the trip short now, but why should he have to suffer just because his friend made a mistake identifying a wild berry? It isn't fair. If he could just get a moment to think without the incessant farting, if he could just have one second of peace, maybe he could come up with a solution. But no respite comes. If anything, it only seems to get worse. The smell burns his nostrils, the sound rings in his ears. The blonde man tries to speak over it, to clear the air with pleasant conversation, but the dark-haired man brushes him off with grunts and shrugs. His eyes sting and water, he chokes on the stench. He knows in his heart that he can't take much more of this. When the men make camp for the night again, the dark-haired man's thoughts turn dark. He could just leave in the dead of night while his friend is sleeping, rush off into the wilderness and abandon his companion there freeing himself from the farts. He tries to justify it to himself. They both have the survival skills to make it. He'll be fine. His thoughts of leaving his friend alone in the woods are interrupted by the sound of chewing. Is there any animal nearby? No, surely no animal would approach given the smell. He takes a look in the blonde man's tent and finds his friend eating another handful of those same brown berries. The dark-haired man flies into a rage, unable to contain his fury. How could he do this? How could he eat more of them after what happened the first time? Doesn't he understand what this is doing to him, what it's doing to the both of them? How could he be so selfish? The blonde man insists that it's fine, that the farting can't possibly be related to the berries, because manzanitas don't cause that sort of thing. At this, something in the dark-haired man snaps. He can't take it anymore. He turns away from the tent, throwing up his hands and telling the blonde man to find his own way back. They'll split up from here. The blonde man emerges from his tent, begging his friend not to cast him out. He's certain the farting will stop any day now. At this, it seems to grow louder, more potent. The dark-haired man spots a large rock by the campfire, small enough to hold in his hand, hefty enough to do some real damage. He picks it up and turns to meet his friend. Without thinking, he swings the rock at the blonde man's head. For the first time in days, the sound of farts goes silent. The air smells sweet, like flowers, leaves, and campfire smoke. He did what he had to do. The dark-haired man lets out a sigh of relief, the rock falling from his hand. He glances at the rock on the ground, at the blood dripping down its surface, and realizes the full weight of what he has just done. He packs up the campsite as quickly as he can, douses the fire, and dumps the body over the edge of a nearby cliff. Over the next few days, he hikes back the way he and his friend came, noticing in spite of his gnawing guilt that the walk really is so much better without those damned farts. On the way, he passes that bush, that horrible bush, weighed down by the fruit that destroyed his spring break trip, that destroyed his friend's life. He opens his backpack, tearing a page from one of his books and grabbing a pen. He scribbles a warning, no matter what, do not eat these berries, and affixes it to the bush. He can only hope that the next person to stumble on this shrub will see the note and heed its warning. If they don't, they might meet a similar fate. Days later, the park rangers discover the blonde man's body and declare the death an accident caused when the man fell over the side of the cliff. Some of them suspect foul play, but are unable to find any evidence. All they can find is a strange note on an unidentified shrub and the faintest smell of something foul, like rotten eggs. The two doomed hikers had no way of knowing this, but the fruit they foraged was not from the Manzanita family. It was from a plant known as SCP-4032, SCP-4032 is a wide, deciduous shrub characterized by a rounded crown and wider base. It produces a distinct, small, round brown fruit that has been designated SCP-4032-1. Whenever any animal or human consumes an instance of SCP-4032-1, this meal will result in intense gastrointestinal distress. I will try to describe this as delicately as I possibly can, but as I have learned over the years in my line of work, the truth is rarely delicate or polite. 
one hour following the consumption of an SCP-4032-1 instance, the person or animal will begin to emit an excessive amount of flatulence, consisting of elevated hydrogen sulfide levels and a small but detectable amount of methane gas. Perhaps you are familiar with an old rhyming song about the wonders of beans, the magical fruit. These berries function quite similarly. The more one eats, the more one does, in fact, for want of a better word, toot. However, unlike the second part of the bean-based rhyme, these fruits do not cause their unfortunate consumers to feel better, nor should they be eaten at every or any meal. The Foundation first discovered SCP-4032 on April 2, 2018, after a man named Anthony Green happened upon the plant in the foothills of Northern California. Hungry enough to forget his better judgment, Anthony ate some of the fruit and became immediately concerned for his physical well-being as SCP-4032's effects began to take hold. Fearing he had unknowingly consumed a poisonous plant, he made a distress call to the local search and rescue team. This call was intercepted by Foundation operatives, who swiftly arrived at the scene to bring both Anthony and the plant itself into custody. The affected individual will continue to produce this flatulence until they have expired. Both starvation and dehydration have no impact on the flatulence, and no identifiable source of the gaseous output has been detected via endoscopy. If an affected individual finds themselves in an area without adequate ventilation, they will gradually begin to experience symptoms brought on by hydrogen sulfide poisoning, including but not limited to conjunctivitis, respiratory irritation and coughing, loss of smell, and eventually pulmonary edema and death. Shortly following SCP-4032's discovery, Dr. Logari began conducting a thorough observation of Anthony Green, referred to as D-14478 for the purposes of official documentation, as he suffered from the effects of consuming SCP-4032-1. First, he was brought in for observation and placed in cell 14B on the outside of Site 88. Dr. Logari noted copious amounts of flatulence being emitted by the subject with high levels of hydrogen sulfide and methane. Five hours later, the subject was complaining about gas buildup in his cell and the interior venting hood was activated. Three hours and over 50 complaints later, the maintenance staff deactivated the interior venting hood and opened exterior windows. In an attempt to quell some of the relentless flatulence, D-14478 was placed on an intravenous diet. After two days on the intravenous diet and no changes to the subject's gas emissions, medical staff conducted an endoscopy, which revealed that the colon was clear and there were no visible signs of rectal gas. The following day, a staff meeting was held in order to discuss the impact of D-14478's condition on the quality of life at the facility. Both residents and researchers alike had complained about the persistent smell, which they were unable to escape, and was permeating the air outside as well as throughout the interior of the building. Several options were proposed, including relocation, treatment, and failing all else, termination of the subject. A resolution was passed to house D-14478 in an outdoor facility until proper filtering equipment could be installed. A little over a week later, Foundation agents intercepted reports from nearby environmental watch groups concerning an increase in airborne pollution in the central Alabama area around Site-88. With D-14478's condition threatening not only the morale at Site-88, but the environment itself, an additional resolution was passed in order to transfer D-14478 into an experimental air filtering cell. The cell had not yet passed a safety inspection, but those with objections were overruled by the vote of the majority. The following day, subject D-14478 was found dead in his cell. An investigation into the cause of death determined that the primary filter was improperly constructed, and both it and its associated sensor had malfunctioned. There was one silver lining to this unfortunate incident, however. The effects of SCP-4032-1 mercifully ceased following the subject's death. The post-mortem report was filed with the Ethics Committee, and Dr. Logari was placed on temporary administrative leave. Meanwhile, a large order of scented candles was placed by the staff of Site-88, and soon, the unpleasant odor was replaced with the smells of lavender, vanilla, sugar, and pine. In Dr. Logari's absence, Dr. Carlisle was appointed to the position of lead researcher on SCP-4032. Following the approval of the Ethics Committee, Dr. Carlisle began conducting a series of animal tests using SCP-4032. The first test subject selected was the Araucanian herring. An instance of SCP-4032-1 was crushed and added to a mix of coat pods and krill, which were then fed to a small school of herring. Fifteen minutes after the consumption of SCP-4032-1, the herring's usual flattest production increased dramatically. 
This caused great distress to the school of fish, as this species ordinarily uses flatulence as a means of communication. Samples of the flatus were taken and analyzed, and were found to contain hydrogen sulfide and methane, though the levels of both were lower than they had been in human subjects. Three hours after their initial feeding, the herring were euthanized and taken for autopsy and chemical analysis. There was no post-mortem evidence found of SCP-4032-1's effects. Next, a flock of chickens was selected for testing. They were offered a handful of SCP-4032-1 directly, which they refused to taste. The fruit was then crushed and added to chicken feed, which was fed to the chickens with great success. Two hours after eating SCP-4032-1, all of the chickens began to emit gas containing low levels of methane and hydrogen sulfide. The chickens were promptly euthanized and taken for analysis, where an autopsy determined that the bird's short intestinal tracts were distended. This marked the first recorded visible sign of the fruit's impact on a test subject. The next animals selected for testing were brown-throated three-toed sloths. This particular species was chosen due to its lack of flatulence, as these sloths tend to absorb flatus and release it through their lungs, rather than rectally. The fruit was offered directly at first, but the sloths rejected it. The fruit was then crushed and ground with a mixture of tree leaves and fed to the sloths. Whatever happened next has been redacted from the official Foundation file, but it was disturbing enough to bring a grinding halt to any and all future testing of SCP-4032 on large mammals. Any potential animal experiments involving SCP-4032 must be approved by the Ethics Committee in order to prevent another, quote, sloth incident. SCP-4032 has been contained in a cordoned off portion of the research gardens at Site-67, which consists of the area around SCP-4032's original location. This land was purchased by the Foundation, and a research facility disguised as a personal estate was constructed there. SCP-4032, along with several other anomalous plants, is kept in the garden portion of the site. All instances of SCP-4032-1 are to be gathered from the ground on a daily basis and incinerated on site. Any employees found to be using the berries for unapproved personal purposes will be suspended or terminated from their positions. If any animals wander onto the grounds and consume the berries, they must be captured and euthanized, and their bodies incinerated. Though there is currently only one known specimen of SCP-4032, the Foundation has a contingency plan in place should any additional specimens be discovered. If this happens, Mobile Task Force Alpha-67 Weed Whackers will be dispatched to the specimen's location, where they will uproot it and bring it back to Site-67 to be contained. Any humans that consume an instance of SCP-4032-1 must be contained in holding cells B1 through B5 along the outer perimeter of Site-67. Each of these cells is equipped with three air filters containing Thiobacillus thioparis, chemolithoatrophic sulfur oxidizing bacteria embedded in a mixture of peat and polyurethane. Each filter also contains sensors intended to detect hydrogen sulfide and methane. When the sensors are activated, members of Mobile Task Force Alpha-13 odor eaters are dispatched to escort the affected individual outside until the filters in their cell can be repaired. Currently, the Foundation does not believe there to be any additional specimens of SCP-4032 in the wild. However, there is no way to be certain of this, due to the plant's relatively unassuming appearance and the lack of any information on its origins. It is entirely possible that there are more of these shrubs just waiting to be discovered by an unfortunate hiker wandering off the beaten path. So if you find yourself out in nature with an empty stomach, make sure that you have accurately identified any of the wild plants you consume. If you don't, you may be met with a fate that is silent, but deadly. Check out the Dr. Bob Patreon and become a junior researcher today. Now go and watch another entry from the files of Dr. Bob, like SCP-2611, Large and in Charge.